Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the hearing session uh, for the uh, examination to the Stroud Local Plan. Can everybody hear me okay? Just a few people nod that yet. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. So uh, today's session is the continued session um, dealing with the Sharpness New Settlement, which is PS 36 in the local plan. Um, as I say, this is a continuation of the previous session. I will be leading today's session, um, although my colleague, uh, Inspector Yvonne Wright, is also here. Good morning, everybody. I can't see uh, all these faces floating around on the screen, but I can hear you, so that's, that's good. <laughs> Um, so, um, Ms. Wright may uh, maybe, well, probably will be chipping in with uh, additional questions because um, we'll, we'll be doing this session jointly, um, although I will be leading it. Um, I will deal with the participants at the end of this short little opening that I'm doing. Um, in terms of the protocols for today, obviously, if you are not speaking, please can you turn your microphone off? Um, although it is quite nice to see your faces. So if you want to leave your uh, cameras on, that, uh, that would be nice. Although equally, if uh, you wish to turn it off, that's absolutely fine as well. Um, hand raise function. Um, if you would like to speak, um, just raise your hand and I will bring you in um, at the appropriate moment. Um, it might not always be immediately because we might be in the middle of a discussion between two participants. So I might just want to kind of get that finished before I bring in a particular individual. But don't worry, I will bring you in. If you think that perhaps I haven't seen you, then perhaps uh, wave or, or bring, bring yourself to my attention and I will make sure that I don't miss anyone. Um, in terms of today's format, um, obviously as this is a continued session, we won't be going over what has previously been discussed. Um, so just a reminder, um, obviously the purpose of these sessions is to help both myself and the other inspector gather the information that we need in our examination of this local plan. So it's not helpful for us to have a repetition of uh, material that we've already heard. Um, and it also just means that the sessions will be incredibly long, which I'm sure none of us will appreciate. Brevity is much appreciated. Um, there has been a, an agenda produced for today, um, which hopefully everyone should have received. So that just sets out um, essentially what we want to discuss today. Um, this is the information that at this stage we feel we, we need to discuss to help us understand um, the, uh, the Sharpness new settlement. Um, it may be that there are some MIQs that we we've not particularly gone through in detail. That's because we feel that we have got enough written information to help us um, come to a view on the points and questions that we've raised. If, however, at the end of the session, there's anything that anyone feels that we haven't discussed and you would like to bring to our attention, then please do so. There is um, a issue at the end of the agenda, um, number five, any other business. So that would be the appropriate time to do that. Um, then before we start, um, I just going to also bring to everybody's attention that we had some um, additional evidence sent through yesterday um, on the viability of Sharpness New Settlement. Um, so hopefully everyone should have received that. Um, apologies that that was uh, circulated quite late in the day. Um, we ourselves didn't receive that until quite late on. And then obviously as inspectors, we have to read through it understand what the document's trying to say and then consider whether we want to accept it or not. Um, so I just wanted to lay a marker down and I am, I'm sure I probably speak for most people in the session that as a general principle, we don't appreciate receiving information so late in the day. Um, it's not helpful. I'm sure most of us spent most of last night reading it and going through it. Um, so I can perfectly understand that there are you know, a few people that are slightly cross about that, particularly those of you that aren't professional planners, um, having to read through things like that and understand them at a late stage is, is not ideal. So I appreciate that. Um, having said that, we did decide to accept the information because we are discussing viability today and we felt that it was important to have the most recent up-to-date figures on that and that it would be helpful. So I just wanted to just emphasize to people that we, we probably appreciate your frustration and believe me, we, we 
feel equally frustrated because I was there till half past eight last night re reading stuff. So um, but fully appreciate that people may be cross about that. But um, unfortunately, um, as I say, we, we did feel the information was, was useful and that's why we accepted it and, and circulated it. So that being said, um, we shall move on to discuss today's agenda. Um, I was just about to say, unless there's anything that anyone would like to raise, and I can see a couple of hands have gone up. So, um, Councillor Jones, if you would like to uh, come in. Good morning, ma'am. Only to continue on the point you've just been making. Um, I, I was out at a parish council meeting until late last night, and I wasn't trying to go back on when I got home and read those documents. Um, I said last week when we were doing PS37 that, um, unfortunately, some of these... Uh, site promoters seem to treat it as a bit of a game and uh, we, we don't think it's funny this is really important for our communities how are people lay people supposed to be able to respond effectively when they've received it the night before I have to say and I know I've been corrected by your colleague before now this is a disgrace this is really important and it's being treated as a strategy to try and make sure other people don't have an opportunity to properly respond. And I just want to lay a marker down. I think it's absolutely outrageous. And unfortunately, it reflects um, through some of the process going through. And I have to say, we haven't been helped by the council. They, they don't work on our behalf. That would be my feeling as a councillor. And I think my colleagues might well feel the same. Sorry to start on a bit of a negative, ma'am. Thank you. No, and that's why I just sort of made made the point myself because I I, I fully appreciate that um, as as local residents, you're not planning professionals. That it is difficult being presented with information that's quite technical at a late stage, and then having that additional time pressure of having to read it the night before. Um, but having said that, in in much the same way that we um, dealt with it in the Wislow session last week we will be going through this information in detail today and we will be asking the site promoters to explain it in detail so if you feel that there's anything in there that you don't understand or have questions about then this is basically the opportunity today to discuss that and uh, ask those questions and hopefully have things explained a little bit further. Um, Ms Higgs? Oh, you're, you're on mute. I can't hear you. Um, oh, no, you've just put yourself on mute again. Still still can't hear you. Maybe, is your microphone not working? Um, no, still still can't hear you. How frustrating. Um, now you've taken your, I can see the symbols appear. The microphone is showing that you're not on mute, but I still can't hear you. Have you got your speakers switched on? Your microphone switched on. Hmm. Do you want to try perhaps logging out and coming back in again? And I will I will come back to you. Can't hear you, I'm afraid. No, can't hear you. Apologies about that. Um, I think perhaps maybe if you try logging out and then coming back in again, and that quite often sorts out the issue. Um, and I can see I've still got a couple of hands up from local, um, from Councillor Jones and then also Ms Smith. So I think we're probably going to still be discussing sort of the same point. So I don't think you're going to miss anything in the short time that you leave and, and come back and then we'll we'll try again failing that um i think give the um program officer um a, a call if if you have any problems can't get back in for for whatever reason okay i'll just move on to the next person with their hand up and then um we'll hopefully come back to you um i will come i'll come to mr fong last um if if uh, i i will because um what i'll do is i'll ask Councillor Jones and Ms Smith to come and then I'll, I'll ask you to just do a closing. What, what I would say as well is I think um, the point's been made that local residents are, are dissatisfied, um, fully appreciate that. Um, what I also just want to say is we, we understand that, we've taken that on board. What I don't want to do is then use a lot of hearing time, having the same point repeated to us 
fully appreciate it. I've, you know, raised it myself. Um, but if we could sort of move on um, to actually discuss what we're, we're wanting to discuss today, that, that would be helpful. Um, so I don't want to kind of get stuck on, on this point, um, but uh, Councillor Jones, uh, please please uh, come in and then... Thank you, ma'am. Only just to come back to something you said that um, last week, for instance, um, we had the opportunity to discuss it. That's the whole problem because information came in so late, as it happens that day, I could only be on for a quarter of an hour, but um, it, we didn't have an opportunity to discuss it properly. So the point I raised very briefly in my quarter of an hour that I had didn't actually get addressed. And it's because we've been given this information so late, it doesn't give us a chance to prepare or to brief other people to act for us on, on, that, on those issues. Um, and I feel the same is going to be the, today. Um, I don't know how Miss Smith is going to get on with all her points. I hope she's had an opportunity to read them, but it's perfectly understandable that she, she won't be able to be as up to date. And I would also say, you mentioned that uh, all the other uh, professionals on here, I dare say they thought not all of them will have uh, wanted to spend all night reading this information. Um, uh, they might have done, but they might have had other things to do as well. So I'll let you get on. But I, it would be nice if we could have an opportunity to come back on some of these given a bit more time. Yeah, no, I fully appreciate it. And as I sort of indicated in the, uh, the, the, my opening, sitting here on my laptop till 9pm last night when I'd been working since early in the morning prepping for today is not my idea of fun either. So fu fully appreciate what, what you were saying. Um, Ms Smith, please. Hi, I, I just want to you, um, check on the, I'm going to be using the correct version of a map. Um, the HRA on page 55 and 6 refers to a concept plan and it gives a date. Now, I couldn't find that exact plan anywhere. Um, in the Mr. Fong's Natural Neighbourhoods document, there is a concept plan, but it, it didn't actually show the information we referred to. So i am kind of been using um, a map on page 10 in that neighbourhood. I wanted a map that showed, the, well, it, it, the HRA basically refers to the concept plan. So I'd rather have that map if it's in the... In is, the evidence, but I couldn't find it. So the one on the it's the boundary of the nature reserve and the post seven way diversion. So, so I'm asking now, so I can go and print out the right one for later. So right, okay. Yeah. Um, so if Mr. Fong, if you can just make a note of that and then answer it when when I bring yeah. you in. Okay. And then I appreciate so, you come in now because you want to print it off. So I, I wanna, yeah, yeah. Or, or or just carry on with the version I'm using if that's that's the one to use. So okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Inspector Wright. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, um, last week we said in the Wislow session that if we felt that we wanted further evidence um, from other participants on the late evidence that had been submitted, i.e. on it was uh, some late evidence on viability that was submitted for Wislow, then we, we were going to consider whether we required that or not. We are not saying at this time, so it would be the same for Sharpness, as my colleague uh, is perfectly aware. Um, and um, so at this time, we're not going to say that we're going to need that because my colleague and I need to go away and consider our options. Um, as I said for Wislow last week, we need to consider uh, what our next steps are. So it's not that we don't want anybody else to respond on this. It's just that we're not necessarily think that it's necessary for us at this time because we need to go away and actually consider it. So today's session is literally to go through so that the uh, Sharpness uh, development team, the site promoters, can explain to us why this was given in late, why it has been updated, the evidence has been updated, what has changed and what the implications are. That then actually helps anybody else with any comments later on if we request them, because it explains actually the process that the uh, site promoters have gone through to provide this information. And as I said last week, um, this isn't our first radio. We've been here before. Um, it's exceptionally frustrating. I made that point last week, exceptionally frustrating. The evidence is brought in late. However, we are where we are with this um, and it's timely in terms of it would have been an absolute um, farce of this examination to have gone through today talking about viability and then the site promoters delivering additional information afterwards. 
which then we would have had to open up. So although this is late, and I begrudgingly say this, there is a, a you know a welcomeness to the evidence now because although it was only given to us yesterday, um, it's important. This session is for today is looking at viability as well as some other issues, but it is going to be looking at viability. So it is actually quite timely. So I'm not going to thank the site promoters for delivering it late. That would be wrong, but it is actually uh, most appropriate that we do discuss it today. We're not going to be putting off these sessions for later because it, we don't have enough time for the summer break and that. And due to other, as I said last week, due to other work commitments and other priorities, uh, we're struggling to find um, mutually convenient dates between ourselves and the council to do any additional dates this side of the summer break. So um, we fully, as my colleagues already said, fully understand the frustrations that are in the room or the virtual room. Um, myself and my colleague will seriously consider whether we do want further information from other participants, but we ourselves need to seriously consider next steps on this plan. Okay. Sorry, I didn't want to take okay. over. No, that, that's fine. And Thanks, I think Lucas, we... I just wanted to just, just add that because I know other people are in this room that weren't in the Wislow session last week and may not have had a chance to catch up on that. I want to ensure that there's fairness. And we're, we are focusing on these new settlements because they are new settlements. So there is a big focus on those, uh, obviously. Uh, we're not picking on them or anything like that, but it's absolutely crucial that we understand the viability and the deliverability of these sites from that perspective. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And the other thing to bear in mind as well is um, if this evidence had been presented, I mean, you know, if it had been done today in the session, that would have been really unacceptable because everyone would have been, you know, on, caught on the hop. But if, um, as my colleague said, if it had been presented to us after today's session, then potentially we might have been left with a situation of having to reopen today's session because we might have had additional um, questions. And in the interest of fairness, um, you know, we would have had to have done that for other people to have the opportunity to say. And I, I think given that this is a resumed session, sort of, you know, sharpness, new settlement, part two I think everyone could agree we don't want to be in a situation of sharpness new settlement part three uh, potentially being held in September so um, we, we're sort of mindful that we we really want to get through today's business um, discuss what we need to discuss and then um, myself my colleague can go away and uh, have a think about it all. Um, Ms Hicks. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Excellent. Sorry, it's taken me a wee while to get back in, so um, apologies for that. Um, I missed some of the conversation there, but caught, caught what you were saying about what happened last week at Wislow in terms of um, late documents. Um, I had actually put a question uh, through your programme officer anyway to say that I'm, I'm very much a stand-in today and very much I'm not so familiar with the, all of the information that's come through so far um, as my colleagues, but... And we wondered if there might be some openings for uh, feedback to you after today's meeting and the opportunity for those folk to watch back this streamed session to make comments, perhaps not just about viability, but anything else that comes up? Uh, uh, no, no, there won't be. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm echoing. echoing. I think you might, might have, have me on. Miss, Miss Higgs. Higgs. Oh. oh. Can you turn your microphone off? There is feedback. There we go. Yeah. Um, no, there, there won't be an opportunity uh, per se, unless, as my colleague said, we, we decide that we need further information on, on something. Um, because the, the problem with that is, as inspectors, we have to consider fairness to all. So if we, offer, if we gave one party, such as yourselves, the opportunity to do that, we'd have to do it for everyone. And then we would probably end up in a, another session having a discussion for feedback on feedback and we, we, we would never kind of close the loop. So um, the, the sort of initial answer is that's not our intention at this stage, unless after today and we've gone away and thought about things, we have um, a desire to ask further information about a particular issue, um, in which case we will then uh, contact participants and give everybody the opportunity because we we can't just give that to a, to one participant. Um, but pl please continue. Well, just to say that, just for the record, I haven't even seen the documents that you're referring to, so I'll be listening intently and hoping to 
make some sense of things as we go through. Thank you. <laughs> as my colleague said, um, we, we will be asking uh, Mr Fong to take us through those documents in detail. Um, so that should be your opportunity to have things explained to you. Um, and if at that time questions occur to you, um, you, you don't understand anything or, or you know, what, whatever, then please uh, step in and ask a question at that stage. Okay, thank you. Um, was that all you wanted to say? Is your hand still raised? Too? Thank you. Um, Mr. Fong, so um, if you'd like to just respond on um, thank you. Points. Thank you, Inspector Lucas. Uh, I think uh, Inspector Wright has handsomely uh, covered the main points that was raised. Well, we are here to help you, uh, and that's why the documents have been submitted. Um, you will appreciate that this is an organic beast. It's a large beast as well. So uh, parameters and detail change uh, at, the, at, the, at the, the blow of a wind. Um, there have been changes uh, with the council documents, and we have rightly had to update uh, the figures accordingly to give you the accurate picture. Um, so th there's no uh, underhand uh, and deceptive means, as Mr. Councillor Jones has suggested. It's just giving you the right information, Mom, at the right time. Um, the, the, we will explain it in detail when we get into the session, Mom, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, but it's it, there's certainly nothing underhand here. We just want you as inspectors to have the most up-to-date information. The, there are slight variances only that the the vi viability has been there for a while. We've just had to reflect changes to the council documents that have arisen. Thank you, Mom. Okay. Thank you. Um, so before we get into the main session, the other thing I wanted to do is to just check our list of participants for today. So I'm just going down the updated list that the programme officer gave us. So I can see we have Mr. Russell from uh, Stroud Council in the session. Um, we have Councillor Jones, I have spoken to you. Um, then we should have Mr. Flanagan from Taylor Wimpy. Yes, good morning, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Um, then Ms. McCaffrey from National Highways. Good morning, I'm here. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Drover and a few colleagues from Gloucestershire County Council. Good morning, ma'am. Yes, we're here. Thank you. And I know Mr. Fong is here, and then you've got quite a few members of your team. Mom, uh, I, I have given a full list to the programme officer, but very briefly, I'll run through that. It's Andy Fazy, and, and all the spelling is with the programme officer, Mom. Andy Fazy, Line Court, Lawrence Clark, Green Square Accord, myself, Claudia Jones, my colleague, Hannah Eshelby from JLL on Viability, Lee Stolworthy from Stantec, Mark Rennie from Stantec, Joe Vallander from EDP, Peter Newbold from EDP, Tom Wigglesworth from EDP, Edward Turner from Pegasus, uh, Mark Eden from Arcadis, and Sam Hart from uh, Davis Landscape Design. Thank you, Mum. Thank you. And I know we have Miss Higgs in session um, because, again, I've spoken to you. Uh, then also we have Miss Smith again, spoken to you. Good morning. Um, Ms. Jones, do we have Ms. Jones in session? No, can't I'm not sorry. Sorry, Mum. I'm not sure if that's me. Oh, um, but Paul mentioned me earlier. Oh. No, um, uh, Sarah Jones. No, she's emailed this morning. I can't make it, and nor can Mr. Bannister. All ah, right, thank you. Um, then we have um, Mr. Matthews from Savills with one of his colleagues. Uh, good morning, Mum. No, just me today. Okay, thank you very much. And then we have um, a few people from uh, Avis Young and representing the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. Is that correct? Yeah. Good morning. Well, it's uh, myself, Matt Belanda, uh, Frank Wigley from the NDA and Roger Rayford from Magnus. Thank you very much. And then we have uh, Ms. Hamilton Foynes. Morning, ma'am. Yes, Sarah Hampton Foyne from Pegasus Group, representing Robert Hitchings. Morning, thank you. And then 
Ms. Atkins from the history group. Nope, can't see anyone there. Um, okay, well, we shall press on. Uh, Mr. Fong, did you want to say anything Yes, ma'am, I, I do apologise. I didn't answer one of your questions for Miss Heather Smith. Uh, the plan that she needs to find is P16 dash 0821 underscore 04 dash 20 dated 25th the second 21. Um, I'll ask my colleague uh, Miss Jones to locate it in the examination library and then I'll send that uh, detail to uh, the program officer so that Miss Smith can have it. Thank you very much that that's uh, much appreciated. Um, is that okay Miss Smith you've got the information you need? Um, yeah, yeah, that, that is the document I want, but I couldn't find it. So that's so obviously Mr. Fong is going to ask somebody where it is in the evidence. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. OK, so we will move on to uh, the agenda items for today. Um, so the first issue is the relationship of the site with the operation and decommissioning of the Barclay nuclear site. Um, so I am aware that Mr. Valander was wanting to speak on this um, first, because I, I believe you need to uh, be somewhere else a bit later on. So um, perhaps, Mr. Valander, if you'd like to say something now and uh, we can start on this matter. Yeah, absolutely. So I also invite um, Mr. Wiggly and Mr. Rayford to uh, add to my comments as well. But if I just maybe start with a, a brief opening comment, really. Um, the Barclay nuclear site is a very complex um, and very large uh, existing facility that will be ongoing in terms of its decommissioning process and related development for a number of decades to come. With that brings potential noise, disturbance, amenity issues that um, may impact on the proposed new settlement. We really just want to ensure that the new settlement considers this close neighbour and that appropriate measures are in place within the local plan to ensure that at the appropriate time when planning applications are brought forward, that matters are properly considered. To date, the plan seems fairly sight silent on that potential impact that there might be between, between the two. I don't know whether Mr Wigley or Mr uh, Rayford maybe just want to provide just a little bit more context about the nature and the scale of the operations. Yeah, I mean, um, re reading through the um, the evidence that you submitted, my my sort of understanding of uh, what you're wanting in summary is essentially some additional policy wording to um, take account of the fact that once there are um, sensitive receptors, if you like, in the form of new residents, um, there might arise issues regarding nuisance, disturbance, noise complaints and, and such like. So you are essentially wanting some comfort in the form of additional wording that um, the development would take into account the need for mitigation and making people aware that those things may occur in the future. Um, and in addition to that, you're also a little bit concerned about traffic impacts um, on the surrounding uh, road network. Is, is that sort of it in a, in a nutshell, uh, Mr? In a, in a yeah, in, 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 a, in a nutshell, just following the you know the principles of the agent for change um, that's set out in, in MPPF and set out in our state. It's really, I can see Mr. Wiggly has got his hand up. Thank you, um, Mr. Wiggly. Did you have anything to add to that? Um, very little. Uh, thank you. I think your summary uh, so, sums up exactly our, con our concerns quite well. It's not that this may happen. This will be. This will be happening in in a couple of decades. Uh, we are concerned that um, without proper mitigation at the moment, this will make the process and the job of decommissioning that site more difficult um, and more and more costly for the UK taxpayer. So we want to make sure that. Uh, whilst this development is in place. Uh, and it's not the nuclear aspects, this is conventional decommissioning. This is the nature of noise, for example, from breaking concrete. This is traffic movements. This is all of the things that will be done in terms of, of addressing our uh, statutory obligations for, uh, for closure and um, uh, for closure of that site. Thank you. Um, 
if I could just ask Mr. Stroud, uh, Mr. Stroud, <laughs> Ms. <laughs> Mr. Russell from Stroud, perhaps you are Mr. Stroud, um, if I could just ask Mr. Russell then, um, is, is that not possible then to um, put some additional wording into the, the policy um, to make sure that these things are taken account when a planning application is brought forward? It would seem sort of a rather straightforward thing to do. Thank you, Inspector, and good morning, everybody. Um, yes, I'm certainly not Mr. Stroud, um, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, no, I think the issue here is really um, that the um, that the, the NDA have raised a, a broader issue around the agent for change principle, and um, so we don't we don't have any issue with um, with the plan being in conformity with uh, the MPPF Para One Eight Seven relating to integrating development with existing businesses and we certainly don't have any issue with the um specific mitigation that may be required at the planning application stage i think the the only issue we have is that um the the the, the issue that they've raised essentially it goes you know it's wide, much wider than um than than sharpness new settlement for example um that we do have as you know we have a, a policy and a employment allocate well, uh, designation at the adjacent Gloucestershire Science and Technology Park, which, which, which is promoting additional education and employment uses on that site. Uh, it would seem strange to have a, a specific reference to this particular issue only in the Sharpness New Settlement uh, and not have it relating to that or any other development uh, which may come along either in the vicinity of um, the Barclay site, but indeed any any um, development where uh, where the council or, or any other party is proposing to locate it, which may be uh, in a location which uh, which is close to an existing noise or nuisance generating use. So our approach would be to, uh, and this is this is the council's, I guess, formal response would be to, um, and the NDA provided some very useful. Uh, wording in in terms of a potential uh, policy wording, our our proposal would be to look to amend delivery policy ES three, which is maintaining quality of life within our environmental limits. It's on page two hundred and eighty four of the of the draft plan. Just just for those who haven't got it up open, I'll just say that it, it, it is essentially talks about development proposals demonstrating that environmental risks have been evaluated and appropriate measures have been taken to minimise the risks of adverse impacts to air, land and water quality. It talks about noise, general disturbance, um, risk of flooding, impact on highway safety, uh, contaminated land, antisocial behaviour, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, the way the wording has been drafted for that policy is not just for noise generating or nuisance generating development. It's it's it can also apply to, to noise and nuisance sensitive development as well. So, um, if you it, if if you're if you're happy for us to take it away for homework, we would suggest adding to delivery policy ES3, reference to the agent of change principle, in other words, the first paragraph of the NDA um, suggested text, we, we could also consider uh, the aspects identified in, in B and C. And the reason we're doing this, as I say, to reiterate, is to ensure that any, any site which is located in that kind of um, uh, 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 sensitive location uh, takes account of it and I think hopefully the N NDA will understand that you know there, there is likely to be other development in the vicinity of the decommissioning station in uh, in the decades to come and it's important I think that we have that more overarching policy um, in um, in the plan. Sorry I've been slightly distracted by various symbols appearing um, <laughs> but um, Yes, um, so that that's our that would be our approach in terms of the specifics in terms of sharpness. I just wanted to just briefly because my understanding from the the written submission is there's been a lack of information about about the development. Um, first of all, um, I consider that the level of information provided is proportionate to this stage, this plan making stage. We have. Uh, we know we know the quantum of development. We know the uh, we know the types of uses. 
we know the location of the development, we know the access, and um, uh, we've assessed the, um, we've done a significant amount of work on the highways impact at, at, a, at a strategic level. Um, and we've identified the mitigation measures required to ensure that impacts on highway uh, are, 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 are minimized. Um, I haven't seen anything in, in, in any material which demonstrates that uh, the development would, I think in the words of the NDA, um, uh, uh, impact on the need to maintain emergency access to the Barclay site. I mean, the, the two, two locations are very separate from each other. Um, the only connections are really um, once you come out of Barclay and, you, and you're, you're on the B road to Bar through Barclay Heath. And as I said, the highway impact and highway modeling we've done, which has been agreed by National Highways and Gloucestershire County Council, um, will ensure that there's no significant uh, highway issues. Now, obviously the construction stage, that, that there may be need, need for more detailed um, uh, conditions and wording, but that's very much for the planning application stage. In terms of other issues that, that were raised, um, we, we obviously done an awful lot around flood, flood risk assessment and more detailed modeling has been carried out by the site promoters uh, to ensure that there won't be any impact on adjacent land uses and the site specific flood risk assessment would of course be required at the planning application stage. The, the PPG references to the agents for change are all in, a, in the context of noise develop, noise sensitive and noise generating development. Um, there's no evidence, I don't think, before this examination that, that Sharpness New Settlement will be proposed or is proposed in a noisy location. No evidence in front of us. Now, at the application stage, the, the applicant will, of course, be expected to assess their current scheme and uh, sorry, assess the current activities and future planned activities, um, which may cause a nuisance, but also um, activities that businesses or other facilities are permitted to carry out in the future in accordance with environmental assessment regulations and the requirements of the MPPF and PPG. So in summary, the, does, the council doesn't believe there's any compelling reasons why this issue should be highlighted in the policy wording of Sharp S alone. Uh, at this stage, we are happy to include the principle in the in the overarching policy, which all developments have to have regard to when putting forward planning applications and all decision makers have to have regard to those development management policies. Um, finally, um, and this may be sensitive, uh, but, you know, um, the your, your rep does refer to. Um, 70 to 100 years time frame and noise and disturbance and, and demolition and remediation. I'm personally, I'm not sure that the agent for change principle that the government had that in mind, the decommissioning of a nuclear power station when it when it um, added par paragraph 187 about fitting in with existing businesses. I think, I think that's not, the, I think there are much more stringent regulations around nationally significant infrastructure and, and decommission of nuclear plants that would apply and I, I think it would be disproportionate for any development in the local plan to, to essentially have to um, uh, uh, mitigate for um, for that kind of um, decommissioning of, an, of a nationally significant development but as I said I don't want to pick a fight on, um, on matters of uh, on matters of long-term national policy um, as I said, our, our, our response is we're happy to refer to the agent of change in the development management policies and they and any planning application on Sharpness New Settlement would have to take account of that. Uh, and I think that's probably it for now. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I suppose Mr. Belanda's point back would be that, uh, and sort of a point that I would make, um, not wanting to put Word to Mr. Belanda's mouth is, um, I suppose, take the point about the general principles. And of course, yes, you know, any development is going to be, um, you know, expected to consider the surrounding environment in terms of noise, disturbance, et cetera, et cetera. But then, you know, it's, it's not every area that has a nuclear power station within it um, that's going to be decommissioned. And obviously, although there might not be a noisy environment at the moment, when that starts happening, having a, a nuclear power station demolished in the vicinity is going to create some noise and, and dust, et cetera. Um, so given that that is a particularly 
unique circumstance, not just to sharpness new settlement. And I, I take the point that there are other um, site allocations in the area that, you know, and I, I suspect Mr. Melanda may well agree with that, that, you know, the Science and Technology Park is, you know, just over the road, essentially, isn't it, from the um, the, the site itself. So take, I take the point. So perhaps maybe the, the way to go is some uh, policy wording for either a more general policy specific to the nuclear power station or to include some wording in ES3, as, as you suggest. Um, I can see my colleague would like to come in, so I'm just going to bring her in there. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to just confirm. Um, Mr. Valanda, you're not actually proposing additional wording within the sharpness policy. You're actually proposing or suggesting an additional policy within the plan. And there's no reference within that to specifically to sharpness. So this element, this discussion around sharpness, I think is... A red herring. A bit of a red herring, because that's not actually what's been proposed, what's been suggested, let's put it that way. You've put it, uh, you've put in this suggested policy. My query is, it's set out in national policy anyway, so are, is it just duplicating unnecessary wording that's already in national policy? I know the part, I know paragraph 187 does say planning policies and decisions should ensure that new development can be integrated. Is there a policy, are you looking for a policy hook? Is there a particular, well, forgetting okay. about it just being sharpness, let's just talk about, you know, the, the nuclear power yep. station. That's, that, that's, that's what, a fair, that's a fair particular comment. particular concerns and whether the plan addresses that? I suppose that's what we need to get to, isn't it? Uh, the particular concern is that, as you say, any development in the local plan considers the existence of, uh, of Barclay and the impacts that it might have on the surrounding area. We've obviously focused in on, on this particular proposal because it is of a particular significant scale and introduces a lot of new dwellings that we all know are quite sensitive and probably quite different to more commercial or even educational establishments that might be developed in the vicinity as well. Um, we're open-minded as to whether that's woven into the uh, sharpness policy text or whether it is strengthened within ES3. Um, as long as there is a clear reference. I think having just looked through the policy text for, um, for the sharpness uh, new settlement, it seems a little bit um, odd that I think there are 20, 25 points there of matters that need to, need to be addressed when the scheme is brought forward, but not one of them particularly refers to Berkeley uh, Power Station being constraint or something that needs to be factored. So again, it could be a way that one of those um, 25 um, items or is expanded or a new one added to provide that link to, uh, to a ES3, for example. You're not saying that you're um, objecting to, sh to, let's go back to sharpness. You're not saying that you're objecting to sharpness in terms of the development no. coming forward or anything like that. Fully understand that. Are there particular, because I'm trying to understand the, the transport side of it in terms of when the de decommissioning starts and, and how that is going to progress. Are there particular concerns that you have in bringing forward the development as proposed um, that causes you particular concerns? Or are you just wishing to ensure that this, I'm sure it wouldn't, never be forgotten about this. You can't miss it when you go out there. There's a nuclear power station um, in close proximity. Um, are you just concerned that you just want to ensure that wording is in the plan somewhere? Not, not particularly yes. about uh, sharpness. I understand your query about, well, there are, there are you know, lots of criteria in the policy and no reference to the nuclear power station. Um, We, do, we don't think there's enough information at the minute to fully consider what the impacts might be from the decommissioning process and how that might impact or interrelate. Do you think that that could impact on the future design? Is that is that further down the road? Um, Mom, that's, that, that's a red herring as well, because there are no plans by the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority to expand the facility. Uh, that's that's a, a very pertinent fact, because that dictates the radius of growth. So the one kilometre radius is there for a reason. We're outside that radius. 
The question I have to Mr. Valander is what impacts do the do, does the new settlement have on the decommissioning of that plant? And the answer to that is nothing. And that's what Mr. Mr. Russell has said very politely without trying to cause a fight. So unless Mr. Valander and the, the NDA come up with their specific concerns, which they haven't done to date, this is a red herring, Mark. Now, the other issue is that Mr. Valander has put a very nice policy together on agents for change, which I don't think is relevant to anything. Um, and again, I don't wish to pick a fight because I think Mr. Russell has has dealt with the policy issues very carefully. But the the the, the local plan has also already dealt with these issues in CP14, ES3 and ES5. Uh, if Mr. Russell wants to strengthen it against agents change, I, I, I would welcome that. I don't resist that. But frankly, I think the NDA needs to look at itself and say, we're going to undertake a considerable amount of engineering work here uh, and then assess whether that engineering work requires other mitigation to surrounding residents. And let's not be disrespectful for the Barclay residents because they already exist there. And if the NDA wants to come along and make dust, noise and soot, then mitigation has to be in place for that to occur. Hence the engineering works, which may require consent. Thank you, Mr. Fong. Ms. Lucas. Thank you. Um, Mr. Philander, if you'd like to respond to that or if there's any other points you'd like to make. I think you also made the point in your evidence about maintaining emergency access, didn't you? That was also a, a concern that you've raised. Yeah, I mean, just to respond to Mr. Fong, I don't, I don't disagree that the new settlement itself would have an impact on power station. What we're trying to say is that the power station, through its activities over the course of the next few decades, may impact on residents, and that's the whole basis for the agent for change. It's making sure that existing businesses and operations are considered when schemes are designed and as they begin to go through through the planning of location stage. That's all that we want to try and protect, is to make sure that there is that hook, that the operations of the power station through the decommissioning process are, are factored into that process of the detailed design. That's all we're trying to Trying to achieve in terms of emergency access. Um, that point was put in there because at the minute there's not enough information there to, to fully understand the interrelationships between the two at the construction stage. Again, it's just a little bit of a grey area. So again, it's just a little bit of a mark to make sure that when plans are progressed, plan applications are progressed, that that is considered along with all the other points that set out in the policy there um, as well. It's just Mom, Mom, sure that... With respect, we are now... Um, Mr. Venturing. Fong, Mr. Fong, I do not appreciate other participants being interrupted. If you wish to speak, please do, do so by raising your hand. Thank you. Um, Mr. Valanda, please continue. I think I finished. <laughs> okay, that point, thank actually. you. Um, if I will go to Councillor Green, then I'll go to Mr. Fong after that. Um, Councillor Green, please. Thank you, ma'am. Um, just following on from um, Mr. Valanda, I just wondered whether or not any consideration has been taken in regard to whether or not um, Barclay would actually get the small modular nuclear reactors that are planned for down there. And if that was going to make any kind of um, or have any impact on that as well. Thank you. Mr. Valandra, I don't know if you have the information to, to be able to answer that query. I don't, but Mr. Wigley or Mr. Rayford should be able to answer that question. Mr. Wigley? Is he, is, has he left the session? I can't see him. Or Mr. Rayford, was it you, you were wanting to bring in? Yeah. I, I'll try and answer that. Yes, we are aware there are SMR plans from um agents such as uh, rolls royce they will have to go through their own dco process and it is quite normal in that situation that we enter into cooperation agreements and so forth to protect the very things that um things like emergency access and so on um, so that's no normal business when um we have neighbors and we have a similar cooperation agreement with um 
the Bark de Green um, owners. But the, the particular point about um, whether Barclay would get a small nuclear reactor? That, um, as far as I know, they're not particularly looking at that. They're more interested in Albury at the moment. Thank you. Because of the horizon site and the land. Thank you. Um, Mr. Fong, please. Thank you, ma'am. I do apologise for my interruption earlier. Um, uh, I was just going to say that Mr. Vallander is, is, is probably now uh, venturing into the, the realms of planning application and environmental impact assessment. Uh, and he is right there that we would make that assessment at that time. And one of the points you would have seen, Ma'am, is that has been raised is uh, in relation to the flood and the flooding that may occur. And obviously, if a, a, a nuclear site floods, what impact will it have on adjoining, adjoining residents? So we are charged with looking at that through the environmental impact assessment. And that work has already started. Uh, and uh, Stantec here, our, our testament to that, that we've assessed that already. So um, I, I'm just cautious that we don't want to add additional policies into the plan, which may duplicate things elsewhere. That's all. Uh, Mom, there was a question there from um, Lindsay Green about the, um, the potential SMR technology coming into Albury and Barclay. Yes, if you look on the Western Gateway website, there is distinct interest from Rolls-Royce in developing that with the facility at Albury and the research and technology be done at Barclay. Um, so, so that is live, and that's also found on the Rolls-Royce website as well. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Sorry, took me a while there just to figure out how to unmute. So yeah, uh, John Taylor, I'm the uh, radiation advisor, nuclear advisor, mm -hmm. sharpness. Um, Sorry, can I, I just... Just pause, I do apologise. I've just had a warning. My battery's low, so I think the um, the plugs come undone. If you just bear with me. Okay, am I all right to carry on? Yeah, I apologise. I didn't want you to get uh, cut off there mid uh, mid session. <laughs> do do continue. So I, I just wanted to point out that there is a national policy for future nuclear power generation in the UK, and Barclay is not currently one of the listed sites. I mean, it, that could obviously change in the future, but there'd have to be a whole new process for, for, for that to happen in the future. And, and the other thing I just wanted to remind people is that Barclay, you know, closed as a nuclear power station in 1989. It's... Uh, it's, it's a long time closed. It's been a long time going through decommissioning operations. And, and the current schedule, although I appreciate that could change, is that it will go into long-term care and maintenance from 2028. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Russell. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to pick up a couple of points. Um, I, I actually sit on the seven edge working group uh which is um com uh, which is uh, coordinated by western gateway in terms of promoting future albury and barclay sites for 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 future um development and uh, yes rolls royce have presented to the group uh as have other parties uh, both fusion and fission uh technologies um so there's a lot of interest um, in, in, in the site at Barclay and, and indeed Oldbury. Now, there are different different uh, promoters have different schemes. Some are looking at the Oldbury site containing uh, 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 the, the sort of nuclear element uh, with R&D and support at Barclay, bearing in mind it's, it has the college and, um, and supporting sort of ecosystem of, of um, low carbon um, uses and technologies. Um, Rolls-Royce actually are, are potentially looking at, at SMRs on both Barclay and Albury and uh, many other locations around the country that they're investigating at the moment. So I, I think it's too early to say the exact form of any uh, additional development at Barclay. Um, what I would say is just to confirm every, what everybody else has said is that the Barclay site itself is being decommissioned. Uh, any future uh, development would would probably be a national infrastructure project and would not be subject to the normal local plan and local regulations, although we would clearly be a consultee on that. Um, 
the, the one point that I think we haven't sort of uh, cut, cut, cut uh, we haven't sort of discussed was I think in in the NDA NDA reps they talk about decommission and um, and demolition remediation etc in seventy to hundred years now just from a practical point of view um, the extent to which a development which which is expected to be complete in twenty years can take account of detailed proposals for remediation which could 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 be 70 to 100 years time that's just a, from my point of view is it, i'm struggling to kind of understand the practicalities of that for a planning application which uh, i'm sure mr fong will confirm is probably going to be submitted this year or certainly by next year so uh, that's just a uh, I, I, that's not really an objection or anything. I'm, I'm just kind of struggling to understand how a development planned and delivered in in the next, you know, in the next few years is it can really take account in detail of those plans, which will take no, no doubt many many decades to 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 to, to have a level of detail um, built into them. Anyway, um, the final point really was just to you know again I said I wouldn't pick a fight, and I don't. We want to work very closely with the with the NDA. Uh, we're very happy to to clarify uh, the agents for change as a principle. We we don't want to necessarily um, uh, duplicate what's in national policy, but we're we, we're happy to make a reference to it in policy. Uh, we believe policy ES three is the most appropriate location that would ensure that any other developments, as we've talked about in the vicinity in the next you know in, during the plan period, would be covered. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of an olive branch. <laughs> I guess just to say, you know, and we're quite happy to um, consult with the NDA in terms of the wording of those of that, uh, as we have with the the Barclay um, employment side previously. So, so hopefully that that will be acceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCaffrey. Hi. Um, I know I mentioned this before, and I think I was told it was inappropriate, so don't want to overstep the mark. However, when we're talking about Albury and Barclay, I think. Mr Russell mentioned it then they aren't currently in the local plan and therefore haven't been included within our or a assessment of the motorway and I just want to make that clear okay thank you thank you okay so I think um from our perspective obviously I will need to both myself and my colleague will need to have a think about what we've heard today on this issue and um, consider it further. Um, what I think would be useful is if uh, Mr Russell you do take that away as a bit of homework and um, look at some policy wording, speak to the NDEA and um, come back to us with that. And then in the meantime, myself and my colleague can have a think about that, discuss it, and then look at any policy wording and come to a, a view on um, whether that would be necessary or not as a, a main modification. Okay? Yes, very happy, very happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Volander, would that be satisfactory from your perspective? Uh that's absolutely fine. Happy to, to review any any changes. I guess just just a final comment that again, I do think it's a little bit odd that there are twenty five other points raised within the policy, but Berkeley Power Station isn't referenced as being something that needs to be considered. So I think the preference would be to find a home for that hook within the policy text as well. It just seems a little bit odd. Thank you. Um, so I would like to draw discussion on this agenda item to a close. Um, Mr Russell, is there anything you'd like to say just in terms of closing remarks on that particular issue? I don't think so. I think I think I tried to summarise, I think, the council's position and pick up some of the remaining points. So uh, unless there are any other specific matters that you'd like um, responses on, I think I think I think we're happy we have a, a practical way forward on on this on this subject. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, in that case, we shall move on to agenda item two, uh, which is the uh, garden village ethos and stewardship of the new development. So this, as highlighted, is uh, specifically question 19 in the MIQs. 
which says the text accompanying the policy refers to community engagement and stewardship as being key to delivering a new community in line with Gardner City principles. How will this be achieved? Um, so I don't know if perhaps Mr. Fong would like to. Yes, that. by all means, Mom. And um, just to, to put a point of reference in there first, obviously garden communities uh, by the government uh, August 2018 uh, the garden community qualities are there um I, I shan't recite them all but i will direct you to just a couple um f transportation forward looking um and really trying to uh, navigate people out of their cars and, and create healthier places um J, uh, future-proofed as well, impacts of climate change and um, uh, just giving opportunities for technical technological changes to be included. Um, Mom, you, you're, you're clearly familiar with the rest of them, that's why I'm not going to repeat them. But the, 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 the ethos of this particular new settlement, as you've already seen in the vision document, is really to get people out of cars and onto other forms of transport, particularly um, cycling, walking, electric bikes, electric scooters, and other personal forms of transport. Um, that's why we've created the spider web of active travel routes or personal transport routes as a priority throughout the settlement um, so that it becomes much easier for residents to travel internally by alternative means of transport, mainly cycling, walking, scootering, uh, et cetera or what the government calls wheeling now. Um, why are we doing this, Mom? Simply because uh, the biggest polluter in the UK at the moment is uh, transportation, and the biggest component of that is private transportation, about 37%. So we we are desperately trying to turn a corner, and, and this is unique, Mom. This is the first of its kind in, in the UK. I, I know that because I'm promoting new settlements elsewhere, and this is the only one that has this current ethos and I'm, I'm proudly supported by my client team, uh, Lion Court and Green Square, who want to see this agent of change happen. Um, uh, and particularly, uh, we have great guidance from Green Square Accord because they want to build communities, Mom. They want to build sustainable communities for the future. Um, Lion Court has subscribed to that. And if we are to do that, they have to be as carbon neutral as possible. And if we can knock out the 37% of the pollutants, then we shall. Um, the adjunct to that is that those who want to travel longer distances, there will be a rail service there. And there is a lot of criticism about a rail service. Um, we are going to stand strong on this, Mom, because it is a sustainable form of transport and it is fully supported by government and other agents within the country as that form of transport, as a sustainable form of transport for those who want to travel further. But internalization, mom, is the key component here. If we can get people living and working in the same environment, then that shall happen with this development because it's a genuinely mixed use community. Mom, I've suffered a lot of criticism about um, a, a sea of housing sitting within Sharpness uh, and there's nothing else around it and it's a gated community. It's far from that, Mom. And you would have heard in the spatial sessions that there is a whole wealth of activity, uh, growth and community within the Barclay cluster. Um, we've already talked about the uh, Gloucester Science and Technology Park, and there's 16 hectares of new employment there. There is the Sharpness Docks, there's the Canals and Rivers Trust um, activities going all the way around it. There's the Police Academy. Uh, there is the Barclay Town itself, which is a very active community, and all the other communities around that. Um, so we want to link into that, and we believe that the best way to link into that is through active travel routes, and that's what we are promoting. So the, these long-distance journeys to, to Bristol, well, I mean, by all means, if you want to travel to Bristol, do it. But the focus presently is on trying to get people out of their cars and keep them, we're living and working in the same environment. So quality, Mom, is one of the uh, uh, the, the criteria that we're trying to deliver and sustainable quality with this, within this environment. So stewardship is all important to us. And 
as a design team, we have been looking at successful examples around the country and, and indeed, mom, unsuccessful examples, just to see how this can be done. And engagement with the local community is paramount to that. Now, um, as an allocation, we've already engaged with the local community and all the local parish councils to ensure that they have information um, about what will emerge from this development. The council has done their own communication, have done that very successfully, um, but we have embarked on our own parish meeting so that members are aware. If we are successful in getting the allocation through, which we certainly hope we will be, then that engagement will continue. And if you pick up the um, answers to questions by the council, they reference, um, with our blessing, the stakeholder reference group, the SRG, uh, to which we will um, be a participant of that, which we will create um, stakeholders coming together to discuss the design and evolution of the new settlement. It is it is a big beast farm, and uh, whilst there may be 2,400 houses and a 10 hectare business park rail station now, um, we anticipate that that will grow to 5,000 houses in the fullness of the life of this new settlement, uh, and that is what the government wants. That they they want uh, delivery of large scale developments to be well thought out within a new settlement such as this. So the stewardship aspect will be governed through an independent chairman with the communities involved and with other stakeholders involved, council, county council, um, and all other bodies. But Mom, the important aspect that um, taxes a lot of residents and others is uh, it's all very well for Mr. Fong to spout on about his bicycles and, and trying to get people out of their cars, but how does that um, survive over the life of this particular development because it's going to take a long time and probably longer than I will be around. And that's where we've looked at examples across the country. And the example I'd like to cite here, Mum, is, is the Nansledden example in by the Duchy of Cornwall um, down in uh, Newquay. And I was invited to, to, to look at that and the legacy that they've produced there. And it, it's a very different flavor, I'm afraid, Mom. It's it's very much King Charles's design, and it's uh, it's it's either lovable or or, or 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 undesirable to some. But I think that the aspects actually work, and to get a an urban extension of that size rolled out, and for the design philosophy to be maintained and delivered by PLC and national house builders, is an amazing task. And the Duchy of Cornwall has succeeded simply because they created a design handbook. And that is exactly what we will be doing here. We'll be create, creating a, a design manual. Um, it will go further, and it will go further than the, the principles in the Garden Communities document, because we want it to pioneer sustainable change. We want to turn that corner and we want to deliver a very sustainable community. And to be honest, Mom, my um, client team are driving that and they want to ensure that we create something different. Now, it's all very pious and we must do this, Mom. And uh, the sessions on the uh, sustainability earlier on in, the, in this examination showed that we have to do this. Uh, but from a marketing perspective as well, not just within the Gloucestershire housing market, but nationally, uh, clients are demanding more sustainability out of the way they live. They don't want to do the same old fashioned uh, fossil fuel living, get in their car and move on. So every aspect of the design of this development will be looked at to try and get people doing things differently so that uh, we are able to change the way we both live and work. Down to the design of the houses where we put the bicycles so that they are the first thing that come out of the, of the house rather than the car. Down to accessibility of schools and footpaths and cycleways. Down to the design of houses. Um, even down to the design of the uh, employment buildings and where they're located. So the stewardship of this is of paramount importance, Mom, and we will engage directly with the council and other stakeholders 
um, once the application is launched to make sure that we can pull that together quickly so there is a very clear and transparent route for negotiation and influence on the design of this settlement. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, I just want to just emphasise that this is not the appropriate point in the agenda to be talking about infrastructure. So um, I can see Mr. Drover's hand's gone up. So I was just going to say, if, if you wanted to come back on the point about rail, we'll, we're going to discuss that a bit later on uh, in the agenda, uh, point three. Um, just to, to go uh, back on some of that, Mr. Fong. So in, in terms of the practicalities of that, um, once any new development would be up and running in terms of stewardship of it ongoing, how is that actually going to be embedded in the development itself? Now, are you um, envisaging setting up some sort of um, residence organisation, some sort of company that's going to be uh, managing the development that um, would perhaps be handed over to the residents um, to, to run? Um, that's sort of essentially what the, the question was um, was getting yeah. really. Yeah, we, we've we've already engaged um, a public relations consultant, Mom. They've already given us a blueprint to what shall shall happen on the stewardship basis. We are discussing, and we've we've named it ourselves, a stakeholder reference group, the SRG, and that's uh, you'll find that in in paragraph five nineteen point two of the council's responses to questions, uh, and we were part authors of that, Mom. And that will come with the planning application. So it will be available and transparent from the planning application stage onwards. So at this stage, you, you're not clear whether there would be some, I mean, I'm, I'm, most new developments nowadays have some form of um, management company set up to, to manage them, such as green yeah, space. It, like yeah, it, it, it will be part of the management company, and that's where it will get its its life from. The management company will be um, pulled together with our client team, Lion Square and uh, sorry, Lion Court and Green Square, Green Square Accord, and they will they will start funding the SRG from the outset, so that it has credence and accessibility to local residents. And that will be coordinated by our uh, public relations consultant, and then we will set out regular meetings for that. And, and it's important because there are a lot of residents, they need confidence. Uh, there are a lot of concepts in here which are different, Mom, and they need to be tested. And we want to test them with residents and stakeholders to make sure that they work and are delivered. And so... Um, for this particular development, would you envisage just thinking about the community engagement principles, which you've explained that just sit behind the concept of, of sharpness? Uh, would you envisage, um, in terms of the, the man management board, the overall gov uh, structure of the governance, that residents would have representatives on that board? Uh, absolutely. It, it's, it's paramount because um, at the end of the day, we are creating a new community. There is an existing, lively and vibrant community in the Barclay cluster. Um, it will have a profound influence on everybody within that area. There will be significant benefits uh, to people, um, but we understand the frustration of people presently because uh, nobody wants to see large amounts of development on their back door. Uh, we want to try and guide people to, and, and let them see the benefits and see when those benefits will arise. And um, there will be significant benefits, not just to the Barclay cluster, but to Stroud District and the Gloucestershire area as a whole. And then we hope very much, Mom, that we will create an exemplar for the rest of Gloucestershire so that uh, when future large developments come along, there will be a template of how things can be done sustainably and with less reliance on the car as uh, the new tra Department of Transport uh, circular dictates. Thank you. Um, Councillor Green. Thank you, ma'am. I just wanted to um, raise the issue. Um, I was 
quite concerned about this this management company as we know there are thousands and thousands of people up and down the country that are locked into these management companies um, with no recourse and no way of getting out even though the properties that they have built are freehold can we have assurances that this is not going to be the case, that freehold properties are not going to be subject to increasing, demanding amounts of money um, for this development? Um, okay, I'll, um, I'll ask Mr. Russell to respond to that in a moment, but I, I suspect probably that that the answer would be that's probably an issue for the planning application to, to decide because at this stage it's it's still sort of quite strategic high level concept so they've, they've probably not thought about that so I think that's that's a, a, a very valid point to raise um, but probably one to make um, with with any planning application should that come forward. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr Drover. Um, thanks, ma'am. Um, yeah, my point wasn't about transport. I, 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 I um, I'd assume this question was about the the mechanism for stewardship, um, um, uh, how the stewardship company would be in funds and how it would discharge its duties. I mean, there's lots of examples about that. Homes England have um, with um, you know gifting the stewardship company assets, the local centre, or becoming a landlord or something like that. Um, that, and that, and I am interested because obviously a stewardship company is fundamental to to um, running the mass service and, and integrating in transport. Um, so the the Nance London example is I mean it's a fantastic example. It's not probably not pertinent to this side because um, the Dutchy have a um, I understand sorry that they have a seventy five year business plan so they you know they can afford to do a loss leader on their commercial and run it for a lot longer but i, I accept that you you could get a um uh, a stewardship company that where land value is transferred to it in principle um the worst case scenario not I, I echo the councillor is that it's some tax on the service charge for residents the best case scenario is there's some asset but um i i thought there would be some meat on the bones of that and but it, it, again it's not my area of expertise it's just i was interested because a sustainable stewardship model is much more likely to be able to um, uh, knit the community together and run sustainable transport services. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Russell. Thank you, Inspector. Um, I just wanted to um, give, well, I guess everybody here, just some comfort in terms of where we are uh, in terms of the local planning, in, uh, in terms of future community engagement and stewardship. So the um, Garden City principles are embedded in the plan. On page 31 of the plan, we set them out, the Town and Country Planning Association's defining principles. And I just pick out a couple of those. Strong vision, leadership and community engagement and community ownership of land and long-term stewardship of assets. Now, when we come to the this particular site, as with the other new settlement, we do have specific requirements in the policy to um, for the requirement for a community engagement and stewardship strategy, design codes and spatial master plan and implementation plan to be submitted with the application as we discussed previously at the, during the application process, those documents will be um, scrutinized uh, it is, it's essential, uh, as I think we've all, we all agree, that this is an exemplar development, both in terms of community engagement and in terms of long-term stewardship. Now, um, you, you've heard from Mr. Fong around the uh, stakeholder reference group, which is, which I think, uh, or some things of that nature is, is essential if you're going to have not, not just consultation with the community, but but full on engagement as the reserve matters applications, the detail, the layout, all of the things that Mr. Fong spoke about are determined. So I think I think that is essential. So I think that that is um, one aspect that the council would be insisting upon as part of the um, evolution of the development beyond the, the sort of the, the framework that we have at the moment. 
In terms of stewardship, I just um, uh, uh, just remind everybody, I guess, what the Town and Country Planning Association says about garden city standards for the 21st century and, and in particular stewardship. It talks about integral to the model. The garden city model is the long term stewardship of assets, ensuring there are structures in place to guarantee the ongoing reinvestment of value created through the development process and to provide the financial means to maintain the wide range of community facilities that can be created. Uh, in terms of how you do that, um, that is not, it, it is a matter of, it's crucial, but it's a matter of detail that need we need to work on with the community rather than impose a particular framework at this stage. But I just wanted to just reassure everybody that the policy includes that requirement. That is a, an essential requirement that will be considered at the development management stage. Now, assets, um, one option would be, these, these are just options mentioned by the TCPA. One option would be to uh, hand the community assets over to a trust or a charity. Um, other developers will want to in, be in, involved and remain in place for many years or indeed in perpetuity. We heard that in terms of Wislow, for example. Um, and um, the the TCPA importantly says the garden city model can accommodate both approaches. So we're at this stage, we, we would argue, you know, one person's uh, lack of detail or lack of information is another person's flexibility and shaping with the community as we develop this, as we've developed this exciting um, proposal forward. Um, I would say, um, I, I, again, may, maybe um, Mr. Fazy can comment on this from the promoters, but certainly when we worked with the promoters to put forward our case to the government as part of the Garden Communities Fund, there was an intention of from Sharpness Development LLP at that stage to uh, be involved long term in the new community through the management of, um, for example, affordable housing units, and involvement in the management and uh, of open space and obviously the the sang uh, we talk in the policy around a managed nature reserve it will be critical that that nature reserve is managed long term and i imagine that that would be a very much a partnership working with um with natural england and uh, uh the a local wildlife trust for example so all of those matters you know it will be worked out in more detail there are different aspects different assets that may need to be treated in a different way, depending upon the overall function and purpose of those assets moving forward. But it is a live issue. Um, Councillor Green, uh, I've got a lot of sympathy for for, for the for the issue around um, some some pretty poor examples in the past of private management companies, and I understand there are concerns in certain parts of the district. It's a very live issue at the moment for the council to consider. Um, our approach is to um, review the our future guidance so we have obviously an open space for taking open space as an example we we have open, new open space standards in uh, identified in the local plan and we have a commitment to produce um supplementary planning document identifying how those standards and are going to be delivered uh long-term management maintenance is a crucial aspect um we at the moment uh, we are neutral about that issue. It, that may change in the future in terms of having a preference for um, community ownership, um, but that's that's very much for a few for the future in terms of the management and the detail um, implementation of those open space policies. But reassurance that the the local plan sets it out very clearly: community ownership of assets. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fazy. Morning, Mark. Uh, Andy Fazy, Strategic Land Director for Lion Court Strategic Land, and we are one half of the Sharpness Development LLP. <clears throat> A couple of points straight on stewardship. Uh, we, we refer to the stakeholder reference group, and I just wanted to make a point then in terms of the, the makeup of that group. That's almost inevitably going to evolve over time. When you set out uh, the process, we'll have, we won't have started, we'll have no residents. Clearly, we'll be talking to the existing um, elected members, we'll be talking to the existing communities. But as the development progresses, 
what typically happens and certainly happens with say some of the management companies existing residents will uh, be encouraged to get involved and be encouraged to join formally join the stakeholder the reference group because clearly they are going to be at the heart of this and in terms of making sure this thing works to their benefit and so we, when we talk about stewardship i think you're right it's, it's almost as whether this is an eip matter or whether it's something that we need to take away in terms of how we let them evolve as a process what does that look like well certainly what mark has uh, mark was still has been describing from the uh, tca that that seems to be an appropriate model to me but you've already got an llp body which is effectively a joint venture company between two parties you know we can look at how that is used in the future as a basis for holding some of this land in terms of its long-term maintenance but it will it will as, as, as mr pung has already said this is a project that's going to live outlive the likes of the likes of us because it you know we're talking here about 2400 we're talking we've already got a mindset to the longer term development of 5,000 units overall so it needs to have a body which is almost independent in terms of how it looks after the, the land the assets not just not just the nature reserve and the, and the sand but things like the community buildings what do what do the residents at that time how do they want to see it used? How do they want to see it maintained? And, and quite frankly, how much money do they want to see spent on, on some of these things? Um, a development I lived on myself um, 20 years ago, that had a process through the Section 106 where residents were able to vote whether they had a community centre. Now, in that case, the residents decided they didn't want a community centre, they just wanted to see open space where people could walk their dogs and, and so forth. And it's that sort of flexibility that I think any sort of stewardship uh, process needs to build in so that it can reflect, not the circumstances today, because we can't really, and I think it's inappropriate for us to say, here today, this is setting out the scene for the next 20 years. I think it has to have the flexibility and the ability to evolve. But one of the most important things I would also say is that whatever format it takes, it has to be capable of making a decision. What we can't have is designed by committee. And we see this time and again with different bodies who, for one reason or other, they either get dominated by a single person or you, you, you find that there's no decision maker. We need to have a system that's in place that, yes, it controls the, the land, it has uh, ownership of the land, but it's actually able to make decisions and implement those decisions. I think that's one of the important things that we need to consider. But honestly, I really don't think that's necessarily for something for today. I think that's detail that we need to go through. Thank you. So in terms of um, community ownership of the assets, is that something that's envisaged that once um, particular phases of the development have, have been completed or perhaps all of the initial um, sort of phases have been completed, that that would be then transferred to some sort of trust that would be owned by the community as a, as a whole. Mm -hmm. it's, and I appreciate the point that obviously it's, yeah. it's difficult to be specific at this stage, but just asking for general principles. It, it is, I think it's a scale of it that leads us to that conclusion. We've, we've done developments where a parish council have taken over the affordable, sorry, the um, urban space, because that's what they're used to doing. We've had other developments where the parish council have started out by saying, we want to take on the public open space. Then, when they see what that actually implies, it's been it's 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 just too big for them. And I think that situation would, would arise here, especially when you talk about areas of sand and nature reserve. We're talking about whether we should be talking this the likes of the Wildfire Trust. Are they a better person to bring on board or bodies to bring on board? Maybe not to control it, but maybe as an advisor. It's all those things that we need to be taken into account. And in terms of uh, funding, um, Councillor Green and then also Mr. Drover raised the point that there are uh, things like the, the MAS and sort of certain transport initiatives talk about um, 
being funded by the development, the, would you envisage um, that being funded by receipts into this management company via uh, resident contributions on an annual basis? Um, so, so well, that's model. It's probably going to be a combination, isn't it? The initial, excuse me, the, the initial setup and funding to lay to allow. Yes, that obviously comes from developer contribution. I imagine there'll be some sort of preset. And if you talk, start to talk about two and a half thousand or five thousand homes plus businesses on the way, it's going to be you know, be some sort of preset in terms of um, how you pay. You know, this this is so big it could become its own parish council. Um, so it'll be it'll be all those things we need to take into account. But I mean, I, I wouldn't rule it out. Thank you, uh, Mr. Payne. Thank you, Ma'am. Um, I appreciate that you know we'll be moving on to um, the uh, infrastructure points and rail network and coach services. Um, but I just wanted to come back um, just on a point um, that was made by uh, Mr. Fong in relation to the garden village ethos and um, and, and sustainable um, travel, which is you know to be embedded in that. Um, and um, I just want to sort of illustrate a point just with some um some numbers which <clears throat> which i'm taking directly from um the promoter's own um evidence and you 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 will have seen what we've had to say about that evidence in our um in in representations um but yeah just to put it into context so um the <clears throat> the the prediction is that the 2400 dwellings and 10 hectares of employment will generate around 2700 trips in the morning peak hour now of that 2700 trips um the um the, the the sustainable transport approach is anticipating that around 40 percent will stay um either internal or on the local transport network and that's so that's 1100 trips um that would stay within the functional transport area that includes Barclay, the site itself, Barclay, the docks, um, and Barclay Green. Um, now that's an, an exceptionally high level of, um, of, of sort of trip containment. Um, you, you, you know, that's your best chance of achieving some walking, cycling, and micro mobility um, for those um, destinations that that are within reasonable sort of travel distance on those modes. Um, so. You know, even based on those sorts of levels of um, sort of high trip containment, you're left with um, 1,600 movements, which would be traveling external to the um, the functional transport area. Um, those trips would be going to distant and split locations, um, Bristol, Gloucester, Stroud, um, and um, you know, so so that's just a bit of context before you know, just in respect to the Garden Village ethos, um, transport sustainability, um, and uh, we'll be moving on to rail network and coach services um, in the next item. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, what we'll do is we'll just um, essentially. I don't want to get drawn into a big debate about trip generation um, on this particular agenda item. So um, if anyone's sort of going to respond on that particular point, uh, please don't save it for the next agenda item. Um, then we'll try and keep things in a in a logical order. Um, Councillor Green. Thank you, Mum. I will just make very, very brief reference um, to the point that uh, Mr. Fong made about internalization, about people working and living in the same um, same area. And as we've just heard from Mr. Payne as well, um, I think he, Mr. Fong also said about the benefit, Barclay. I'm struggling to understand what real benefit there is to Barclay because you're going to have this internalization where everyone will stay within that one community. So that is the first point that I would like to, to make. I think also there's been absolutely no reference to um, this area being an aging population. Now, this is coming from somebody myself who has lived in this area my whole life. 
I have also seen that when um, when Mr. Fong has said about employment land, employment land has already been available at Sharpness all of my lifetime, if not longer. And then the last point I wanted to make is that we've heard an awful lot of talk about community engagement. You know, now that's all very well and good about having community engagement. But as we have seen from the local plan, um, from the whole kind of process, we have seen engagement being done with Stroud District Council and with other stakeholders. But the actual difference being is that nobody's listened to these communities, to the residents, to people like Bazrag. Um, so unfortunately, at this moment in time, I just do not have any confidence in this, especially going by past experience. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Higgs. Hello, Mum. Actually, um, I would certainly echo what Lindsay just said. The um, reason I put my hand up was actually for two points. One was very much mirroring what she was saying about the um, the lack of engagement. Oh, I've heard a lot about information and that coming in different guises, but actually to me, engagement is actually about talking to people and listening to them and responding in some positive way to the feedback that they offer. Um, and it's, you know, in the past, Mark Russell suggested the consultations exceeded strategy requirements, but our experience is that it's been inadequate. We had to beg for a roadshow in Berkeley um, and we were told it wasn't necessary, but we, we got it. And, and we had one of the best turnouts in the whole district from that roadshow. So um, I just wanted to say really that to me, um, history dictates people's behaviour. What we've seen so far is a very poor um, expression of, of engagement with the community. Um, and that the other thing is, I take exception to Paul Fong's suggestion that we're NIMBYs. Because we're not NIMBYs, we've come together as a small group of people and we've um, engaged, we've talked to our local people um, because we want some sort of proportional development here, not a new town that takes 80% of the desired building in the district in one, one place. So I uh, just really wanted to make those two points. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> just, just heard a bit of feedback then. Um, right, okay. Um, Mr. Fong, and um, what I would say is, um, on the, the next item, um, agenda item three, we're going to be looking specifically at the rail, the mobility as a service, um, and then also um, impacts on the, uh, the local road network in terms of transport links. So I'll just uh, reiter reiterate the point that in terms of the point raised about uh, internalization of trips, we'll come back to it then. So fully appreciate you probably want sure. to respond to that, but. Yeah, I, I'm just going to very briefly come back on a few of those points, Mum. I think it'd be helpful. But I'm going to start first by um, just just uh, following on from Mr. Russell is saying that Green Square Accord is a social housing provider, Mum, and they are excited about this development and they will be a long term stakeholder in perpetuity within this development because they will maintain ownership of the affordable housing within the development. So um, they, they anticipate that 30 or 40 percent of this will be their housing and community. So, so there will be long term stewardship in that respect. Um, very briefly, Mom, um, I did take you to uh, criterion F of the garden communities in terms of forward looking transportation. And, and I'm very, very handsomely supported by uh, the Department of Circular 0122, which says, moving away from transport planning based on predict future demand to provide capacity, predict and provide, to planning that looks at vision and validate. And um, Mum, if we are going to try and master our change in uh, the carbon emissions that we have, we, we have to be a little bit more visionary than just simply doing um, mathematical transport planning. So, so just just on that point, um, 
benefits to Barclay, um, there are there are a great many benefits to Barclay. Uh, there'll be integration between the communities. There'll be new schooling and, and facilities, doctor facilities, uh, etc. Uh, Mum, I'm going to immediately point you to EB30, if you wouldn't mind, and I'm going to direct you to paragraph 513, and this is a, a statement by South Gloucester and Stroud College, um, which simply says, the closest rail station is at CAM, however, a new commuter rail station at Sharpness would be hugely beneficial. Um, now, they choose their words carefully, Mum, they don't say beneficial, they say hugely beneficial. So that's one of the major um, uh, services and facilities within this cluster. And they are quite supportive and quite looking forward to a new cluster of uh, community coming down. Miss Green has said that there's been large tracts of employment land in the Sharpness area that haven't done anything. And she's right. She's absolutely right. And the reason they haven't done anything for a considerable period of time is because of lack of infrastructure and workforce in situ. And I've monitored this situation for at least 25 years. And if we can turn that around and get a workforce in situ, the likes of the um, uh, Howard Tennant's land, the uh, Stroud College land, 16 hectares, will flourish. And that again, Mom, is, is seen in EB30, where the report confirms that they will complement each other. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. Um, what I'll do now is come to um, Mr. Russell. I want to bring this agenda item to a close and then we'll have a short comfort break before we move on. So, uh, Mr. Russell, if you'd like to sort of respond to any points that you um, would like to and then just make any closing remarks on this particular issue, that would be useful. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I won't repeat um, what others have said. Uh, I just wanted to really come back to Councillor Green on um, uh, a number of points. Uh, firstly, she talks about an ageing population. Absolutely. She talks about um, uh, lack of employment opportunities. Absolutely. This is the whole point of this uh, allocation. It's place making. It's about regeneration. I can, uh, the, uh, the, the evidence is before you, um, but we've, in our evidence, we've identified it is an ageing population. We've identified that there are local indicators of deprivation, um, probably certainly no, no better um, than um, areas of Stroud and Stonehouse. So we've got, uh, these are, uh, people are shaking their heads, but the data is there, I'm afraid, and I can point you to it. It's national data, it's deprivation relating to income, educational attainment, employment, and quality of housing. We've got, we've had the closure of the Barclay Hospital, We've had the closure of the secondary school. We've had um, re reduced employment, obviously, because of the closure of the Barclay Power Station. What, what has resulted in that? It's resulted that people of working age are commuting out of the area, predominantly to Bristol. This is, this is the reality of the situation in this area. And, you know, planners are about supporting positive change. We have to get out of the cycle of deprivation, and declining infrastructure in this area. And we've got the positive proposals for the Canal and Rivers Trust. We've got the positive proposals from the college and from uh, local businesses in terms of the Gloucestershire Science and Technology Park. We've got other businesses in the area uh, who are also looking to develop their land uh, and, and previous allocations, which are now coming forward through the adopted local plan. This, this site, provides the opportunity to reverse some of those inherent structural decline, uh, uh, indicators of structural decline in the area. And I'm not accusing locals of being nimbus, far from it. I, I perfectly understand their concerns. But if we're going to break this cycle, we need to do, we need to bring in new investment into this area. Um, so the proposal for a garden community is exactly that. It's about bringing new investment, new opportunities, bringing down the average age of the local population, providing employment opportunities, bring, building back the local infrastructure, the social um, infrastructure, delivering additional affordable housing and employment. And, um, and obviously we're coming on to, um, to discuss public transport, but improving, significantly improving public transport to the area. So um, 
all of those things that Councillor Green is rightly concerned about, you know, we need to see positive action and we're proposing positive action on those points. So I think just to conclude, um, in terms of this item, which is about community engagement, um, yes, we have sought to engage with the community. There are many local people who are opposed to the development in principle. For those who have put forward concerns that we can seek to address, we have sought to do that. I remember having conversations on the ground in, in both Sharpness and, and um, and Barclay, where concerns relating to things like surface water drainage, um, uh, local infrastructure capacity, um, local access uh, in terms of local roads, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things, you know, we're very happy to take on board. It's difficult to um, respond to someone who, who, who said that they're implacably opposed to development because we are listening to them. We understand what they're saying, but we can't offer them that because that's not... You know that that we believe passionately that that there is um, a better future for this area, and we are proposing it. But we do believe that community engagement is essential to actually shape the form of the development. We've got a framework in the local plan. We need to put flesh on the bones, and it's very important that community involved through the structures, including the de developer reference uh, the reference group. But there may be better or alternative. Uh, me mechanisms as we as we develop the proposals um, uh, in, in the future. So it's important that for those who are willing to work with us from the community that, that we, we put in place the opportunity for the community to have a, a great say on what it will actually look like and what it will contain in, in detail and how they can support and manage, help manage and shape those facilities. Stewardship is important. Um, I think you've heard from the promoters, they're, they're very open to um, to what the best way forward in terms of where the community are willing and able to uh, uh, take forward the ownership and responsibility and that for management and, and this overall long-term stewardship that that's that is an option that remains on the table there'll be other more specific technical and um, uh, requirements where other bodies so ec ecological bodies uh, WWT uh, uh, natural England etc will inevitably be involved in in those in those aspects or indeed the environment agency uh, in terms of any flood risk infrastructure that's 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 uh, required to be maintained so um so we're very much alive to those issues and we believe that the development will conform with the garden city ethos uh if all of the policy is implemented in the local plan thank you Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I see um, another hand's got it. Just, just in terms of uh, procedure, I do have to give the last word to the council. That's just procedurally. So, um, uh, Ms. Higgs, if you'd like to respond, but I don't, I don't want, because I'm going to have to go back to Mr. Russell to ask if he wants to add anything. So just um, please, by all means, um, say, thank say. You, thank you. Um, I'm actually going to, we, we have had a previously, um, Mark Russell described this, the, the whole point of the, the uh, de massive development here is that of regeneration. So we have done a bit more um, homework about deprivation and relative me measures. And as far as we can find, the area is certainly not in the most uh, deprived categories. The last two available data sets, sets which could have influenced plan making are from 2015 and 2019. There are seven measures which make up the indices of multiple deprivation. Overall sharpness, barkness, Barclay and the area covering PS36 has experienced no change from 2015 to 2019 measures and are firmly in the mid-range, moving toward least deprived. Sharpness and Newtown are a six out of 10, 10 being the, the least deprived. And the area around phase one is a nine, as is Barclay itself. So I just wanted to make that statement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank. Um, Mr. Russell, um, if you, I, I've, obviously we've, we've had the discussion on the IMD and um, and such to do with uh, sustainability appraisal earlier in the uh, in the hearings, but um, <clears throat> just to give you the um, oh, sorry, <coughs> frog in my throat, um, Mr. Russell, if you if you'd like to respond to anything uh, on on that that's just been raised, please do so. Um, I haven't seen that in latest information. I'm, I'm not putting a spin on things. I'm not talking about no change or trying to disaggregate into between Sharpness or Newtown or by, I'm simply saying 
that publish national indicators, if you look at the super output areas relevant to this area, indicate that relatively compared with the rest of Stroud district, it is a deprived area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so I make that uh, 19 minutes past 11. Um, I really want to, in terms of just thinking about how the rest of today um, sort of pans out, <clears throat> my intention is to really get this item three infrastructure done before we break for lunch. So what I'm going to do now is propose we have a, a comfort break, because um, I think probably everyone would appreciate that. I certainly would. Um, so I think we'll come back at 11.40. Um, so we've, we've got about 20 minutes um, just to go and have a, a quick drink and whatever. So um, we shall resume at 11.40. Then I want to get through item three before we break for lunch. Thank you, everybody.
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the resumed session of Sharpness New Settlement. Hopefully everybody has rejoined. So we shall now carry on with our agenda. So we are on to item three, which deals with infrastructure. Um, so we, since our um, first session on um, Sharpness, we've had a couple of, um, well, quite a bit of new evidence submitted. Uh, regarding uh, rail and then also the uh, mobility as a service uh, proposal. Um, so what we were going to do is just work our way through them. Obviously, it is new evidence um, and uh, have a discussion around them. So if we can start and also to make the point as well, um, we're going to have a chat about viability alongside this, because I think really the, the two are very much interconnected. So I think it'd be a little bit too tricky to um, separate viability out from this discussion so we may as well just uh, talk about it alongside so if we start with the um proposed rail network um and sp specifically we've had the uh gloucestershire county council um review of transport note and then we've also had the response from the um land promoters as well on on that so if perhaps we just start there. So we have, shuffling my papers to get to the right one. So in front of me, we've got the, the Gloucestershire County Council document, first of all. Um, so the first section of this note essentially sort of talks about um, the DFT's um, business case requirements and then goes through sort of analysing those components and um, the reasons why in the writer's um, belief uh, the sharpness proposal wouldn't meet them. Um, appreciate obviously uh, Mr Fong and your colleagues will probably take issue with that but essentially in, in, in your response back to the County Council on that point, it's my understanding that you're essentially saying that it's your intention for the rail component to be funded by the development itself, and that it's not your intention to be um, submitting a business case to, to apply for public funding at this stage. Would that be correct? Yes, that's right, ma'am. Okay. Okay, so um, to unpack that then a little bit, um, I suppose we have to sort of um, take a walk through the, the costs of the, um, the sort of the railway proposal. So myself and my colleague can, can come to a view um, as to whether that's um, reasonable um, to expect that the development would be able to self-fund the, the railway proposal because um, obviously that will affect on whether it does come forward successfully. Um, so that's the, the sort of lens that we're coming from, if, if you like. Yes. Um, so um, looking at page seven of the Gloucestershire County Council document, it's set out costs um, for the, the four options. Um, so we've got the first one, which is a, the new station at Sharpness, um, branch line and infrastructure plus enhancements for a new train service to or from Gloucester, um, which is costed between anywhere between seven and 30 million. So um, perhaps Mr. Fong, if you sort of talk us through that first um, element and just explain to us the costs and what's involved and where they've come from. Mom, thank you. Um, for this particular subject, Mom, I'm going to introduce Mark Eden from Arcadis, who is responsible for pulling the cost together. And he will talk to that question for you, Mom. Mark, Hi. over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Paul. How do you do, Mom? Um, so um, the, um, the costs that have gone into the viability um, calculations, uh, a figure of 10.3 million um, uh, for the infrastructure um, enhancements. And, and that breaks down as follows. So we've got 3 million of railway infrastructure enhancements, 
That includes track maintenance and fettling of the track, um, improvement of the turnouts and removal of a track point um, at, the, uh, at the junction onto the main line. Uh, it includes some necessary signaling and telecommunications uh, modifications uh, to, to make sure that the passenger service is safe. Um, associated with those uh, with the track works and the signaling works, there's a, an amount of minor civil engineering works. And then we've also included an allowance for the maintenance of the existing structures along the spur. So th those infrastructure enhancements, they come to a number of three million. At the Sharpness Vale station, we've got a cost of approximately two million. Um, so that, 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 that includes a 90 meter long platform, including access to and from the platform, uh, track and turnouts, because we would have to provide a bay platform into the, um, in, in, into the platform to, to allow um, any, any possible future access into the docks itself for freight, if that re required. Um, signaling and telecommunications works associated uh, with the station, and again, an amount of minor civil engineering works, and that comes to a number of two million. Um, we've got other direct costs uh, of, of approximately 0.4 million. Uh, th those, those direct costs would include um, dealing with statutory undertakers along the route um, and uh, an amount of temporary works. Um, we then apply some percentages to those direct costs. So the direct costs, as I said, uh, come to a total of 5.4 million. Um, so we're looking at approximately 23% of indirect construction costs. Um, other client costs, including design and project management at 14%. And then an allowance for optimism bias of 40%. Now that that uh, allowance for optimism bias um, is um, a little bit lower than might otherwise be applied to, to larger, more complex schemes. But because we have a great deal of confidence in the costings uh, through access to the uh, uh, to the maintenance information that, that, that we have through Arcadis, um, we, we, we feel that the optimism bias of only 40 percent uh, is appropriate. So once you've applied all these percentages to the direct cost, you get this figure of 10.3 million pounds. And as I said, that's the number that's gone into the uh, viability assessment. Uh, just to say for the optimism bias, I didn't quite, was that 40 as in 40%? 40 as in 40. Um, so that that's... Um, uh, an allowance on construction capex of thirty of thirty five percent, and an allowance on construction works duration of five percent. And I'm I think I'm right in saying that in the uh, the county council's documents, it, it says that network rail normally say sixty percent for optimism. That's correct. Yeah, that, that that that's correct. And the reason that we brought down the capex optimism bias. Um, uh, to the 35% is we, we've, we've, we, we do have access to maintenance records. We know and we understand that the, uh, that the existing spur is maintained and maintained well to, to, to cater for the, um, for the nuclear decommissioning traffic that, that run along that spur. Um, and the modifications that we're making are not of a complex nature. And again, that, that's why we, we, we feel comfortable within the guidance that we're following, uh, that we could bring that down to 35%. Um, if, um, if you think, in case you're wondering, if you were to go up to 60%, that optimism bias number would, would go up to 4.4 4 million. Um, what would be the overall total if that were the case? That would be 7.8. And have you included any allowance in there for, for contingencies, any, anything like that? It includes allowances for contingencies. Um, it includes um, indirect construction costs, as the preliminaries of the contractors um, at, at, at standard rates and, and for design and project management. Uh, is that applied as a percentage? 
the the indirect construction costs are applied as a percentage that, that's the 23 percent figure that i mentioned other client costs at 14 percent but we we have um we, we have an allowance of approximately 11 percent in there for contingencies on the direct cost as well um mr stallworthy Thank you, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to make a very brief point on the optimism bias and the figure that you quoted from Network Rail. Normally, optimism bias is um, included in the calculations to protect government um, in terms of their funding projections for uh, the for projects which uh, may be subject to change um, and unforeseen circumstances which could escalate that cost. So it's to protect against that. In this instance, it's funded developer. Uh, de uh, developer. Uh, it's developed it's funded by the developer so the developer carries that risk in terms of optimism bias okay, thank, thank you Lee. uh mr drover thank you uh, sorry thank you ma'am <clears throat> yeah just um just before we d dive into the cost i just wanted to um set a bit of context um of the um, of the stages, um, so that the promoter the promoter um, has a a number of critical stages um, to deliver this railway enhancement scheme, um, and they need to really be tackled in order for the for the scheme to progress to delivery. And at the moment, um, uh, um, delivery of rail schemes is fraught with difficulty. I'm sure everyone knows. Um, uh, there's a um, they all begin from a position of uncertainty and they, you need to build a consensus um, and get support. And I stand tech points out in, in their report that, they, um, that reintroducing services is a complex undertaking. Um, so, and, and they also point out that many have been delivered. So the railway enhancements are delivered. Um, um, all of them will have successful um, strategic and economic business cases and, and they would have been able to compete for the limited capacity on the rail network. So the um, just to put that in context, the Restoring Your Railway report, um, uh, I think it's this year, um, shows only 5% of schemes submitted for funding um, are currently progressing for delivery and nearly three quarters of those were rejected, including Sharpness. Um, this does not mean that none of these schemes will be delivered, but it, it does demonstrate that um, how difficult it is um, uh, to meet the threshold required for delivery. And one bit of that is obviously uh, the cost and the finance. So th those um, those hurdles um, obviously demand, and I'm sure we'll come on to that in a minute, um, the train service is, uh, itself, because the train operating company has to run it, um, the cost, the finance, and, and uh, probably more importantly, the governance. And um, I, I'll, I'll come back to the other ones, but we, because we dove right in on cost, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that one now. Um, so on the cost, I would have expected a scope of works to be agreed with Network Rail. Um, you know, the proposal is to undertake enhancements on um, their property in order to introduce the train service. So uh, at this stage, the promoter has made assumptions as to the nature and cost of the works required. Um, so until agreement is reached on the scope and cost of Network Rail, um, um, there can be no certainty of the scale of the finance required and the affordability to the promoter. So the, the most recent report from the promoter now drops the very light rail option um, uh, in favour of heavy rail. Now the price tag, and this is optimism bias, how you define it, is, is between 10 and 30 million. So the, the upper limit um, is um, obviously including track renewal. So you might argue that... Um, and I'm sure we'll hear from the promoter why that that's not needed, but um, being optimistic that um, track renewals aren't needed. But that, you know, at this stage in a, in a feasibility, you, you, it would not be unreasonable to include track renewal costs in the feasibility cost. So um, it's not GCC's job, sorry, Gloucester's, the county council's job to agree these costs. I would have expected that to be discussed between Network Rail and the promoter. I mean, at this stage, only at a very high level, but just get the ingredients right. Um, in my opinion, there's the potential that this is under, underestimated this cost, because even with the track renewal, um, I think we pointed out in our report that the exclusions include um, alterations to level crossing, drainage, signaling, um, cuttings, um, 
and um, obviously we've already discussed optimism bias is lower than would be expected in fact i think it's uh, i'm not a rail expert but they, on some elements um, um optimism bias is um is higher again i think um for rail stations it's 70 percent. so uh, at this stage we've I would have expected much more engagement with network rail and uh, inevitably a, a higher risk cost. And then, um, I mean, we've heard that um, it's fully funded. So on the finance hurdle, um, uh, given the precise nature of the cost of the and the cost of the works are, are not clear, um, there must be some risk that the eventual costs are unviable to the funder. It's inevitable. I mean, if we're up there, if we, you know, if it's in the 30 to 50 million pound bracket, that needs to be budgeted. Um, given and the patronage levels are questionable, and we'll come back to demand. Um, I'm sure you'll have a question on that. I would say they're wildly optimistic. It would not be unreasonable to assume that revenue levels are not achieved um, and the service would need um, long term ongoing revenue support. Um, uh, so there's no evidence on, we, we've heard from the promoter that they're going to fund the capital. I don't think there's any evidence that the promoter is guaranteeing to um, to underwrite um, revenue costs of, of running the rail, rail line in perpetuity. Uh, but I'll let them come back on that. So on the costs um, um, uh, and finance, uh, they're sort of underpinned by the demand. So we have to, you know, I, th I will come back to demand, but... Um, I think that we would have expected a lot more work to do, be done by this stage. Okay. Um, shall I come back on the question of costs now, Mom, or would you like to, uh, uh, Lisa? McCaffrey yeah. Just while I can see Ms. McCaffrey's hands up, but just while this is fresh in my mind, I'm going to come back um, on that. So. Um, it it would be useful um, in addressing Mr. Drover's points if you also um, outline um, exactly what discussions, if any, have you had with Network Rail, um, how recent were they, and um, what, if anything, has, has been agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll let Lee Stallworthy come on to the discussions that were had with Network Rail. Um, they, they, were, they were some months, if not years ago. Um, uh, that, was, that was before my... Um, engagement in the project, um, but I, I want to pick up on the, um, on the on the cost element and and, and the the process of engagement with uh, with Network Rail. So um, no, Network Rail have an asset protection group um, for, for obvious reasons. They they want to protect their interests and the interests of the of their of their customers, the train operating companies and the freight operating companies. Um, the uh, the developer hasn't entered into uh, an access agreement yet with with the asset protection uh, group and and frankly that's not necessary right now um you know when when um well, I, I suppose when when the project uh, moves into the next stage of planning uh, that, that that would be the time um to to engage with with asset protection but but of course um we are we are familiar as an organization um, with those processes, uh, we we um, we we, uh, we represent um, developers, uh, and, and we do do work for Network Rail um, directly on the on their on their infrastructure, um, and and we, we we do work ranging from um, a few hundred thousand pounds uh, up to tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds uh, of, of infrastructure enhancements on the on the railway, including some pretty significant stations. Um, in terms of the the infrastructure costs, um, as a, as, a, as I mentioned, um, we uh, we have access to uh, to asset records. Um, so we have access to the uh, to the tra to the track quality records. We have access to the um, to to the uh, to the bridge inspection information. Um, there were some exclusions that have been highlighted in the. Um, uh, uh, in, in the report, um, but but frankly, they're they're not going to add into the um, uh, into the costs uh, for, any, for any significance. Um, there are no significant level crossings along the route, for example, uh, a handful of farm crossings, and there are no, there is no formal drainage um, through the route, um, which might surprise you. It surprised me, but the, um, uh, I'm gu I'm guessing that the um, that the ground um, that the surrounding ground um, drains uh, rather well. The, the 
I said, the track quality is good, and we don't need to uh, to replace the track. You know, we're, we're, we're talking, we're, we're looking here at providing a minimal viable product uh, to bring the um, to bring this uh, this spur into um, in, into passenger operation. Um, the existing track through there is a, is a bullhead track. It's an old form of, uh, of the track, but it's perfectly acceptable to run passenger services on a, on a bullhead um, track form, um, as opposed to a more modern flatbed, uh, flat bottom rail with, with concrete sleepers. Uh, and the, the costs that we've, um, that we've um, identified, they, they make assumptions with regards to the numbers of sleepers that might need to be replaced. Um, they make assumptions with regards to rail replacement, uh, to replace worn rail, and they also uh, they also include an allowance for um, uh, for the uh, increase in line, the necessary increase in line speed, whereby we would um, tamp through the alignment. Uh, so tamping uh, is, a, is, a, is an operation uh, peculiar to, uh, to 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 the railways. Um, the, the the tamping machine will will lift and realign um, the railway to appropriate super elevation uh, or what we call cant in, in, in railway circles um, for, the, for the required line speed of 60 miles an hour. Uh, at the junction, the existing junction is only 30 miles an hour and can remain at 30 miles an hour um, and, and, and still provide safe access onto the railway and, in, and into the main line. I, I covered all of uh, Mr. Drover's um, uh, questions. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'm just going to come back on a couple of things. So, um, in terms of the allowance made for the uh, increase in line speeds, um, mm -hmm. that... sorry, could you repeat that question again? You said that an allowance was made in terms of. Um, the infrastructure improvements that are going to be made to increase the line speed. Um, That's correct. What, what was that allowance? Um, that's that's an allowance that's built into the um, into the permanent way works um, uh, as part of the um, as, as part of the construction works. But what what was the figure? So so that that would be approximately five percent. Was, um, looking at the um, the infrastructure delivery plan, the 2022 addendum one that was published, um, there's a summary of um, the response um, that Network Rail has provided. And in that, um, one of the points that Network Rail have made is a, a cost well into the tens of millions of pounds to reinstate the branch line as expected. So that would indicate that the costs may be somewhat more considerable than yeah. being mentioned. I, I think I think at the time um, the when when the um, restoring your railway uh, application was, was put forward, uh, there there were there were some pretty wild assumptions, frankly, uh, with regard to the amount of um, track renewal that would be required. Uh, as I mentioned, we 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 look we 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 are proposing a minimal viable product. You don't you don't need to run, you don't need to replace the tracks. You don't need to double up on the tracks to provide a safe railway service on that um, on that spur. And has that approach been discussed and agreed with Network Rail? No, we've had no engagement with Network Rail, but but then we don't need to. Um, yeah, we um, as as I said. Um, as an organisation, we've got a significant amount of experience um, uh, at workshops when we started to look at the costings again. I brought in experts uh, from uh, from across our business. Um, I think the combined experience within the room at the time was probably about 150 years, including my own 30 years um, of, of carrying out design of railways uh, in the UK uh, and across the world. Okay. And and uh, and just just come back to the uh, to the issue of um, uh, engagement with 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 Network Rail uh, as and when uh, we you, the the project or the the developer does engage with Network Rail, um, they they would engage with organisations uh, such as Arcadis um, or, or or Atkins or Arab 
um, and and each organisation would come up with, um, with with similar proposals. I'm sure you you don't need um, to to carry out a significant amount of works to bring a new service onto the spur. And in terms of Mr. Drover's point about um, underwriting costs and in terms of who carries the financial risk, um, is if patronage levels um, do not prove to be at the level anticipated, um, would at that point um, the developer step in to provide some sort of subsidy in order to keep the service going, or, or would that? Would you envisage that that's passed on to the, um, the sort of stakeholder group that would be um, managing the long term stewardship of the development? How, how would that work? I'd have to defer to Mr. Fong or, or Mr. Solworthy for, to answer that question. Well, Mr. Fong? Well, I, I, I will let Mr. Solworthy answer, but just, just very briefly on that point. Um, Clearly, we are firstly we're committed to the rail as a sustainable form of transport. So, the developer will will row in until such time as that service becomes viable, and we know it's viable. Um, uh, before that, we will we will run the bus service to Gloucester, um, but we will keep making uh, strides to make and deliver the bus uh, service. Uh, sorry, the train service. I just want to comment quickly on the point with regard to Network Rail and the significant costs that you raised, Mom. Um, I, I was at the meeting with Network Rail. I, I can't say I'm a rail expert. Uh, there, there are others here that are. Um, but at that meeting, they, they were happy and confident um, about the delivery of the service. Um, but they also made an assumption that uh, the track needed to be replaced. Uh, only because they hadn't made their own condition assessment and suggested to us that we, we would need to make a condition assessment and come back to them on that basis. Now, that condition assessment has been made, Mom, and that's why our, our figures are very accurate in terms of what the cost is for the delivery of that. I'll hand over to Mr. Stallworthy in terms of uh, the, 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 the delivery of the, the rail service. Just before you go, so um, have you then gone back to Network Rail um, after you've done that condition assessment to um, agree the final with them? No, we haven't. We've we've gone back. To, well, we've we've picked up Mr. Eden and Arcadis, who, as as he's explained, says we don't have to go back because we, we've already done the the work in terms of deliverability. It's now just moving it forward, um, and. Uh, Mr. Solworthy's paper is absolutely correct. This is this is not an overnight job to uh, get a new branch line, uh, and it, it it will take a lot of time and investment uh, by us to make sure it's deliverable. Um, the key note there is that the client team is happy to spend that time and investment to make sure this is delivered because it is a sustainable facet of transportation that we want to deliver, not not just for our community but for the wider community. Mr. Stolworthy. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I think, that, yeah, there's, there's a context to all of this that I think we all need to be mindful of, and that is that, and Mr. Driver pointed it out quite correctly right in the beginning, and that is that it's not going to be easy. These things are not simple. There are many role players and stakeholders involved in the rail industry, from the Department of Transport to Network Rail to the, the, uh, um, the Office of Road and Rail uh, and various other entities that are involved in that process. And that relationship between them is evolving as well because of the uh, the advent of Great British Railways and the, what the role they will play and how that will affect network rail and what their functionality is. Um, but I think, so, um, you know, th and we know that th these things will, uh, they are complicated and they may take time and it depends which avenue and which route we go down with regards to procuring the services, which we haven't really defined yet because we're still trying to grapple with the best option. Uh, and there's, there's a time frame attached to each of those options. Um, and whilst we might not know exactly what the time frame is yet to implement the rail, what we are doing is we are operating express coach services to Gloucester in the interim. Um, but we are, we are keen to pursue the rail option because we believe that it is the best option to achieve the best outcome. We know that Gloucestershire County Council's um, uh, pathway to net zero carbon by 2045, the, the vision for rural development is, is leveraging existing public transport assets 
um, focusing on active mobility. So we're trying to achieve that and align with that by doing uh, pursuing the rail option because it is the best option in terms of mass transit for, for people with defined origins and destinations such as Gloucester. Um, so no, be mindful of the fact that there, it's complicated and there are many role players um, and there, there are different processes that we have to follow. And some of them may end up in a business case, but it might not be the five stage business case defined by DFT in terms of applying for public funding, but it might be a business case uh, that the that ORR require to prove that uh, this is responding to a need and that it's viable. Um, so we're mindful of those and we, we're navigating those processes at the moment. Understanding the timeframes associated with those is that we will continue to operate the express coach services to Gloucester, however long it takes to get the rail service going and however, whatever process we have to follow to get that to, to happen. Um, the next step in the process is to engage in those processes. And uh, the first one will be to discuss that with Network Rail. Um, we'll talk to them about the costing. We have spoken to them the last time we met, I think Paul reminded was 2021. We were talking about, uh, because one of the, the, the functional mandates of, of Network Rail is to manage the timetable. So we spoke to them uh, in, in quite a lot of detail in relation to the timetable and our timetable study that we did to see whether or not we could fit the passenger rail services onto the mainline services was submitted to Network Rail. They responded to say that they've done the, their, their quality assurance assessment on our um, timetable study and that, they, that it's sound and valid. They did point out in that letter, which is appended to both GCC's um, uh, latest uh, report by SLC Rail, as well as our, it's, it's in our evidence as well. Um, and that there are, they've, they've highlighted various elements that we need to do in taking this forward. And we're very mindful of those and we, we intend to proceed on those, those, the, on, on those processes. However, they, they unfold and they are, they are emerging because of the, 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 the Great British Railways and, and what their mandate is, and that's not yet defined and how that relates to Network Rail's new mandate, et cetera, but we'll navigate those processes. But the plan B is that we continue to, to operate um, the express coach services until such time as the rail service can come online. In terms of the viability and the operational cost aspect of it, um, quite rightly, it's, it's a concern and um, Nathan has, has, has raised this as well. Um, in our calculations, um, what we've done, and we can talk about demand numbers as well, um, but that again, it are based on projections, based on data, um, based on populations and census information and trip generation. And, and we, we haven't fudged any of those numbers. We've used um, the you know, the standard best practice to calculate trip generation um, and mode share and, and journey purpose, et cetera. Um, but what we've calculated is that we will require a certain critical mass of patronage before the rail service becomes viable. Um, and for us, that is at around 1,200 homes. And, um, and, but that, that's just based on, on our current calculations. If it turns out that that demand uh, gets pushed out into the future, we'll continue to operate the express coach services until such time we reach the critical mass for viability of the rail service. But based on the 1,200 homes, uh, our calculations to date, and this is based on um, real operating cost data extracted from the office and road and rail on existing comparable services that are currently operating in the country. Um, and we've used uh, the calculations, uh, all their costs on diesel fuel, the rolling stock costs, um, the access charges, the other operating expenditure, for example, um, and compared that with the operating revenue that we are likely to achieve based on the patronage numbers that we're projecting in terms of ticket sales um, and service contributions, et cetera. And, and those together, um, we've, we've, we've calculated in terms of what the operational subsidy be, will be required over a period of time, uh, which is built into the viability calculation now. And we anticipate that that will be about 3 million over three years until such time as it reaches a viable point where it can wash its own face. That is obviously subject to a multitude of variables and we will need to monitor that over time. Um, and that time frame may, may get expanded in terms of when we start the rail service in terms of critical mass of patronage, for example. Um, that was a bit of a mouthful. I hope that answered your question, Inspector. Yeah, so um, if, again, just go to back to the point of obviously, you know, patronage uh, fluctuates just um, <clears throat> anyway, so it may be more, it may be less. Um, so that figure of three million over three years, is the flexibility built into that to um, pay more and for pay, to pay over a longer period if that should prove necessary? I think the, the question of in perpetuity is quite an important one and I don't think there's any precedent for that anywhere. Um, and 
you know, obviously going through the processes and developing the business cases and getting the 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 um, the access arrange agreements and and following all of those processes. This will all come out through that process with a lot more detailed calculations and uh, and there will be uh, contractual agreements with operators. There will be agreements in terms of the business case and that will need to get signed off. So all of that will be worked out uh, and it will be worked worked out as it's evolving and changing over time. Um, so we haven't got there yet, but I think as far as precedent goes in terms of um, a developer contributing to operating costs for rail um, in perpetuity. I don't think there is a precedent for that. Um, and I'm sure Mr. Faisy will, will have a response to that. So then for, presumably in that case, if um, the intention is not to fund that in perpetuity, then there, there would be some point, presumably after the this three years of having three million each year that you would then say, well, it now stand on your own two feet and fund yourself. Yeah, so it's, it's at the moment, the calculations are based on three years, um, based on the demand projections and the cost of rail. Obviously the cost changes over time as well. Um, so all of this needs to be factored in and there will need to be a longer term calculation. At this point, we've taken it to the local plan um, but obviously there's beyond the local plan and that will increase the patronage further. So there will need to be a longer term, a longer projection of the cost uh, in, in through the business case process, whatever form that takes in getting um, the necessary agreements in place to operate the rail service. I think it's also important to, to, to remember, um, Inspector, is that in our evidence, we have also um, calculated um, what it would look like if we didn't implement the rail service, if there was no rail service. And we've called that our fallback scenario. It's not our first choice because it's not sustainable and it's not the direction we need to be heading in terms of, of transport provision. But we have calculated that as well and we call that the fallback position. Um, and we've also um, analyzed the network effects of that. If everyone was using the road, road-based transport, whether it be road-based public transport or cars, instead of using the rail and all of that demand was on the network, what infrastructure we would need to, 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 to upgrade in order to mitigate that impact. We've identified eight junctions that would need to be, to be mitigated. Obviously, um, Ms. McCaffrey will be very interested in what the impact of that will be on junction 14, um, but we haven't got to that level of detail yet. We know that there will be, um, and it's a question of what our proportional contribution to that would be, um, uh, and that will, that will be defined um, as we get more into the detail and, and, and into the application and transport assessment work, um, for example. But um, I think we, we've also calculated what, if we were to just do the, the sustainable approach and have rail service operational, there will be some infrastructure requirements. If we can't get rail off the ground, there will be more infrastructure requirements, and we're aware of those, and we have concept designs for those junction improvements. Um, obviously, that will need to be uh, fleshed out in a lot more detail as we progress. Uh, so I just, just wanted to point out that we do have uh, a, a, an idea of what would happen if we didn't have the rail service in terms of the impact on the network. And in terms of um, the express coach service being your plan B, um, if the, the rail um, doesn't get off the ground, would that then be the developer's intention to fund that in perpetuity? Or again, would that have a, a finite point for funding? Uh, so similarly, we, we've done um, calculations for the express coach services and express, express coach services um, from day one are plan A um, because we will be operating express coach services from the beginning. Um, but uh, you will recall in, in previous conversations that we are talking about demand responsive um, express coach services. So the benefit of, of that approach is that you can scale the, 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 the supply based on the demand at the time. So when you've got um, early occupations, you have small scale express coach services, which could be smaller vehicles, less frequent, for example, um, and the mobility as a service application and platform helps us to, uh, to, to match the supply and demand in real time. Um, and uh, so the, the intention towards Gloucestershire, towards Gloucester is that um, at such time that rail patronage is sufficient to be viable, then and that becomes introduced that the, the, the express coach services to Gloucester start to scale back. It doesn't affect the express coach services that are planned towards Bristol because we don't have a rail option in that direction without building um, the missing southern cord on the rail line, which is cost prohibitive. Um, so we will continue to operate uh, and we'll, that will be uh, plan A indefinitely for Bristol. Um, so the, the, the benefit of, of the, way, the way that we've calculated it is that um, matching the supply to the demand helps to narrow that gap between subsidy requirements. And we've, we've met with um, uh, operating companies that, that do these, these types of services. We've got operating cost information from them. 
It's also very encouraging to hear that um, in the letter that um, Mr. Nick Small, uh, I think, wrote to the, to the inspectorate um, 26th of April that um, Stagecoach are also looking at demand responsive transport now. So um, that's that's very encouraging as well that that they're branching out into that that operational model as well. But the so is the intention to carry on funding that Express Coach service in particular uh, to Bristol, and then uh, the same with Gloucester if. That is yep. still your fallback position in the event that rail doesn't happen? Yes, uh, exactly. And it, based on our calculations and our patronage calculations, and this is subject to debate, but it's based on calculations of using trip generation and, and standard best practice of, of doing those calculations, is that um, there will be a point when the express services, the supply and demand will match to the point when they become uh, self-sufficient as well. Okay. It's, it's sooner in the express coach services because they don't have the same level of operating cost and it's easier to match the supply and demand in terms of the fleet size and the frequency. It's a little bit more dynamic than, than rail is. Okay. Um, if worst case scenario, let's say just hypothetically, um, that point isn't reached where supply um, and demand meet, um, what would be um, the, the plan then? Um, would you carry on funding or would you step back and just say, well, this, this isn't financially viable, we'll, we'll withdraw it? The, so the, the developer will enter into agreements with those bus operating companies in the beginning. And part of that agreement will be at what point does the subsidy end and that the service operates on its own. Um, and, that will, and the supply and demand will be matched uh, because that is the nature of that type of operation of demand responsive transport. That's exactly the purpose of it is to be able to match the supply and demand so that the, the, the operating company can curtail their costs based on the demand um, so that they can match that. Thank you. Uh, Ms McCaffrey. Thank you. Um, my point isn't solely related to rail, so I'm happy to come back if you'd rather I do a little bit later, although I do have the odd comment on rail. Um, yeah, well, if you'd like to make the yeah. point on, on rail, I mean, you, you're welcome to come back in if something else occurs. Yeah, I think the question was about the 10.3 million, but I think it's, my initial question was about the 10.3 million, but I think it's actually been answered, whether that includes the improvement contribution to junction 14 that's included in the IDP. Now, if I'm listening to everything that's just gone before, I think the answer is the 10.3s for rail only. And that's therefore, right. yeah, and therefore, in the recent viability that, again, we've only looked at this morning, the reference to junction 14 isn't actually picked up. So I just want to make that clear. But going back to those comments on rail, um, it is fundamental, actually, for the success of that mode shift that the rail is in early. And at the moment, what I'm hearing is there is there isn't that certainty. Um, with regard to the assessment of Junction 14, um, I suspect Mark can give a nod, but as far as I can remember, the assessment doesn't, doesn't include a modal shift for rail, and therefore what we've looked at is that worst case, albeit you'll know there are separate discussions happening about the costs of 14 and when it's required, etc. I think Lee, Lee needs to Lee, Lee, Lee Stone, I think needs to answer that question. Well, I think it was a question for for Mr. Russell, but yeah, absolutely, you, you're correct that um, the viability does for that that 10.3 million or 10 to 13 million in the viability is for rail only, um, and. Um, we have used the, the uh, and I'm not the right person to talk about viability, but we've used the, the IDP, the latest IDP, in terms of the, the proportional contributions that are in there for um, the uh, proportional contribution to Junction 14 upgrade. And I remember that in the session previously, um, there was a discussion about whether or not the actual capital cost um, upgrade value that is provided um, for the upgrade of Junction 14 is in fact correct or higher. Um, so we've worked on the information that we have available at the moment, um, and I think that there's obviously ongoing discussions um, between ourselves, yourself, and uh, Stroud with regards to the cost and proportional contribution of that, however it lands. 
Thank you. Um, I don't want to get into a discussion about um, impacts on drinks reporting just because we had that initial session right at the start of when the hearings um, sort of began uh, looking at that. But um, perhaps if on that particular point, Mr. Russell, if you could just confirm, I think I'm right in recalling in that initial session, um, it, it, it was, it, it really, I think, agreed that the, the costs are not quite right in terms of how much those um, drinking improvements are going to cost. But I recall that you saying that it's not envisaged that you were going to ask the site allocations to contribute any more financially. So in terms of the effect of this particular issue, it, it won't affect the, um, the development. Is that correct? Yeah, if I could just <laughs> confirm. So, so we discussed the costs uh, in terms of our calculations, and they are in the IDP. Uh, they have been taken account of in the viability assessment produced by the promoters. It's in a different it's in a different package to the rail element that we're talking about. Just to to give Lisa some comfort, so the the one hundred and six uh, contributions, the proportionate contribution to the M five junction fourteen that we identified through our funding and delivery statement are included in both the councils and the promoters work um in terms uh, and you're quite a, and you're quite right inspector that when we discussed that the issue was the overall cost of the scheme and we said that the uh, we would be seeking public subsidy for the the difference between the developer contributions that we've identified in our plan and idp and the and the and the total costs of the scheme. So, hopefully, those points um, will uh, 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 give reassurance to national highways. Um, on the other point around modal ship, I'll ask Chris to come in. But my understanding is that, that yes, this is our, our our modelling was on the kind of worst case scenario, but um, or existing modal ships. But but I'll I'll bring in Chris if that's if that's okay. Thank you. Yes, please do. I'm not going to say much more than Mark, other than to confirm that it was based on um, without there, there were two scenarios in the mitigate, and um, one of one of the scenarios which um, has the modelling shows the impact and the mitigation without relying on, on any modal shift, including the modal shift from the um, from the rail link. So, um, so uh, the answer to Lisa's question is correct. Uh, Ms. McCaffrey, were there any other points you wish to make? Yeah, um, thank you. I don't want to go over old ground, um, but we are aware from any funding that may be available from um, DFT, etc., that the um, applicants or the council will need at least 15% match fund, and I think that needs to be considered in this because I just I'm not convinced the numbers are stacking up. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, the match funding, presumably that would be pulled through the, the development that would potentially be affecting junction 14 in this instance and would require mitigation. That would be my assumption, yeah. Uh, Mr. Russell, did you want to comment on that particular point? Uh, I, I don't have. I haven't seen that. That's that's new to me. That information um, it would be helpful if we could have a, a full explanation of that um, uh, that position. Um, obviously, we're talking about rail, essentially. Uh, I, I understand. So I'm, I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure what relevance that has to today's session. Um, I'm sure the inspectors have other comments. I know that they have about the next step statement, and maybe the, that that particular point can be can be brought in at, at a, a more appropriate time. But um, I don't think it's particularly helpful to, 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 to understand that at this stage without understanding the context uh, for that statement. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess we're just trying to understand in terms of uh, implication of, of costs um, and then the, the effect on the overall development, which I suppose is probably a point related to general viability, isn't it, as, a, as opposed to rail. Um, but is just as it's been raised, is, is that in a particular sort of guidance note? Um, is that sort of procedure or, or more sort of custom and practice? 
Um, it's relevant to any LMM MRN um, bids. So it is, yeah, it, it's very clear. It's it's not something that's new. Um, it absolutely can be shared, but I think it's something that's already in the public domain. Thank you. Sorry, if I could just come back on that, just um, uh, we would like to understand exactly what what that means in terms of match funding. Um, obviously, there's other development, which is significant development that's going to impact on Junction 14, which is not within the plan. So we, we need to understand what that match funding involves. Is that contribution solely from development in Stroud District or is, is that pooled, potentially pulled from um, developer contributions from South Gloucestershire and in and the case of Junction 12 from development in Gloucester. That's why I think it's um, it's rather than discuss that now, rather we, we would need to understand exactly what, what you mean by match funding. Um, we know we know there are significant developments, uh, as indeed Lisa knows, um, that are that are um, planned or or speculative that are coming potentially coming forward in neighbouring authority areas. What we are trying to do is develop a strategic um, solution. We hope to work constructively with national highways on a strategic solution rather than lead to what we currently have, which is essentially a speculative uh, development, which is not capable of delivering national highways solutions. So we, we do seek to work with national highways on the only scheme on the table to actually realize their objectives for Junction 14. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I mean, you, you're quite right. I don't really want to get sort of drawn into uh, this conversation, but it's um, it was just an interesting point that was brought up, which will probably aid myself and my colleagues' uh, reflections over the summer on um, issues, including the SRN. Um, but it's, um, it's fairly common for match funding to be required for any um, government funding process. So um, one, one would assume, without wanting to put words in Ms McCaffrey's mouth, that you know, in terms of where those contributions come from, it would depend on who the bid is being made by. If, if the bid is being made by Stroud plus neighbouring authorities, then those authorities together would need to provide a pool contribution from the, the for the 15%. And that, that's normally how it works. Um, I can see Ms McCaffrey nodding, nodding ahead. So I, th I think that that would answer that question. So then that, that goes back to the, uh, the knotty issue of um, a, a agreeing uh, between uh, yourself and the, the neighbouring uh, district councils as to, to what happens going forward, which uh, I, I don't really want to take uh, session time up with because uh, I think we, we discussed that uh, right at the start. Um, but thank you for that. Um, that was useful. Um, Mr. Drover. Thank you, ma'am. Can I, can I just come back on the... Um... Mr. Eden and Mr. Stolworthy, and then I think because yeah. you're under pressure, I'll just jump on to uh, the demand um, issue as well. Um, I, and then if we park DR to demand responsive transport until we get to the mass, if we get to it, then that might confuse me slightly less. But the um, so um, I think Mr. Eden, I, well, me being pessimistic is probably not a good look, but I think it would be perfectly reasonable um, to include risk optimism bias, whether it's the track renewal, um, whether it's higher levels of optimum bias for stations, uh, whether it's the culverts, the drainage, until such time as Network Rail have agreed a scope. Um, that hasn't happened. Um, so um, there's been no, uh, well, there's no correspondence since the uh, January uh, 21 letter. Um, and um, so the agreement that was um, reached then was about the timetable. Um, I'm sure we'll come on to timetables later. I would have expected something to happen, um, and until until you remove that risk by um, um, Network Rail agreeing the scope, uh, the risk is still there, and it should stay, stay in the costings. Um, uh, the in perpetuity funding, um, uh, well, it's not on the table for the rail. That's clear. Um, I'm I'm still not clear on the Plan B um, options. So the Mr. Stoll will be talking about a Plan B for road-based transport, which is clearly. Uh, private cars are not going to be compliant with policy, national policy, or, um, uh, but the um, you know, and, uh, and we've already heard from Mr. Small before why a commercial coach won't work in this in this location. It's a function of distance and uh, time travelled and cost. So I think the um, um, the, 
position, um, the fallback position, um, well, it's not acceptable as presented. There's certainly no policy for it in the draft plan. Um, um, anyway, I just wanted to jump on to demand. Um, uh, I've got, uh, bear with me. So, so yeah, so, so going back to the, um, the hurdles that um, uh, the promoter has to jump through. So we, we've talked about cost and finance. Uh, the demand and obviously this, uh, that links to what type of service you put on is, um, is fundamental. Now, the promoter needs to um, show that there's sufficient demand for the railway service. They need to persuade the government that a, a rail solution is the answer to a problem um, um, and justify considerable capital outlay. Now, you'll hear from the promoter that um, they're funding the capital um, and obviously they need to cover um, the railway industry's costs as well. So the promoter is projecting, just let me check my notes, 480,000 passengers per annum. So just to put that in context, that's um, um, well above Cam and Dursley at um, 225,000. So 480 versus 225,000. And of course, that, that has trains pointing in both directions. Um, well above Ashchurch at 108,000. Well above Lydney at 193,000. Well above Moreton and Marsh at 292,000, and a little short of Stroud uh, at 577,000. So, so just to be clear, the projected passenger levels for a service between Sharpness and Gloucester, and Gloucester is a great city. There's no doubt about it. But the the, the projections at the moment are saying that will be near to um, Stroud Station, 480,000 versus um, 577,000. Um, so that would put the um, promoter's projected demand model, um, it would rank sharpness in about the top 40% of stations in the UK by passenger footfall. Now, uh, I believe that is um, wildly optimistic. Um, so just to put it in the context, using the, the catchment figures from the um, February Stantec report um, uh, on the basis of 2,400 dwellings occupied and I know they say it can, it can come forward to 1200 but on the basis of 2400 occupied with 5520 residents plus their um, additional residential catchment and that's 7372 um, that would produce a catchment of 12,892 people now um, my maths is not particularly good but I did manage to divide 480,000 um, passengers by the uh, 12,892 12, um, in catchment residents. Um, and that would um, equate to every one of the residents of the promoters proposed catchment, taking the train to Gloucester 37 times per year. Um, so I think that highlights uh, that, um, I mean, the, the, the projected passenger levels are not realistic. Um, but it does impact on the tra train service and, and, and it impacts on the strategic case and the strategic fit. So if if discussions with Network Rail had gone beyond um, the timetabling service, uh, they need to jump through loads of hurdles with Network Rail. So I'll just briefly touch on them because it, it links into demand. So there there, there is massive um, demand for available capacity um, because it's a really important link between the Southwest, the Midlands and the North. So what you find at local authorities um, vying for enhancements connectivity. So at the moment we've got Weka um, in South Gloss, we have the Charfield station, um, uh, um, and then we've got the um, uh, Bristol Road Stonehouse station, which is, has received restoring your railway funding. Um, and they will all want, uh, um, in conjunction with Midlands Connect, they'll want um, two trains per hour. And at the moment they can't get them. So. Um, one of those, uh, whether it's Yate, Charfield, um, um, Bristol Road, Stonehouse, or Cam, if they come forward, one of them will get the short straw. So th that's, those are discussions I would have expected to take place. And so there's no evidence that, that, that the strategic fit of the sharpness proposal with, with the longer term aspirations of network rail have, um, have, have been discussed. Um, so it does, definitely doesn't feature in the network rail um, Bristol to Birmingham study. No work, um, aside from the timetabling um, uh, work back in uh, Gen 21, no other work has been undertaken to demonstrate that the proposal can be introduced without causing adverse performance impacts on these developing proposals. Uh, they did include um, Bristol Road in the latest timetable iteration, but it doesn't include Charfield. 
um, and even if there was no performance detriment, um, uh, why would Network Rail cede any available capacity to a service that um, just picks up so few stations? It doesn't seem plausible to me. Um, but of course, we've not; those dis discussions haven't taken place, and that's the real elephant in the room. Um, so um, the other point I wanted to make, um, there's been no agreement between the promoter and the train operator. They've been particularly silent. Uh, I don't know if discussions have taken place in respect of the financial and other arrangements concerning introduction of the new rail service. So we heard um, from Mr. Stolworthy that uh, there's a budget of three million pounds to provide revenue support. Um, what discussions have taken place with the train operating service? Um, are they happy to run it? What level of service subsidy are they expecting? So the, the, I just wanted to, another bit of, um, uh, well, it's not arithmetic, but it's actually lifted from the, from the report. Um, if commercial passenger services were delivered on this line um, and you did get 480,000 passengers um, uh, per year, at least until 2040, there would this, this one train per hour would be trundling between Sharpness and Gloucester. Uh, those projected passenger numbers mean that on a, um, an outbound train between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. and an inbound train between 5 and 6 p.m., uh, it would be full up and they would be standing at 130% capacity. So that's the problem with over um the um, catchment numbers um, and having a, um, a theoretical low frequency service is you, you get uh, the train fills up very quickly, let's put it that way. And then off peak, there would be 30 passengers per train, which is about 15% of capacity. Um, so that, that sort of leads into the question, what, going back to the strategic fit, what is the strategic problem that this one train per hour between Sharpness and Gloucester is solving? And are there cheaper, more appropriate solutions um, going to a range of destinations that people actually want to travel to? And that's why I was interested in, in the plan B. The plan B is not in policy. Uh, the plan B um, hasn't been discussed because I, I sympathize with the promoter. They, they have a, a rail policy um, and presumably they won't necessarily get political support if they move to a, uh, a uh, coach based policy but if i had uh, 30 million pounds to spend I, I probably would be able to run a very good discount bus service to a, to a lot of destinations for a very long time um, so uh, the, the, just to summarize, summarize um, our position the 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 proposed demand is is wildly optimistic and and i think that's um that is going to cause uh, very, uh, it, it will mean that delivery of the service is unrealistic, I think. Um, so that's why by this stage, I would have expected um, uh, the plan P, plan B discussions to take place, but they, they haven't taken place. Sorry, that's, uh, thank you, Matt. That's all I had to say on that point. Thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a number of points you've raised there, which I, um, I do want to explore further. Um, before we do, though, because um, obviously I do want to get on to demand and discuss that because it's, it's, it's quite a, you know important uh, assumption that underpins everything else. Um, I just wanted to um, ask about, previously you made a, a point about um, whether it was uh, going to be very light rail or heavy rail that was used, and obviously that has a, an implication for, for costs. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that now the preference is for heavy rail. Is that correct? So, yeah, yeah. so the, um, the light rail option was dropped in the latest report, I think. Yeah, exactly. So um, in terms of cost implications then um, and uh, assumptions, um, what, what are the implications now? Uh, Mr. Stolworthy, I think you would be the right person to, to answer yes. that. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Um, I'll just respond to that. Um, you know, we could debate the, the other points that, that Mr. Driver had mentioned, but I think just in relation to the very light rail, um, through due diligence, we needed to explore options for um, providing the rail service. Uh, one of those options would be an electrified service, um, considering the, the, the country's aspirations to net zero transport carbon. Um, we, we, we felt it necessary to explore that option, which we did. We met with um, Revolution Very Light Rail. We went to their premises. We looked at their trains. We drove on their trains. 
Um, and we were considering that initially as an option for application at sharpness because of the environmental benefits of that and because of the cost benefits of that, because it's much lighter than heavy rail. Um, it requires less infrastructure. Um, and we initially explored that option because we thought that that would be better overall. Um, during the conversations and the operational characteristic conversations with, with that operator, um, they are still going through uh, homologation processes in order to get their trains to operate on uh, mainline services, uh, to interact with mainline services. Um, and that there's a time frame associated with that, which doesn't align with our program. Uh, in terms of delivery of houses and, and the need for, for a rail uh, service uh, sooner rather than later. So we felt that um, it would be better if we reverted back to the heavy rail option because very light rail, it's a, it's a brilliant technology, it's emerging. And um, uh, you know to be on the safe side, we felt, felt that it would be better to just stick with heavy rail in terms of the calculations for now. So that's the, the reason why we've, sh so the, the arcade is costing report, cost of the option of uh, a VLR type service, a very light rail service, and there's different infrastructure uh, and operating cost implications for that. But they also costed the heavy rail option and we've just reverted back to the heavy rail option in the viability costing calculations um, because of the timing of, of VLR. It would still be a good idea to pursue that option in the future. And it may well be that other rail service, a rail line start to incorporate um, new rail technology into the future as well purely electrified uh, or hybrid versions of trains, for example. At the moment, we've costed it on diesel trains. Um, stinky carbon belching diesel trains, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Um, so what, just remind me, what would be the, the cost implications for that? So, so the cost that we, that we referred to earlier, the 10 to 30 million is for the heavy rail option. It was seven to 10, I think, for the very light rail option. I can't remember the exact number for that option because we've discarded it. Uh, we've moved forward now. Uh, but, uh, uh, that's correct. Yeah. So the, so the current costing that's in the viability is for the heavy rail option, 10 to 13. Thank you. Okay. Um, then going back to some of the points raised by Mr. Drover, um, have you spoken to the train operating company? Um, has there been any contact with them or um, any uh, agreement reached? Um, yes, ma'am. So during the development of, the, of uh, our rail proposals and our calculations, we, we have attempted to uh, engage with the operating companies, Great Western Railways, for example. And we have had engagements with, with some of them historically during the development of our rail strategy. Um, but we we have been unable to 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 engage with them more recently, that, and I think it's probably got something to do with the fact that they're not sure who they're going to be contracted to in the future, and how that relationship would work um, because of the advent of Great British Railways and um, currently the uh, uncharted mandate of what that would likely be um, in terms of how they would contract. So we haven't been able to do that uh, more recently. Um, in terms of network rail, we did engage with them on the, as we've discussed before, on the timetable, et cetera, but we haven't engaged with operators. And also they're, they're, they've shown some reluctance to engage with us now until we have, there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation here. Um, you know, have you got agreement to operate on the line? Have you got uh, those kind of things? Um, those are the kind of things that we need to, to start to, to map out and the processes that we need to follow to be able to have meaningful uh, conversations and engagements with, with operators. We did obviously engage with VLR as, an, as a potential operator, um, but we've discarded that. So we we kind of lost a bit of time in, in engaging with VLR in terms of the operations and, and being an operator on the network, but we're back into the rail situation now. So we need to start to, to re-engage with, with operating companies um, within within the heavy rail industry. Because, because we know that um, a, a part of the cost calculations as well is, is the rental of rolling stock because there's rolling stock companies that lease rolling stock to operators, and we need to, to include that in our cost calculations as well. So we've included that cost, um, and we've included operating costs from ORR, but we haven't got it directly from the operators themselves yet. It's part of our next step, or next thousand steps. Okay, so those costs are yet haven't been agreed with uh, any any top because you've, you've not engaged with them as of yet. That's correct, but we have used um, published data from existing operating companies that uh, the Office of Road and Rail have, have do publish its public information. Um, so it's based on existing operators. So we don't think that it will be too significantly different from uh, other existing operators. Okay. 
Okay. In, in terms of operating cost. Thank you. Okay, uh, we will come back to the points about demand. I just want to um, finish off the questions that I had on costs first. Um, let me just have a little look through. In terms of the, the other um, options that we're looking at, there was also mention of an additional new three platform station at Barclay Road. Um, is that now necessary if you're not going down the BLR route? So the, no. um, the, the bike, well, Mark, you can answer this possibly better than um, I can. Oh. Got a really bad line there. We're dipping in and out. That we considered. Perhaps I should answer that one, yeah. um, Inspector. The, yeah. So, yeah. That, uh, yeah. the, uh, so, so um, when, when we went through the study, um, um, yeah. do you want to just start again? Right. Is, is this better now? We didn't catch any of that that you've said, apart from what you've just suddenly started saying now, because you were dipping in and out, and we, we couldn't really hear you. Sure. Yeah. So, um, when when we went through the uh, the, the study, we, had, we identified uh, a range of options uh, that, that that might be feasible or desirable in order to identify this this minimum viable product that I am. Um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the, um, the the idea of a uh, of a station at, at Bartley Road was, was one uh, part of one of the options. I I think it was option three. Um, uh, but of course that that that's that's an option that, that has since been discounted. So there is no requirement for an additional station at uh, at the Bartley Road junction. And it, it was to provide. As I recall, um, options for interchange to go to go south to Bristol. Yeah, ma'am, if I could just add on to that. So the the, the benefit of a station at um, Barclay Road would be that we could operate the Sharpness branch line as a shuttle, and it mm -hmm. wouldn't necessarily have to interact with the main line services except at the Barclay Road station. The additional benefit of that is that passengers could change to mainline services to go south because at the moment we don't have a cord that faces south. Um, but then it creates complications with the timetable if you've got stopping trains on a mainline service. We, you're introducing mm -hmm. an, an additional stop. Um, and so we, and, and also it's, it's cost prohibitive to build that station based on the location and the infrastructure that's required to do that. And we felt that from a cost benefit perspective, it would be better to continue to operate um, towards Gloucester and interact with the mainline services from the branch line. Um, so we've discarded that option in the, in the calculations now. Okay. So was, was this um, to do with this idea of hop on, hop off that's mentioned? Sort of uh, like to try and sort of minimise the amount of um, presumably paths you're taking up on the main line. Oh, so yes, yeah, so exactly. So the hop on, hop off is in in that uh, terminology that we've used is relating to how the, the passenger rail service on the branch line interacts with the rail line. So the, the main line services on the rail line operate on a schedule. They're, they're about 30 minutes apart and they're essentially express routes between Bristol and Gloucester stopping at key stations along the way. Um, and they're kind of sort of fixed in terms of, of their timing and, and, and their frequency and the distance between them in terms of speed and distance. Um, and so we just hop in the gaps between uh, those trains. Um, and so we were able to find those gaps in the timetable and the schedule to do that. Whereas mainline services can't do that because th there's nothing for them to hop in and out of because they're on the main line. Um, whereas, it, you know, we have that flexibility in terms of how we slot in behind trains. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Faisy. Thank you, Mark. A um, couple of points there. <clears throat> I thought it'd be useful to give you a little bit of context in terms of our approach to rail as the promoter. <clears throat> we see the rail as a very positive opportunity. It's almost like a gift from the kitchen. Uh, when you start these schemes, you always look at pros and, and cons, the opportunities and, and so forth. And here we have a railway that is very lightly used and very well maintained by virtue of what um, traffic is using it, which is basically one train a week up to Sellafield. So we think it's it's beholden to us. You've got the County Council have declared the climate emergency. 
We've got the district council have, de have declared a climate emergency. So for two reasons, both for um, transport and for um, environmental reasons, we need to take it seriously and consider it. That's a responsible thing to do. And, you know, it's a case of, from our perspective, this will, this will happen if we can possibly make it work. If it doesn't work, it won't be for the one to try it. But our, our, our position, our default position is this rail is going to happen. Um, we've referred, Mr. Fong has referred to this meeting with Network Rail, probably getting on for a couple of years ago now. I was at that meeting. It's probably worth remembering that the idea of running a train from Sharpness to Gloucester is actually Network Rail's own idea. It's not our idea. We've gone to attend the meeting thinking that we we're going to run a train up through to Cameron Dursley. But it was Network Rail who suggested that because of the timetabling, as, as Mr. Stolworth has mentioned, you stop too long uh, as a terminus on a through line, you block the track. So this idea of, of running, this, of stopping briefly at Cameron Dursley, but then carrying on to uh, Gloucester, where the train pulls off the main line, was actually Network Rail's own proposal to us, which we thought was brilliant. Um, <clears throat> yes, there's been talk um, about Network Rail wanting, the track, wanting to see the track relayed. As Mr. Funger said, that's partly because they don't know themselves the condition of their own track. But it's also because, like a lot of these people, they're just holding their hand out for a free bit. There's no need for that. Uh, we've already got the, um, we've already done a condition survey. We don't need to do all that work. Um, Mr. Drover has referred to extracts from a, uh, a letter from Network Rail. That letter is actually addressed to me as a promoter. And um, although it's quite good for um, Mr. Drover to quote letters to me, I'm quite happy that as the, as the promoter, our position is we sort out, first of all, whether there's capacity on the line, because if there wasn't capacity, there's nothing to discuss. And then to go on to look at the costs. That's why we brought in Arcadis as specialists in this field. That's why we spent time going and talking to Revolution uh, VLR, looking at the opportunities and what we can do to make the best, best use of the existing infrastructure to make this work. As Mr. Stallworthy has said, We've looked at VLR, it's an attractive proposition, but at the moment in time, it's, it's time has not come. So we are, we are back to um, using heavy rail, which is one of the reasons why our um, viability has just been updated. We're using heavy rail. And I'm amazed actually, that we've got a county council, well certainly officers of county council, not members, who are trying to pull the rug from under us when we are proposing something which you think they would be supporting. You've also been asked about um, ongoing commitments to funding. One of the things we look at is, we look at this in the round. This is phase one, a phase one of 2,400. The whole thing is about 5,000. If further funding is required, then phase two will be coming along by the time where we are actually opening the um, the railway in any event. So there will be further opportunities for further contributions, not from phase one, but from the next phase of the development, which is actually larger than phase one. Sorry, that was a bit of that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Payne. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, just, um, to sort of follow on from the points that um, Mr. Drover made in respect of um, passenger numbers, we've you know we've heard from the county council that um, that the numbers are wildly optimistic. Um, we've heard from their rail expert that there's a very high degree risk that the um, that the passenger reopening of the passenger rail line will not happen. Um, it is a requirement of um of the of the policy um now you know we we that there is a climate emergency we we need to be working towards carbon neutrality um we need to be ambitious um we need to take the vision and validate approach 
design and provide, as we've heard um, from the from the promoter. Um, but what we're talking about, um, if if the passenger rail line, um, you know, finds a way to be reopened, then um, then we're talking about we've we've heard a minimal viable product. Um, and we're talking about one train per hour um, in one direction. Um, now, unfortunately, travel by a car um, from a location such as Sharpness, um, by car comparison, is far more flexible. Um, you can travel whenever you like, um, and you can typically go door to door. Um, now, to be successful in um, in encouraging people onto alternative, more sustainable modes of transport, they need to be delivered early. They need to be affordable. They need to be high frequency and convenient so that they compete with the car. Um, just to reiterate the point, we're talking about a minimal viable product, a train operating in one, one um, train per hour in one direction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'm right in saying, again, referring to this uh, the 2022 addendum uh, to the uh, IDP, um, just because it, it usually summarises a few of the points that Network Rail have made, um, that they said in their response, which was a few years ago, that two trains per hour service would require infrastructure interventions across the station which would be at substantial cost so i am making an educated guess which i'm directing as a question that that's probably one of the deciding factors as to why you've gone for one train per hour to avoid that additional cost uh, mr solworthy thank you ma'am um firstly before i get to that um i think Mr. Payne might not have been in the meeting earlier because we didn't say that there was a high risk that the rail service would not work. And I'm pretty sure Mr. Driver didn't use the word wildly optimistic either. So um, the, the one train per hour service is because of the, the, the demand requirements. So it's to meet the demand of the people at that time in the end of the local plan period. We will only reach the demand to be able to support two trains per hour um, after the local plan period. Um, in the latest report that we responded to, um, Gloucestershire County Council's report, uh, we do talk about um, the signalling arrangements at Gloucester, Gloucester Station, um, which we have discussed with Network Rail earlier on um, in 2021. We're aware of the fact that there are limitations at Gloucester Station with uh, it to be able to accommodate more than one additional train per hour, which is why that work doesn't need to be done in the lifespan of this current local plan. But as we move to two trains per hour um, beyond the local plan, as the demand increases for rail services, that upgrading work will need to be required to the signaling at Gloucester Station. We haven't included that into the viability now because we're doing it to the end of the local plan in, in terms of supporting the local plan. Um, but by that time, it will be beyond 2040. It's likely that that work would have been done by network rail anyway because it's required to accommodate other services. If it isn't, we will consider it at that point. I think also just to point out that Mr. Payne was, was talking about one train per hour in one direction, um, but it's logical to me that if the train goes in one direction, it has to come back in the other direction. So it's two um, directions, but one train per hour because that, that's what the demand dictates at that point in time in terms of the, the lifespan of the local plan and the build out of houses and the numbers of people. So the intention would be then, if demand does dictate that you would increase to, um, to services, presuming that's as in two trains to Gloucester, not as in the there and back again. Um, and that, just to clarify from my own understanding, that's for the, the larger settlement, the extended sort of sharpness, if you like, that isn't part of this plan. That's correct. Correct. Um, um, based on our calculations now, it's it's up to the end of the local plan and it's still operating at one train per hour based on the demand at that point. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Green. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I do have serious uh, doubts over 
probably following on from um, what Mr. Drover said about the delivery of this service being completely unrealistic. Um, and for Mr. Stolworthy to say that it does, it only goes in one direction, it's only going to Gloucester. Um, and can I just point to the reference that, um, that Mark Russell made earlier on that predominantly people locally travel more to Bristol. So I think, you know, I think that's very, very, um, I suppose, trying to treat us as if we're stupid in the comment, um, which I don't appreciate. And I do, I do think it's worth knowing that I think there are already going to be reductions in capacity on the line due to the new service that is being provided by WECA, which is a 30 minute um, service. Uh, I think it's for Yate. I think Mr. Drover um, alluded to that one. And I think it's worth also knowing that that service will not be stopping at Cam and Dursley. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Miss Councillor Jones. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, my colleague has ask a couple of my questions so I will cut this short. Firstly, Mr. Faisy said he was uh, astonished that, that GCC are not supportive of this. Uh, in my role, believe me, I have differences with GCC from time to time, not Mr. Grover's department, but um, in my view, he's doing what he's supposed to do. Mr. Fong makes the point that we're trying to have a, I'm sorry, Mr. Russell makes the point we're trying to have a plan here. And uh, I guess Mr. Drover is probably keen to make sure that uh, uh, GCC highways don't end up having to pick up the pieces. Uh, so he's doing what he should to look after the taxpayer. Um, Lindsay, my colleague, mentioned the trains in both directions. It doesn't mean back and forth to sharpness. It means north and south, Bristol and Gloucester. That's really important. Um, I won't go over what Mr. Drover said, except to say that the, uh, the figures he quoted for Cam and Dursley at 220,000 for trains going in both directions and the assumption that sharpness would be 480 is... I mean, that really paints a picture um, with regard to the, the potential that this railway would ever happen. Um, finally, if I could just go back, Mr. Stolworthy mentioned, so just, I want to be very clear about this. He said the fallback is not sustainable, which is why they're going for rail. And I think it's important that we, um, we, we make sure that's on the record, that it's not sustainable, the fallback position, if rail doesn't work. Um, so I can understand why Mr. Bond and Matt are uh, very keen to continue with the rail link, if that is the case. Um, and also the fact that, um, as Lindsay said, the predominant direction of travel is towards Bristol. Um, and Mr. Stolworthy said the Bristol link is cost prohibited. Um, I think all those points need to be taken into account as to the likelihood of this ever taking place. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Flanagan. Thank you, ma'am. Just uh, one observation, one question, if I may. Um, firstly, I'm, I'm possibly getting more questions and answers from this session. Um, but I think what I am clear on is, is that actually what we're hearing and what we have here is a new settlement proposal that's a reliance upon the express coach service with an ambition to have the rail service, I think I think that's become evident from this morning's discussions, um, and the, and then the question really is in in this location with the longer journey times to Bristol and Gloucester, I'm just not clear on what the incentive is for people to get out of their cars and use the bus. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Councillor Craig. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yeah, um, I, I have great concerns about the the, uh, the the amount of financial support that that this service is going to need, and the amount of finance that the the proposers actually uh, uh, plan to, to to put forward. Uh, I mean, the the fact that that only three years subsidy is planned uh, seems absolutely crazy. We have experience locally. Uh, of Gloucester County Council um, uh, trying to uh, to uh, instigate new bus services on a demand basis, and uh, we, the, the 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 subsidies are huge because the buses uh, have perhaps one or two passengers on them. Uh, that's our experience, uh, and and so to to rely on demand to fill the buses. It really just isn't going to happen. 
and uh, the car will continue to be the, the preferred route of, uh, of commute uh, or, or way of commuting. Um, it's much more flexible, as has been said before, and, uh, and that's really not where we should be trying to get to with, with, with uh, a development of this kind. But that is the way that it looks like it's going. As I say, just to round up, uh, the, the finance doesn't seem to be in place to make this possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms Smith. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just want to follow up on something the um, other inspector was particularly interested in in the other sessions. Um, it was the talk about, I'm um, obviously going from Berkeley to Bristol, you're going to have to change a cam. And it was a talk about the service fare being changed from every half hour to um, from every hour to every half hour. And um, she came back and asked about that, and we were told that was going to start from June. Um, I do use that service myself sometimes, and I think what's, I just wanted to make it clear, maybe I misunderstood it before, because I was quite excited, it's going to be every half hour, but actually there's a couple more trains in the rush hour in the morning, so it's still only an hourly service. And I just want to pick up, I'm not a railway expert, I just, that is, that route, um, it's, it's pretty good to get into Bristol, but then you're only at the station and you're not necessarily where you want to be in Bristol, especially, um, in fact, it's not that well positioned for the places you want to go in Bristol, to be honest. But um, the, the thing is, is that's a low priority service. So it goes through uh, Yates and then it goes to Parkway. And if there's other trains that are late going on for Parkway, it has to wait outside the station. So sometimes you're waiting outside the stations for you know, 15 minutes for a more important train. And once you've missed your slot, you've got to wait. So one of the railway experts here was talking about this light railway and how they can just slot it in nicely into all these trains that are whizzing up and down the main line. But the trouble is once the trains, once something's just slightly late, the low priority trains are having to wait. So the service is unreliable because if you find you're waiting outside the station because the Birmingham, Bristol, um, train is late and you're waiting to get your slot in, then you've missed your connection at CAM to Bristol. I just, just just thought I wanted to raise that point. Yes, that, thank you. I think that's, that's probably... Point there. Yeah. You know, if, if anyone uses a train, I think you've probably all experienced the misery of being on a stopping train that's held for an express service. So yes, I, uh, I, I fully, uh, fully understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Craig. Uh, sorry, ma'am, I, I just forgot to take my hand down. Ah, it's, uh, okay. it's an old oh. one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Alexander? Uh, was, yep. Thank you, ma'am. Um, yeah, just picking up a point that was raised um, by the council this morning. Um, it basically said that the traffic modelling used, um, undertaken, did not allow for rail in terms of the, the exercise. Um, I don't know if this is correct because um, looking at the STS addendum, Appendix A, um, it basically says there's a 20% reduction applied for direct public transport services to Bristol and Gloucester. Um, alongside that, it says a note that the model value incorporates potential for the rail service to be delivered. Um, so this 20% this value is double that of any of the other strategic sites um, in terms of the modeling with the STS um, provision. Um, even those sites that sit alongside the sustainable movement corridor have significantly less percentage reductions. So it appears to me, and I wonder if I can get clarification from ACOM that there is an element of in that percentage that reflects the fact um, that rail could potentially come forward at Sharpness. Thank you. Thank you. Do I pick that up, Mum? Um, yes, I was just going to say so. Um, obviously, appreciate there's a number of people have also made the point about uh, the demand forecasts. Um, so, what I was going to do at this point um, is to come back to either yourself or Mr. Fong or Mr. Stallworthy and obviously respond to the points that have been raised, um, in particular Mr. Alexander's career that he's just made. 
Um, but then also, um, if you could make some comments and respond to the, queer, the question of demand and whether the forecast demand is right for sharpness in comparison with other local stations and the, the patronage that they experience. Um, I'll leave the, the patronage for rail to Mr. Solworthy, but from a, um, uh, in terms of the modelling, the statement I made earlier is that there is a modelling scenario within the traffic forecasting report that doesn't allow for any mode shift. So there are, there are two scenarios, one which is simply highways mitigation and one which is highways mitigation plus mode shift for the sustainable transport strategy. So my response to Lisa's question was correct. In terms of the um, in terms of the percentage reduction within the sustainable transport strategy that comes into that, uh, that additional scenario, each of the mode shifts are related to A to B journeys. So whilst there is a 20% um, reduction, which sounds like it's high, that's a 20% reduction to um, areas that are directly served by that rail service. So it's effectively 20%, sorry, direct by the, by the public transport services. So it's 20% for sharpness to Bristol or wherever the um, wherever the specific zones are the um, the corridor reductions apply to um, to development sites and traffic from those development sites to anywhere along the corridor including into um, into central Gloucester so they are targeted um, and that's um, based on on the particular modeling um, we were um, in terms of how we came up how we came to that 20 percent so when we were discussing that with National Highways and Gloucestershire, we came, we effectively, the, there is a balance in there that it's, um, it's designed to be ambitious, but reflect the fact that rail may not come forward. Um, and so that 20% kind of does allow for the fact that there is a chance that rail doesn't come forward and that it's, um, it's a, the express bus service for those destinations that um, the promoter has has outlined, um, but I think in terms of coming back to the original point about Junction 14, those um, that, that that point was actually quite moot because there is a scenario that doesn't rely on it at all. Um, and I'll leave Mr. Fong and Mr. Sawerby to cover the other aspects. Okay, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Storworthy. Oh, sorry, my mic was in the wrong place. Um, thank you. Um, Okay, on the, the so the the methodology that we follow to calculate the patronage for rail um, is pretty straightforward and pretty standard. It's contained in our evidence. Um, there's nothing strange in it. Um, we haven't manipulated it. Um, other than um, we have applied uh, some factors to it in relation to um, well, first of all, we've calculated the trip generation. So we know what, how much. Um, development is going to happen. We know what the form and type and use of that development is, and we've applied standard methodologies to calculate the trips that would be generated by that. That's people trips. So the 2000 something that, that Mr. Payne uh, referenced earlier, that's person trips. So that's not vehicles or they're not assigned to any mode at that point, it's just people. Um, and then we, we, we look at where those people are going. Uh, we look at a level of internalization and localization. We know that we are building schools. Um, and that we're going to have employment on site. Um, and we know that there's going to be a level of interaction between sharpness and the surrounding functional transport area in the Barclay cluster. Um, and so we've, we've, we've used that to calculate the level of internalization. That's where we have uh, deviated slightly from the census data because census that we used was 2011. And we know that the world has changed and travel patterns have changed a lot since then. We didn't take into account the increased proportion of people working from home. Um, so we're trying to be conservative around that in terms of our internalization and, and reducing the numbers of trips. Um, in terms of internalization in, the, uh, the, in the, the, the evidence that we've provided in the SG23, I think we updated those calculations in the tables. Um, we use the census data for internalization and then um, we, we modified that based on the level of interaction with Barclay and Sharpnets um, and the Barclay cluster um, based on the level of internalization in census between those different areas. Um, and that's all explained in the documentation. Um, and from there, we use that to calculate. And, we, and, it, and it's a different rate that's applied to different types of trips as well. Um, obviously, for education trips, there's a different internalization rate for leisure trips, for work trips, for example. And we used census data for that purpose. Um, and then we started to look at where are those people going to? 
uh, again, using journey purpose and journey, uh, journey time data from census or journey data from census and, and uh, national travel survey. We use that to calculate where people are going to. Uh, and then from there, we looked at what modes they would, uh, would likely use. And we developed a mode share table from that, which is assigning the people into vehicles. Um, and we did that for two scenarios. The one is the fallback scenario, which is not to be confused with uh, plan B. I think plan B is just a word I used in conversation earlier, um, is that uh, the fallback scenario is one where there is no rail and everyone is uh, either using road-based public transport or driving cars. And then the sustainable transport scenario is one where we've introduced the rail service. And so there's a different mode share for those different ones. But the numbers of people are based on the numbers of people. And I think it's important to point out now um, something that Mr. Driver was talking about earlier in terms of the numbers of people. And it was 37 times a year, you would have to um, make the trip to reach 400,000 passengers. I think it's, you know, we can talk about manipulating mathematics all day long, but um, the, it, we need to understand that there, there are two bits of information which might be uh, confusing and that's the restore your railway bit information, which is also part of our evidence. That was based on looking at the wider catchment area of who is likely to use the, the rail service if it was introduced um, as a way of, of motivating that, uh, you know, a, a, as a funding application, that it's a viable service. The design of the operation of the service is based on the actual numbers of people that are likely to be using it. Um, and so the Restore Your Railway information is, was done at a point in time. It wasn't because we wanted the money. Um, it was because there was an opportunity um, uh, presented to us in order to apply for some public funding to do, to do uh, the rail service. That didn't, uh, wasn't successful. And we've moved on from that point and we've refined our calculations since then. So we shouldn't be looking at um, the million passengers per year that we'd projected in the Restore Your Railway bid documentation. We've refined that significantly since then. Um, so in terms of that, so that's the methodology that we use to get to the patronage and the, and the, the passenger projections for rail. Um, we've pegged the rail service uh, patronage numbers against comparable rail services that, and we, we've contained in the evidence and I'll refer it you to the table in it's chapter eight in uh, SG23, uh, Mum, where we look at comparing different services and, and we looked at specific criteria for, for comparable, comparable services based on population. Uh, population range more or less aligned to sharpness and the sharpness functional transport area, as well as it being rural or semi-rural in nature, um, uh, and, and looked at those in terms of what is provided on, on viable services that are currently operating. And we, we've got a table in there which compares the operational dynamics of those services which are currently functional and operating um, against the patronage uh, and the, the catchment for sharpness. Um, and we use that as a basis for, for, for saying that Obviously, this occurs elsewhere, um, and that it's it's you know it, it's possible that we can introduce something like this, and we move on from that point to say these are the numbers of people that we need. This is why we need one train per hour. This is the number of houses that we're going to build build over time through the the, the lifespan of the local plan, and therefore we need we're only going to need one train per hour um, up until two thousand four hundred homes at twenty forty. We will need two trains per hour beyond that point because. Um, we will need uh, bigger trains. And we we also know that um, we can start with uh, a fewer carriages and increase the carriages up until the point where we need an additional train. So we've looked at all of that uh, as well. And that's how we get to our, our numbers in terms of the one train per hour for the local plan and more than one train per hour beyond the local plan. We have also um, done a, a carbon calculation where we looked at the, the sustainable transport scenario, which incorporates rail. Um, uh, and one of the councillors mentioned this earlier on that, that um, I'd mentioned that the fallback scenario is not sustainable. It's, there's two scenarios. There's the sustainable transport scenario and the fallback scenario. How sustainable one is over the other is, is, is a matter of discussion. But in the fallback scenario, which doesn't include the rail, uh, we calculated where everyone's going, what the distance is to those destinations, um, how, you know, what, how much fuel they would use and what, and what the tailpipe emissions would be for all of those trips, all of the people that are assigned to, to these different destinations, the total vehicle kilometers and the total emissions for that. We did the same thing for the sustainable transport scenario and compared the tailpipe emissions for both scenarios. And um, based on, on our calculations, um, we determined that we can save approximately 17,000 tons of carbon dioxide from tailpipe emissions alone um, if we were to follow, if we were to be able to successfully implement rail and follow the, the sustainable transport approach. Um, it pointed to point out as well that, um, I think Councillor Green mentioned that the, the, the main um, attraction or demand direction is towards Bristol, and we know that. Um, and that's got nothing to do with, with our aspirations for rail and whether or not the rail is viable. 
because um, there is no rail line uh, from Sharpness to Bristol. So we have to use express coach services unless people change at Cameron Dursley and go back. But we haven't allowed for a significant number of that because uh, of people doing that because it's not easy um, and there are quicker options to get people um, to their destinations without having to go in the opposite direction and change and go back again. So we've we've considered all of those aspects and, and the operational dynamics of it and how people are likely to, to, to use the service, which is why run the coach services towards Bristol and the train service towards Gloucester because that's where the opportunities exist to sweat existing infrastructure assets. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a rail, rail line to, to Bristol directly. Um, I'm not sure if that answers all of the questions, but I'm happy to continue. Yeah, I, I, I suppose, um, I guess the, the point um, would be when you look at the the sort of patronage for um, other stations. So I think Mr. Drove made the point, you'd be looking at sort of a level of patronage not dissimilar to Stroud. Um, and then, you know, you sort of look at train services through from Stroud when you can go to Swindon, almost uh, London, uh, Gloucester, it's it's sort of multi-directional, isn't it? Um, which sort of would, would contrast with the, the situation at um, Sharpness. So I suppose, you know, appreciate obviously you use a, a model, you've used a, a standard approach, but then also we sort of, you know, like your sausage machine, isn't it? You sort of, you turn the handle, what comes out, you still apply a sense check and think, well, does this look about right to me. So uh, just the a question back, when you sort of had those patronage figures in front of you and you're comparing it with other stations locally or other um, sort of uh, places that are on commuter routes, did that look about right to you? In, in proportion to the population at those particular stations and those, those communities, it's in line with the patronage that, that exists on those lines currently. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fong, I appreciate your hand is, is up and it's been up for a while. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I'm, I've, been I've, I've, I've not got, but, but <laughs> and what, what, I, what I wanted to do was I just want to, because I'm conscious that time is dragging on. So what I was hoping to do is just get everyone to sort of make the points they want to make. Then I was wanting to come sure. back to myself just to understand. And <laughs> finish no off that. So it's, it's not that I'm ignoring you. I, I can see your hand up. So uh, uh, apologies, but there, there is a logic to, to what I'm doing, hopefully. Um, Mr. Payne. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I'm just going to make, make a very simple point um, just based on the um, the evidence that um, that is in um, our representations um, comes from the the, the Stantec material, um, and just to just sort of, sort of illustrate the point on um, rail from a slightly sort of different perspective, um, Mr. Stallworthy um, correctly pointed out that 2,700 um, trips in the morning peak hour, so between eight and nine, is person trips. Um, looking at the survey information um, from existing sites upon which um, that level of trip generation has been um, ha has then been applied to um, to the sharpness development of the 2700 well 2700 person trips um, around 24 would be um, would, would would travel by rail um, that's a one percent um, mode share um now once um uh, stantec has, has has processed the data um you know stuck with the 2700 person trips um but you know done some reassignment on the basis of the um of the of the of the rail offer um that 24 um movements by by train um becomes um 279 um which is uh, you know, around a twelve, around twelve times um, the survey information, um, and the mode share um, becomes um, around um, ten percent. Um, and so, just to draw it to a close, um, you know, we, we've heard from the county council stagecoach and um, and and others that they, you know, that they consider. You know, we we, we of course we have to be ambitious you know and um and 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 yeah climate emergency and um and you know a, a, a you know carbon reduction targets which we, we we must make every effort to hit um but um but 
th th those numbers um that you know there's there's a number of people in the room that consider those to be those real numbers to be unrealistic thank you thank you so i'm just making a note of something okay so as, as i said um i think i've probably heard enough on rail um taking into account what um the evidence written evidence we've got before me which obviously myself and my colleagues still need to digest in full um which we will be doing over the summer um so what i would like to do then is just go to uh mr fong and then also uh mr fazy just to to close off that uh discussion on rail um Bear in mind, I, I don't need any more information about the, the general approach and the philosophy of sharpness and carbon reduction. Fully understand um, that, that point. So um, I would appreciate if you could sort of just keep any, uh, any remarks brief and to the point. Uh, Mr. Fong. Starting with getting me off mute first, um, there, there does appear to be a lot of selective hearing uh, and listening by a lot of the audience here today, especially the politicians, which is unfortunate because uh, Mr. Stolworthy has produced a fairly detailed technical note of 18th of May, and uh, it doesn't appear that many people have actually taken the time to read that, including Mr. Drover, because all his questions and, and queries are actually answered in there. So it's it's important that we turn to that. Um, my, my, my sustainable glass is certainly half full. Mr. Drover's is, is definitely half empty. And what Mr. Payne says is absolutely correct. We have to be innovative and uh, pioneering to, to, re to reduce our carbon emissions. Um, I, I'm just going to take you very briefly to Circular 0122 of the Department of Transport. I would just like you to um, reference uh, paragraph 13 and 15 and those tell you where we need to be with uh, transportation. It's certainly not getting back in our cars, and it's certainly uh, promoting walking, cycling, and public transport as the first uh, means of, tr of transport in order to get to our carbon de decarbonisation as required. So that's that's the policy prerogative and priority. Um, Mr. Drover then says Stagecoach uh, knows that it doesn't work in this location. Well, Stagecoach aren't here, ma'am, and Stagecoach know from the previous sessions that they are closing down services left, right and centre because they don't have a good commercial model. So do we place reliance on Stagecoach? No, we don't. Uh, and there are other um, reliable uh, commercial bus operators and there are other examples of demand responsive services that Mr. Stolworthy has uh, illustrated to you in his note of the 18th of May. And indeed, if you go onto the Breeze app down in Southampton, you will see how the linkages work and you will see exactly how those demand responses services will link up with uh, walking, cycling and buses. So there's a good example. Let's not be dismissive. Let's not keep that glass half empty, please. Let's try and prop it up and try and save the planet from decarbonisation. Um, we then go on to uh, Mr. Mr. Drover saying, is there sufficient demand? Well, no, there isn't at the present time, Mom, because there's no new settlement there. And he's basing it on the existing position. And Mr. Russell, in the strategic sessions, uh, spatial sessions, took you very carefully um, and your colleague very carefully through what is actually happening in the Barclay cluster and its immense mom. Um, I mean, if you if you start just with PS36, you've then got PS34 and PS35, all creating a massive development. You've gone then got the um, Gloucester Science Technology Park uh, with its 16 hectares of new employment land coming forward, then if you just dig a little bit further into the Western Gateway, and uh, Councillor Green mentioned it this morning, we've probably got Rolls-Royce coming down the line with SMR technology. And if you dig a little bit deeper, and uh, Gloucestershire County Council, ma'am, Gloucestershire County Council, and Stroud District Council both signed up to the Western Gateway bid for the STEP technology. And Mom, this is just from the Western uh, Gateway uh, site. It says Seven Edge has unrivaled transport links, 
proximity to diverse neighborhood cities and access to areas of natural beauty, making Seven Edge a brilliant place to live and work. Gloucestershire County Council, ma'am. So we are not really just looking at today's present picture. We're looking at what the new settlement will do, the patronage it will gain, and the um, the the various service um, deliverability. And what has been said in evidence today by Mr. Stolworthy, it's at the 1200 house that the rail service will be delivered in earnest and be viable. No, no questions about that, no ambiguity, will be viable. So that's where we stand. We give you a fallback position because we want to give you security and we gave that to Stroud District Council as well. Then there's been various questions about um, the strategic fit. And this is where I know Mr. Drover hasn't read the technical paper. And, and indeed, um, the SLC report has no understanding of it either. Uh, probably uh, hang on, let's just be careful and let's not say what Mr. Drover has or hasn't, because then, you know, he might want sure. to, like to respond. And, I, you know, at the end of the day, we, we do not have time to have a sharpness session mark three. We have to get through today's agenda today. So let's just keep things to the point and nice and punchy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, in relation to strategic fit, uh, Mr. Stallworthy does point out that because we are a branch line and this hop on, hop, hop off, which he's already explained, Mom, we don't interfere with the, the train services going up and down that line. We actually fit very comfortably like a hand in a glove. Now, the other thing that was raised by Councillor Green is, well, you've got all these new services coming along. You've got Stroud Water, you've got the Metro Line, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, we have timetabled that, Mom, and that's again in the note. So all these things have been done. These have been presented to you in the evidence paper, Mom, and it is there. Um, I, 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 I just ask you, please, to to look at that evidence because it's it's very um, compelling in terms of the changing landscape, and the service is very deliverable in terms of sustainability. Which brings me all the way back round to policy. Is this what government wants? Yes, it is. It is what they are asking all developers to try and strive for, and not not just have lip service to it and present barriers and let it fall over and disappear, is try and strive for it, try and get sustainability, and try and reduce our carbon footprint, Mom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fazy. <clears throat> Thank you, Mom. I just wanted to make a very quick point about locational connectivity. One of the benefits of running a train to Gloucester that will stop at uh, Cam Dursley, is that you would get on a train at Sharpness and change once, either at Cam Dursley or Gloucester. And from there, you can go to London, Birmingham, Bristol, South Wales, change once. That's what you've got to do. It makes it a really well connected location. And of course, that also works in the, in the opposite direction because suddenly you're opening up an awful lot of investment that can come in. To Sharpness as an area. And I, th I think that's a point that shouldn't be lost in terms of what we're trying to achieve here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everyone's probably desperate for a lunch break, but this um, I do apologise. We, we need to finish this item before we break for lunch, otherwise we will not get through today's agenda. So um, just a, a plea for everyone to just try and Stick to the stick to your points, um, and that will help us. Um, I would like to not drag this on too much longer. So let's move on to um, the uh, mobility um, as a service technical note, um, which was submitted uh, in response to uh, a question that uh, we sent. So I, I had some um, specific questions uh, on this. Um, in uh, section five of the document where it talks about successful examples of MAS. Um, so my, my first question, just in terms of looking at the, um, the Solent area, was um, whether, I don't know who's best to address this to, I'm assuming Mr Stolworthy, is, is that correct? Yeah, okay. Um, do you feel that the uh, Solent is um, a, a good, um, sort of directly comparable area to Sharpness, and, and if so, why? 
So, Mom, to attempt to answer uh, your questions, um, because there was a finance aspect to it, we tried to look for ones that we could that we could get access to financial information on, and the Solent one is the only one at the moment where there's published uh, information on the finances. So, that was the one that we went with um, in as a UK example. Um, there's some differences between the Solent application and what we would uh, likely apply in Sharpness. The first one being scale. Um, the Solent example obviously covers a much wider geographical area. Um, it, it covers uh, many different uh, dynamic movement types um, and demand profiles um, that is not necessarily associated with Sharpness. So um, it, there needs to be a context as well uh, in terms of looking at the finances of the Solent one. Um, I think the startup costs were, were quite high um, and they've included in, in the DFT document that's published on that, the capital costs required um, as part of work package one. It's still in its infancy. It doesn't include all modes yet. They're, they're only really introducing the rails uh, option at the moment, but they already have 150,000 people using the, the bikes and the scooters. Um, and so it's, it's very well used and very well subscribed. Um, so it's, it's not directly comparable with what we're trying to offer at Sharpness because we will be a much more scaled down version of that. Um, but it's in terms of its functionality, it's the same. Um, I think ours will be um, uh, significantly cheaper than that because the, the infrastructure that, we, that, that Solent needed to, to uh, provide retrospectively to add things to make the, the Mars service um, viable, we will be building from day one up front. So we're going to have a mobility hub. We're going to have uh, a strategic mobility hub. We're going to have um, local mobility hubs. We're going to have um, all of those things connected together already in terms of the infrastructure provision. So we won't have the same level of capital cost that Solent has had in, to, in, in having to retrospectively apply that infrastructure um, into a kind of a Solent environment. Um, with regard, it is comparable, however, with regards to the platform that's used. Um, and it's one of the appendices in, in the Mobility as a Service document that we provided was um, a reference to, I think, about 14 other mobility services that are operating globally, ranked based on um, customer response and rating of those services. Um, so from best to worst, um, and, and there's loads more than, than I just took the top 14. Um, but those are, are ranked based on, on the, the, the responses from people that actually use those platforms. And uh, one that's in there, and I kept it in there out of interest sake, is that it doesn't even relate to transport. It relates to barbershops, which is, which is quite interesting. But that's because the platform is usable across a multiple of applications, not just for transport. And it's about software and how the back end works and how the analytics work. And it can be applied to a range of business types, um, but it is very well suited to, to public transport. And, and, uh, and active mobility, which is what it was originally in, invented for in the first place, but it's being used as a platform for other business, for, for other organizations and, and businesses. Um, the company that, that developed the, the, the Solent example is a company called Traffy. They're from Germany, I believe, um, and they have a similar service operating in Berlin, which is massive. Um, and I can't remember the numbers that we quoted in there, but it's, there, there's lots and lots of, uh, there's 100,000 downloads um, there's three points, it's covering 3.6 million people. So these things are operating on both small and large scale. So they operate for barbershops or for multimodal public transport systems at a metropolitan scale. And the company that developed it for Solent is the same company that developed the Berlin one. Um, and all of the other companies that are on that list, uh, we're getting to the point now where there are off the shelf products available, depending on what you specify your requirements are, that by the time we get to that point in sharpness, um, we believe that there'll be a lot more traction with these kind of these kind of platforms available. And I know that a common question that comes up um, is that it, if I can plan my journey, you know, it's a smartphone based application. It's a it's a graphic user interface on a smartphone to enable you to plan your journey, to pay for the, your service, etc. And that is dependent on people having smartphones. And I think it's important to, to contextualize that in that um, by the time the last house is built in 2040, assuming the person that buys that house is 35 years old, they're currently 18 years old. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find an 18 year old that doesn't have a smartphone glued to their hand. Um, so it's it's it may be seen as, as, as a new technology now, but it's not gonna be new forever. And um, there's a lot of services that are operating globally. Um, it's relatively new in the UK in terms of application. And the only one that we could find that had some finance information was the Solent one, which is why we used it as an example. So not strictly comparable um, in terms of size and scale. Um, similar kind of services will be operate, will be offered on it, on it 
um, but a different scale completely in terms of what we're offering, we'll, as will be a much smaller version of that. I think important to, to mention as well is that something that Mr. Drover mentioned right in the beginning of the session today is that when we're talking about stewardship models um, and how does all of this get financed and, and who manages the, the back end um, you know, if you're if you're on the app and you, you say I'm here and I want to go there and it says, OK, you need to hire a scooter and go to the train station and catch the train and go to there. Um, there's a link and there's different operators that may be operating those services um, and the, each one has to get a piece of the, 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 the fee that's or the fare that's paid by that user and that back end analytics and who deals with the finance mechanisms of that. And I think that's something that we need to, to consider whether or not and how we, we, we include that in the functional um, for the functionality of a stewardship model, for example, because they would be best placed to do that locally. Another benefit of the mobility service platform is that it's not just a, a way to, to travel or to book a journey or to plan your trip, but it also creates the opportunity to provide information to the people that are registered on those platforms in terms of safety alerts, uh, for example, or changes in, and I think it's been mentioned before, I can't remember who mentioned it about the unreliability of rail services and how they can have a knock-on effect on various other things um, through the mobility as a service platform. Push notifications can be incorporated into that to make sure that people are aware of things. And then obviously the services in the journey plan are adjusted according to, to real-time um, fluctuations in service um, across a range of modes. Thank you. So in, in terms of looking at the um, Solent, and again, appreciate the point that you, you just picked this example because it was the one that had financial data available. It looks like um, the majority of users are using it for bikes and e-scooters, but then um, not perhaps connecting on with to other services. And also appreciate the point that rail has only recently been added. So there's some difficulty with that. So um, my question back would be, um, in terms of how people plan their journeys via public transport, obviously when you're trying to tempt people away from the cars, the, a key um, thing is to make things as easy as possible um, because essentially cars are cars are easy and people are lazy and they like to, to get in what's easy. Um, and I, it, the more connections that somebody has to do in order to make a journey in terms of different types of transport, the less likely they are to make that journey because we're making it harder and a bit more difficult. So uh, my question back to you was, is whether you think that that would be uh, feasible um, in terms of tempting people out of their cars? Absolutely, ma'am. Um, I think we, we need to get to a point where sustainable transport becomes the obvious choice, not the second choice. Um, because at the moment, the car is the obvious choice. And that's because there are barriers to entry to multimodal public transport systems that it's just easier to use your car because you understand that it's parked in your driveway, you get in, you, you put, turn the key on and you go. Whereas um, planning a multimodal journey is quite complex. Uh, mobility as a service applications help to break down that barrier of complexity um, to have a simple, to easy to use, single user interface on your smartphone to be able to plan that journey. All the complicated stuff happens in the back end and the user doesn't have to experience that. So it definitely helps to break down that barrier. Um, I think in the, the Solent example, you know, the fact that the, the, the data only exists based on the use of e-scooters and bikes at the moment is because they're in work package one and they're going into work package two at the moment. If you look at the DFT costing report, there's a lot of work packages that, that are still to be rolled out in terms of the Solent uh, application. Those in, in, include adding additional modes as time goes on. That's why the rail mode has, has been added recently. Um, and they will add, and I think it's because of the complexity and the size of that, that there's multiple operators that they need to incorporate into and get agreements in place and all of those kind of things. So it's it will be incrementally increasing the offer to passengers over time. In our case, because it's um, uh, relatively small in terms of scale and the range of services that will be operated or be offered on it, we would intend to do that all available in the beginning so that we don't just start with bikes and it doesn't help you uh, choose the rail over a car. We intend to link it all together. Um, right at the beginning. Thank you. Um, and then just one last one in terms of the cost. Um, obviously made the point that the Solent one is likely to be a lot more expensive than the Sharp Nest one. But if I look at paragraph 5.4 in that report, just doing a quick you know, off, off the top of my head con calculation, adding them up, it, it's in the region of 12 to 13 million pounds. Um, have you worked out um, a rough ballpark figure for what you would expect a, a mass system to to cost to set up and deliver at, at sharpness 
we haven't yet, Mum. That's the next step. Um, and the the Solent example is 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 a useful um, uh, lens through which to view that. But we will need to engage with operators. I said earlier on that um, these things are becoming increasingly available off the shelf, um, and so you don't need to go through massive amounts of startup cost to develop a bespoke app. Um, a lot of these things are available fully functional off the shelf. Um, I've worked with um, students before who've developed apps in a weekend um, as part of a, an assignment. So um, th these things are becoming increasingly frequently available um, in various shapes and forms, and you can buy them directly from companies. But we will need to engage with those companies to find out what those costs are, but we haven't uh, included them yet because there's been no finance information available on them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fong. Uh, I'm just 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 extending that conversation. <clears throat> the Breeze app is actually very good, and we shouldn't ignore the Solent area because it also just not just covers Southampton, Portsmouth, Eastleigh, and, and the points in between, but it goes north to Petersfield, uh, Formarks, and Winchester. And if if anybody knows those areas, they can be quite remote and rural, so there is a degree of similarity there. Um, if you go onto the app and, and just say, for example, you wanted to go to, from Southampton Airport to Petersfield Community Hospital, it will give you the exact timing and how to get there. Uh, so the principles are very, very similar. Um, and, and whilst we're going to roll this out for Sharpness, um, despite the differences between myself and Mr. Drover, I know the County Council have ambitions to 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 introduce similar services within Gloucestershire um, and also extend uh, cycle parks, uh, cycle uh, paths around the county, including down to Sharpness as well. So. Um, the, the the landscape is changing in terms of transport, and you are absolutely correct that in order to uh, make this the first choice, we have to make it convenient. And hence my conversation on the stewardship on the design of this development, we want to make it absolutely uh, uh, convenient for everybody who lives in this new settlement to use personal modes of transport as a first choice um, to do their internalized trips and, and indeed to the surrounding communities. Uh, and that hasn't been forgotten because we We've got linkages to all those communities uh, and then for those who have to travel longer distances then the alternatives will come into play um, so i think mom this is a very good example and I, i'm glad for mr solworthy to bring it to our attention thank you thank you uh councillor craig Thank you, ma'am. I um, just thought it was worth pointing out that um, my understanding is that from 2030, all new cars produced are going to be electric. Um, doesn't that mean that from 2030 onwards, the most uh, yeah, environmentally friendly mode of transport is probably actually going to be the car? Um, and, and, and are we wasting a lot of energy and time and perhaps money on looking at other options when, 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 when time is going to bring it to us? Thank you. That's a good point. <laughs> um, Mr. Driver. Thank you, ma'am. Um, yeah, I'll be I'll be very brief. The um, um, so movement of a service. This is my opportunity to be a, a glass half full person. Uh, Yes, I mean, mass platforms are going to be very, very successful. I'm sure we're the, the county council are running their own trial on e-scooters at the moment. But um, the main observation I'd like to make is that they integrate services. Um, I suppose you could say they're the icing on the cake, but they're probably more than that. They will be more effective. They, they've got the potential to um, exponentially increase um, uh, linkages between public transport services. But that's the, um, the elephant in the room here. You've heard from Stagecoach that commercial bus is not viable uh, from the county council. The, um, the rail prospects are very, very unlikely. Um, um, in terms of demand responsive transport, we do, I think I mentioned in an earlier session, we do run two um, demand responsive services uh, with very low levels of patronage. And you might ask, well, why do you do that? Um, uh, well, the, the, they're filling a gap for socially essential services uh, where, where the commercial bus is failing. Um, and it's, it's cheaper to run um, a demand responsive um, subsidy than a um, than um, paying a commercial bus subsidy. So those, uh, one is around the Cotswolds, one is around Forest and Dean, and I think um, the busier of the two is averaging 18 passengers per day. 18, that's one eight. Um, so um, they do have a role to play, but um, you, if, if, this, um, if 
DRT isn't the answer in, in a remote location um, and um, there's no prospect of commercial bus and rail, then there's nothing for the um, movement as a service platform, digital platform to knit together uh, aside from um, uh, uh, e-scooters and um, um, bike hire and car share, of course, is, is a potential that they could uh, um, link into that. So uh, just bringing it back to policy, I think I mentioned this in the, um, the questions. Um, uh, if if all this if this public transport service isn't there to knit together, uh, then I'd just reiterate in paragraph 105 of the MPPF, um, significant development should be focused on locations w which are or can be made sustainable through limiting the need to travel and offering a genuine choice of transport modes. And that's what I think we, in my opinion, we won't get uh, at Sharpness. The, the county council's role, I mean, it's, it's not a very good look coming and being negative, I'm sure, uh, about particular spatial options. The county council have declared a climate emergency along with all the other districts. Our first move was to um, map spatial options and model um, carbon from transport. Uh, and we have provided those resources to, um, to the district so they can map their own. Fortunately, the, this spatial plan was arrived at before that became fashionable. Um, uh, so and the county council is here um you know we're supporting cam as challenging g2 wadden and opposing sharpness and uh, it, it it may seem that we're a glass half empty but uh we're doing it for climate change purposes thank you ma'am thank you uh councillor craig is that a legacy hand or did you want to make another point sorry ma'am it is a legacy hand again i, I won't ah. do it again promise <laughs> no, no worries. That's fine. Um, Mr. Matthews. Thank you, Mom. Hopefully my camera has now come on as well. I've just realised it's been sat off um, ever since the break. So apologies for that. Um, I think it will probably come as no great surprise to you having um, expressed what we have in our statement that we we do fundamentally disagree with the proposition put forward by Mr. Fong and broadly support the conclusions advanced by uh, Mr. Drover insofar as the location of the Sharpness site is concerned. I've sat um, quiet listening to a lot of the discussion around the detail of the um, matters to do with patronage and other issues, um, not wanting to step into that, but I've heard nothing during that debate, ma'am, which gives me any degree of confidence or certainty that the public transport measures proposed and required in order to make Sharpness an acceptable and sustainable location for development are likely to be delivered or there can be sufficient confidence that they will be delivered. Um, if you indulge me slightly, um, Mum, I um, was involved many years ago. I worked at the planning inspectorate. Now this is going back 20 odd years ago. So um, I certainly wasn't there at the, the time you were. Um, but um, I had the good fortune then of working with the inspector and panel chair on the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough structure plan back in the day. And at the time there was a long debate about new settlements around Cambridge. One of the new settlements proposed there was the North Stone new community. And it's, I still remember the discussion around um, the express bus service, which was proposed as part of that new community. And the key principle that resonates and I think is relevant still today is whether that service provides a sufficient competitive advantage to the private car to encourage people not to get in their car um, instead of using the service. Now, despite Mr. Fong's absolute certainty, um, I just don't see that the evidence that has been presented can provide enough um, to you and your fellow inspector to come to that conclusion. Um, the net result, Ma'am, I think is that inevitably from a development in this location, there would be a very large proportion of future residents that would get in their cars and drive from the development to wherever they are seeking to travel. Um, it will present to them or be for them a more advantageous um, option, whether that's because of cost or time it takes to travel. So there are three main problems with that, just to conclude. Firstly, is we, I don't want to stray back into any of the discussions on this, but we've heard from GCC and National Highways uh, about the capacity constraints at Junction 14 and what that means. 
so a car bound um, or a car led and dominated scheme will clearly have significant implications for junction 14. Secondly, I think we feel that the allocation of the Sharp Ness location would undermine the council's own um, aspirations for its carbon reduction. And in that respect, the plan is, in our view, internally inconsistent. And then thirdly, um, just by make brief reference, because you can look it up yourself, but to paragraph 105 of the framework, and uh, the government position there around the sustainability of development and locations, which will reduce um, carbon impact, essentially. Anyway, that was all from me. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Fong, what I'd like you to do is just to um, make any closing remarks on the MAS point in particular, um, and we'll we'll draw that to a close. And then I'm conscious it's two o'clock. Um, but I do want to just very quickly move on to the, the last bit on the local roads, just because I had a very specific question on that. So I'm hoping that won't take us too long. Um, my, my, my point is very quick, to be honest with you. Um, firstly, I'm, I, I, I'm very surprised that um, Gordon Craig's comment that electric cars are the future. Um, he needs to do a little bit more research into that because uh, the particulates from both tyres and brakes are, are far more dangerous in the environment uh, and get into the bloodstream far quicker um, than uh, the CO2 as well. So th they are not the saviour, I'm afraid. They they are a, a, an evil that is uh, waiting to hatch. Um, I'm not saying that they are not better than cars. Clearly they are, but he needs to do a little bit more research into that. And actually getting people out of cars completely is far more appropriate. Now, equally, electric cars sit on roads and motorways and cause greater congestion and doesn't help the economy at all. So the emphasis, as shown in Circular 1 of uh, 22, uh, is, is that we need to prioritise alternative forms of transport first. Um, just coming back to Mr. Mr. Matthew's um, comments, um, I, I think there's a little bit more time needed reading the evidence, um, but quite clearly, uh, the, the interventions, the sustainable interventions at Sharpness are far more innovative and pragmatic to something like Wadden, where you have uh, the onion skin approach, where you put populations further from the center. So they're more inclined to actually get in their car and cause pollution and traffic jams. So it's, it's, it's mom for you to reach that balance, whether we, we change the way we do things or we just stick to the usual system and not actually save any carbon. Thank you, Mom. That's all I have to say on this matter. Thank you. Um, OK, so hopefully very quickly, because I'm sure we're all very keen for a break and some lunch um, and some fresh air. Um, so uh, I just wanted to ask, in terms of the, the final point where we're asking about the surrounding local road network, um, I'm conscious we've not had much of a discussion about that, but I was looking specifically about the um, necessary improvements to the road network that would be required um, in terms of mitigation for, for the development. So um, looking through the infrastructure delivery plan and the 2022 addendum, I could see on page three of that, um, we've got um, PS36 down for two schemes, which is the B4066 at Station Road and the B4066 at Alkington Lane. Are they the only two um, mitigation schemes that would be required from this development? I don't know, perhaps Mr. Russell's probably um, best place to, to answer that from the, the council's perspective. Uh, perhaps I can come in, Mom as author of the IDP. Um, so th those are two schemes that have been identified, as well as um, the funding and delivery plan, um, which my colleague Chris Carter has produced, um, which identifies the contributions towards the A38 and Junction 14 enhancements. So there'd be the expectation for the contributions towards there as well. Yeah. Obviously, that's the strategic road network. So we've, we've covered that. So I, I was taking that as as red, um, just looking at the local roads. Yes, and, and those have been derived from the, the traffic modelling um, reporting as well. 
Thank you. So it's, it's literally just those two schemes in the in the IDP. The, those are the ones within the um, within the immediate locality which have been identified in the IDP. Obviously, if there's site specific modelling that's been undertaken that identifies um, impacts at a planning application stage, then obviously that would um, that would take precedent over the initial studies that have been done as part of the IDP and the wider plan testing. Can I add a clarification as well, please, Mum? Yes, please. Um, because, because the because Junction 14 is the strategic road network and it kind of that section covers the link from the A38 to the Junction 14. Um, but Alex also mentions the A38 package, which is um, which is part of the local road network, um, because it's not part of the SRN. Um, and that includes, I believe it's about five junctions um on the roof along the A38 into Gloucester. Um so it it's to say it's just two junctions on the local road network would thus slightly no, sorry, sorry, what I meant was we discussed the A38 corridor package as part of our SRN discussions. That was discussed. Okay. So Thank you. I just, just wanted to, that. Yeah, so I I'm just wanted to make sure it didn't, it didn't it not only light, managed it by national uh, highways. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, so, right. So that was the only question that I had on that. Um, Mr. Stolworthy. Uh, thanks, Mum. I just wanted to point out, as um, Alex uh, pointed out, is that um, specific to our site, we have looked at impact as well for both the sustainable and the fallback scenario. So we've, already uh, that. No yeah, need to we've got junctions identified that are, you know, within the local area that, that provide capacity on the network. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right, um, that was quite a long session. <laughs> Ho hopefully everyone has um, made the points that they uh, they wish to do so. I feel that myself and my colleague have got quite a lot of information from that, which we will go away and reflect upon. Um, I'll just go to Mr. Russell um, for any closing remarks that you, you might like to make at, at this point. None? None to um, I... Uh, given the time, um, uh, the, I suppose the only points I'd, I'd like to make were really the high level ones responding to the points around um, Mr. Matthews, I think, around um, Junction 14. Well, you've got you've got the modelling work yeah. that demonstrates that we can we can deliver um, a, a, a scheme there with a strategic improvement scheme. And it's the only strategic scheme on the table. Um, his points about. Um, the sharpness undermining the council's aspirations. I mean, you've got to be, a, a local plan is complex. It has a, a number of objectives. One of the key objectives is around regeneration uh, of the Parkley sharpness area and the Stroud Valleys. That's, that is one of the key areas. We haven't really talked about that at all, but uh, so therefore it, 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 this, this allocation meets one of those key objectives of the plan. Um, in terms of sustainability, well, you've you've heard from the promoters. They've done a lot of work on looking at um, uh, the various options in terms of reducing carbon. Um, we uh, the, the issues are, uh, with respect um, the issues you may have seen in Cambridge a number of years ago. If anybody's tried to get into the cent centre of Bristol recently uh, to go to work, they'll they'll realise that progressively over the next twenty years. Um, congestion charging, uh, availability of parking will all continue to be squeezed. And so the, um, the accessibility through uh, Bristol Temple Meads, for example, will actually improve the attractiveness of, um, of uh, public transport in the future. That's the direction we need to be going. Uh, and I think um, you've heard from the promoters um, a, a, a significant degree of commitment to low carbon forms of transport and the subsidy required in the short term to to deliver those those aspirations um i, I uh, it's difficult to crystal ball gaze 20 years time but i think a number of people have demonstrated that you know the world will be very different in 20 years and we need to start now thank you very much okay thank you everybody so we will now break for lunch and once again apologies that it is late um but as i said we need to get through today's agenda because we do not have time to come back for another session on this so we will break we'll have an hour and we will be back at 10 past three thank you everybody
Good afternoon, everybody. It's 10 past three, so we will uh, resume the Sharpness new settlement session. Uh, hopefully everyone's feeling uh, a little more refreshed after having had lunch and uh, a little break. Um, we will now move on to agenda item four, which looks at viability. Um, and for this item on the agenda, I will pass on to my colleague, uh, Inspector Wright, who will take over for this. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to do, because obviously the agenda was issued before we had the new uh, viability, the revised viability appraisals, um, is I would just like to bring in the site promoters to explain the difference. Now, my understanding, and please tell me otherwise, is that the difference is based on, as you've already said, it's related to the updated uh, costings in relation to infrastructure. So am I correct in that it is based on the updated addendum to the IDP? You are correct, ma'am. Um, and if you want further explanation of what's been done, I'll bring in Hannah Eshelby. I do want to go into the specifics of exactly what's changed and why it's yes. changed. That'd be really helpful. Would so you like to do that start now? on that, that would be, that would be useful. Okay. Thank you. Can I, can I introduce Hannah into the examination? Please. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, so good afternoon. Is it Ms. Eshelby? Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Um, but yeah, so you're totally right. The main differences are an update to the IDP um, and how we've assessed that. Um, there's obviously been a lot of conversation around the railway and the costings of that. Um, so we've looked at the IDP in conjunction with the council um, and we've basically taken out the 1.1 million figure that was allowed for in the IDP for the railway and applied our 10.3 figure instead, plus the subsidies that we discussed earlier. But the rest of it remains consistent with what, what was previously um, set out. There's no other changes from the February 2023 version. Uh, I don't believe so. Um, the, the one thing is there might be a very minor difference on the green infrastructure cost, so the Sangen Nature Reserve that's just been brought up to date, but it's very, very minor. Um, and can you just, for to provide clarity to everybody in the room, explain why there are two different versions, revised uh versions? Yeah, of course. Um, so there are two different versions. One covers scenario A, which is covered in the IDP, which is referenced as a full policy on option, whereas scenario B is more likely at section 106 costs. Um, I'm happy to leave that to um, the council's consultants to explain the difference between the two if they want to. I'm in, Ma, if that's helpful. So just in terms, just very thin, in simple terms that everybody yeah, yeah, understands. Absolutely. So um, scenario A is a, is a broad assessment of all of the infrastructure where we've applied the benchmarks and had costed infrastructure schemes included. And um, so that's all of the infrastructure topics that are assessed in the IDP in, in full. And then scenario B is where we have historically, um, where the council's historically either um, paid for infrastructure through SIL or Section 106, so not just Section 106 obligations. So we've discounted um, healthcare and emergency services costs on the basis that they've not been sought for that those historic types, as well as um, some costs that are typically um, associated with on-site costs for the developer, so there wouldn't be any additional costs such as the open space, which um, Ms. Eshelby mentioned, as a, a just, an adjustment there based on the, the SANGs because the developer would be providing that anyway. Yes, that's correct, yeah. So is there a, um, so just again, so I can understand um, the preference. Is there a preference as to which version is more likely or is that open because um, the council needs to ensure or it hasn't quite decided which route it would go down in terms of whether it would apply to any SIL rates, it would go down the SIL route, or whether it's go down the, uh, just the developer providing everything route. So the policy on option. I think Mark is potentially about to come in. Yeah, Mr. Russell. Uh, was it on a different point? 
No, I, I'm happy to cover that. Um, if I can draw your attention to the um, viability refresh document, that's EV111. Um, and paragraph 7.48. This this just goes back to the to actually clarifying what's in each scenario, scenario A and scenario B. So yes, uh, Alex is right. Uh, 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 scenario A is essentially calculation of all of the all of the all the benchmark. It's essentially the sort of maximum that 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 could possibly subject to site specific issues could be calculated and then b is um a, a combination of two factors one is the the issue that alex has raised around ensuring there isn't double counting around open space provision given that that's all that's a cost uh, 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 which is normally on site in uh, open spaces is, is a cost uh, in another part of the viability assessment but also um because there are some uh uh, non-essential items should we say that are that, are that are identified in the idp which are not specifically required in the policy so regarding for example the examples given around the new police equipment um uh health healthcare facilities is a different issue because um uh, scenario b doesn't include that but and uh, this is where obviously we, we can come to this to the specific promoters viability assessment there is built back into that um uh, some some assumptions around health facilities. So, so just wanted to sort of clarify that point. But um, the final point I wanted to make was if you go to paragraph uh, ten point four, I think it is. Let me just check if I got that right. Um, no, that's not right. Um, Sorry, just, just, um, just. That's okay. Uh, if you just want to find. Yeah, I just want to. Where do you want to take you to? That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me just. Uh, um, so, 10.20. So this is this I issue around. Um, so, so first of all, scenario A is the full policy on costs. Sen uh, scenario B is essentially sens a sensitivity test, which looks at what's more likely to be actually achieved through Section 106 costs based upon um, historic uh, delivery of infrastructure. And then finally, the, the issue of SIL is, um, yes, that's, the, that's ultimately a matter of whether we, whether we require everything by Section 106 or whether we whether we um, uh, whether we also ask for a sill, in which case the um, section one of six contributions will be scaled down to ensure that there isn't any double counting. Um, but I just wanted to say it says following discussion with the councils believe that the most probable situation at the development management stage will be that the costs identified under scenario B will be sought. So, uh, in summary, um, we, we think it's. Uh, appropriate and robust for the promoters to identify both a scenario A and a scenario B um, appraisal so that you, you've got essentially sort of uh, the, the, the full policy and, and everything is provided in accordance with the, absolutely everything that the IDP requests and a, uh, a, a scaled down, which still delivers on the essentials, that's the important point, still delivers on the essentials, but um, does not uh, include all of the additional uh, desirable um, elements, which are based on benchmarking and and uh, you know uh, desirable situation provided by the um, infrastructure providers themselves. So uh, it's it's it produces a sensitivity assessment. So I think I think we would prefer obviously the full on policy, but. Um, we're realistic enough to understand that not not everything that uh, was listed in the IDP in terms of those additional desirable elements uh, is necessarily going to come forward. But all of the essentials, all of the essentials that are in, identified in the policy are still within scenario B. So 
Just on that point then, thank you for clarifying that, Mr. Russell, that, that's been helpful. Um, I understand that point about the difference between the scenario A and scenario B. What I'm trying to understand is how that applies to Sharpness as a garden village community and that sort of ethos of, um, and what I heard this morning about uh, what the sharp nest developers are proposing to do is go beyond the actual garden village, garden city, whatever you want to call it, same thing, um, sort of ethos and go sort of above and beyond because they want this to be um, exemplary. So I'm trying to understand then, before we start looking at a scenario, and I fully understand that you've done a, a scenario A and scenario B, is which one actually should this be for sharpness? Or does that, it, or does it not matter when you say, well, it, the scenario B still includes all the essentials for, you're saying it's the essentials for sharpness. Does it bring in all of the garden village ethos or the garden community ethos, those elements? Um, There's nothing missing. Uh, my understanding is it does, that those additional elements are not, are not, essential to the garden city ethos they they are simply asks of other infrastructure providers that you know for 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 additional provision but that isn't required by the by in terms of our, our discussion this morning about the sort of ethos of the principles that's not required by the um by the garden city ethos um as i said um uh, i haven't got the the spreadsheet in front of me, which identifies the exact difference between each uh, scenario A and B. I don't know if Alex has, but uh, my understanding is that all of the essentials required to deliver a garden community are in scenario B, together with obviously the additional costs, which no doubt um, Hannah will, will will take us through as part of uh, her appraisal. Thank you. Yeah, if, if I can just add, Mark, to, just to confirm on, We've included things like the costs for on-site community facilities, education, um, special sites um, contributions and the costs associated with that as well within, within our IDP costs. And then also within the IDP addendum, we've identified in, um, if I just turn to it's in Appendix A, we have a, a section on Sharp Nest specifically, which um, marries up with the infrastructure requirements set out in the policy as well and that identifies um, a list of projects that we would expect um, the allocation to be delivering um, and those obviously marry up yeah. with um, some of the key principles of the garden uh, town proposals as well so you've got um, if I just turn to the correct page so you've got walking and cycling improvements the station in there and, and Ms. Ashley's um, mentioned about the uplift associated with that cost now that we've got more accurate costs yeah. um, on site, primary and secondary schools, a new doctor's um, surgery within there as well and costs for new community facilities. So all of those we feel represent the, uh, the garden town ethos that's set out. So what you're saying then is that um, the scenario B includes all of these? Yes, that, that's correct. Yes. Okay. Right. Well, what I think would be really useful, because obviously this is, uh, we said we would go through it in uh, some detail, is for, I don't know whether it's going to be um, Ms. Eshelby or whether it's going to be somebody else from the Sharpness team, uh, developer team, to go through one of the uh, development appraisals. I think that would be helpful. I'm not saying we need to look at every single figure, otherwise we're going to be here until next week. Um, so I'm not saying that. I just want an understanding of the figures and where they've come from. So some of them we can jump over you know, if it's based, you know, like the uh, construction costs, you know, based on BCIS, etc. Then that that that's normal, normal costs. So um, is it going to be Ms. Ashley who's going to take me it, through? It will be, Mum. Yes, she's the author and uh, she knows the figures better than I. Great. Thank you, Mr. Fong. So um, I'm just looking at the one I'm looking at is the scenario B. I've just picked up one. So let's go through scenario B. Okay. Do you want me to run through GDV? Or to start from the top and work through? Or... It'd be useful to just go through. Let's just have a look at the figures. 
and just um okay well you've got your square footage there you've got your construction costs which are bcis based which i wouldn't expect yeah. anything else your commercial yeah, so we've allowed for, for revenue for the employment land. Um, we've been relatively cautious in the revenue we've applied to that. Um, so we've worked on 500k per acre. Um, it's based on transactional evidence, um, which is all much higher than, than that rate. Um, so we think there is scope for that to significantly increase. But we just, I think, um, if you look at it, at the viability of the scheme as a whole, I, I didn't feel like it was appropriate to exclude the employment area. And what sort of evidence is that based on? Uh, transactional evidence of a, of a com commercial land within the In South the West. locality, in the Gloucestershire area, or is it going beyond? Just uh, like slight, slightly beyond, but a combination of both. I'm happy to provide some more information to you if that's helpful. So is it more in the regional area? Yeah, more regional, because obviously within the immediate vicinity, there is an, a, a great deal to look at. But yeah. we've um, we've discounted from that to allow allow for the location at present. Okay. And your um, square footage for your open market and affordable housing? Again, that based on? Um, so the densities between the, the council's viability, just for reference in ours, are slightly different. Um, but we're, we're working off phases of 200 units based on obviously policy affordable housing that are then split out. So you've got 60 affordable homes and 140 um open market for each for 12 phases of 200 yeah okay so the cost the abnormals i'm not going to be looking at the bcis that's fine um abnormals and infrastructure allowance yeah, so we've we've allowed for a rate of twenty thousand pounds per unit there, um, and that's been front loaded again, being particularly cautious because you don't think it, it would actually transpire that way. But we've we've allowed for more upfront, so it's more costly to the development appraisal to allow that cost upfront um, to open up the site. Uh, twenty thousand pounds is kind of informed by different house builders for for schemes of this nature and similar. Um, at this point for the work that's been done we feel like that's an appropriate allowance in context of the market and that's obviously in addition to those other costs under construction costs so do you want me to just run you through what they are yes please yeah um so we've got in, in addition to the base construction costs we've then got five percent contingency applied to that yeah. um base cost that's also then applied to all the other construction costs plus the section 106 works um so you've got plot work services and externals charged at 15 percent on that base bcis rate um that covers everything in addition to your superstructure and prelims which are covered in bcis um and then we've got edp have costed us um for the sang and nature reserve so that's in its seven hundred and twelve thousand six hundred and twenty five per phase as well so we've got quite a lot of additional costs in addition to the the, the base build um we haven't scrimped on that. <laughs> I like that term, scrimped. Um, <laughs> okay. Sorry, also within that list, so I appreciate there's, there's 12 phases merged into one PDF here, so I appreciate it's not the easiest thing to digest. Um, we've also got the subsidy that was mentioned earlier in, in context of the coach and the railway and the capital works cost for the railway of 10.3 further down as well that's timed as discussed earlier for to be delivered at 1,200 homes. Okay. And then you've got your difference in relation to the planning obligations, which is your scenario A or scenario B. Yeah. So we've got 13,577 per unit um, applied for that IDP figure that we just discussed. And that is the total figure quoted in the IDP minus 1.1 million that they'd allowed for for the railway costs because our 10.3 yeah. has replaced that yeah you're taking that out to put the 10.3 yeah. in that's fine um
Your other development costs, are they industry standards? Yeah, all market facing industry standard. That includes professional fees at seven and a half. Um, that's reflective of the, the size of the scheme, economies of scale, but it totals 32 million pounds. So I feel like that's representative of, of the scale of the project. And the financing and profit levels standard? Yeah, again, all, all market standards, 17.5% applied to open market, six to affordable, which blends out at around 18 on cost and 16 ish, or 15.5 to 16 on GDV. Um, and that's applied obviously to each phase the same. Um, finance is obviously very topical at the moment. Um, so we're in at 6%. Um, on debit at the moment and two on credit to, to reflect the house building nature of the site. And, and effectively what we would see as an average throughout the development period on top of that. Okay. So just explain to me then the other instruction, the other construction costs where, how those have been um developed you talked about the um the costings for the sang and the nature reserve for instance where of those where's that come from so edp and um the promoter team have have costed that up for us um i think tom's on the sorry mr wigglesworth's on the call if you'd like to give any more info on that it would just be useful just in summary form just to have that explained good afternoon hi inspector i'm happy to just talk through that briefly um so again, this is quite a cautionary uh, calculation of cost because not only does it include the actual sang area and the nature reserve, but the other informal open space around the site. Um, so EDP has um, been involved in the you know outline uh, design of the green infrastructure and has used that information um, based on uh, one of our uh, landscape architects, a chartered landscape architect, and landscape institute case studies to come up with typical costings for. The various uh, types of landscaping and habitat creation um, work that we'd be looking to propose in those areas. Um, it's also worth saying that those costs, so the total costs that we've provided, um, eight and a half million has been divided by 12 to come up with that uh, 700,000 figure that's in there per phase. But that also includes uh, an allowance for offsite uh, financial contributions to um, uh, SBA mitigation work as well, which we Understand, you know, we appreciate it might be required. Yes, yeah, so you've preempted my next question, which was about the offsite works in yeah. relation to that. So that is included. At what sort of level is that included at? And has that been agreed or is that a best estimate at this stage? Because the council are updating their own overarching seven estuary mitigation strategy. So we've got an allowance that was based on the original strategy um, uh, of £385 per dwelling. But we've also allowed for an additional amount on top. So we've put in a total figure of um, 1.3 million for that for that work. Okay, thank you. Are there any particular um, requirements or anything that um, could be seen to be, that might bring about higher costs? That's what, that's what I'm looking at here. Uh, from your perspective, looking at the Sang Nature Reserve open space, that's your green infrastructure elements is there are there any abnormals that could come up and you go crikey we didn't budget for that or is this very so cautious that actually there would be enough there to cover yeah and we've done our best to kind of capture the, the you know the the likely design of those areas um both the nature reserve and the sang areas are um well the sang always needs to be accessible so it needs to have a, a footpath network through it that's been allowed for um and with the nature reserve it's going to be a primarily a, a wetland nature reserve so it's the habitat creation costs are based on on those kind of habitats okay, okay. 
Thank you. So you don't feel see any uh, insurmountable additional costs that could come from doing this form of uh, providing this form of infrastructure. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now we're not going to um, have a discussion about the other costings. We did enough of that in terms of uh, transport and, uh, and infrastructure related to uh, the discussions that we had this morning or earlier uh, this afternoon, I should say, as we went into this afternoon as well. Um, only to ensure that they are included in here. And I've been told that everything is included in this appraisal or in these appraisals. Now there's, as you, as you said, Ms. Shelby, uh, I shall be, my apologies. Um, you've set out that there's going to be, or there's a, uh, you've, you've done a cautious approach on this in relation to front loading, particularly on the initial phase. So can you just explain exactly what the abnormals and infrastructure costs and how you've come up with the figure, that front loaded figure? Oh, we're talking about your it's the 12 million isn't it yeah it's so it's 12 million that is up front but it's 48 across the whole yes. development yeah. um at this point it's it's reflective of the the design and the the amount of background work that's been done we haven't drilled into the detail but it's making an allowance for that on top of a standard build for anything in addition that does come up um, there aren't specific items that are within that 20,000, but it would be remiss of us not to include that within, within an allowance for a site of this nature. Okay. But at this stage, you're not aware of any particular no. ground condition costs or any abnormals that may come to light at this stage? No, exactly. Okay. And in terms of coming up with the figure for these abnormals then, can you just explain where that's come from? Is it from a comparable site? Yeah, it's so obviously I, I, run, I run these appraisals a lot, um, a lot of sites of this nature. Obviously, this is a particularly large one. Um, it, I run them for all different kinds of purposes, and it's a, it's a standard kind of figure that you put in that people will allow when they're either looking to purchase a site when they don't have that information. Um, or otherwise. So it's effectively benchmarked off a lot of other schemes and market knowledge. Thank you. Are there any particular items or well are there any particular items that you want to draw to my attention in this appraisal that are either not normal or are uh, it's not about not being normal every site every site is different and has different um, costings and a lot of sites particularly larger sites have can have huge abnormals relating to them but they are specific to that site are there any is there anything in particular that you want to draw my attention to or is it very much i mean i'm look, just looking down all the figures and it's all set out um, um no i don't there's nothing there's nothing in particular that i think needs highlighting um i think Obviously, looking at the gen the total cost is always helpful because I'll have split things out differently to, to maybe other appraisals of the scheme, which will look at it more holistically as an all-in cost. Um, but in every input, we've tried to take the more cautious approach in relation to cost because of the stage that we're at in terms of appraising the site. Um, so we haven't pushed things to to be more commercial. We, we've taken a realistic and cautious approach to cautious approach to to the inputs. And of course, it would be very, um, this will obviously substantially change as things move, whether costs go up, costs go down, but obviously then the, the sales inputs that go in go 
can go up, can go down, etc. Et so it's a bit of a moving feast when you come to development appraisals. Yeah. Um, but this is obviously of its time and um, it, you've revised it in relation to uh, in relation to the updated IDP information. Has anybody got any queries or anything they want to highlight or bring to my attention? Mr. Drover? Sorry, I'm loath to open my mouth and show my ignorance. I, I, I genuinely don't know anything about these, but I'm just interested how um, uh, the base land value is captured in this document. Normally, I couldn't see it. I've only just looked at it, to be honest with you. So, um, yeah, how, how do you capture the greenfield value of the land? Is that should be? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so this appraisal will find the land value for you. Um, so we've targeted different levels of profit. So we, we add in the GDV, you have your revenue, you take your costs off, of it, off, you allow for profit, and the resulting amount is your land value. So we haven't inputted that land value. That's the result of this appraisal. So Driver, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, so so the, the bottom line is how much fat there is in the project and that obviously yeah so i understand that that's the, the yeah I, I just assumed it'd be included somewhere earlier and then the bottom line would have had the land value extracted but i, I take the point thank you yeah, it's the software we use it is because it, it adds it higher up it looks like we've inputted it i appreciate that um but we've used market inputs for profit and elements like that and the remaining amount is is the land value that that's the project produced out of the report thank you So I'm just making note there. Again, I know you're dealing with this from a high level perspective. You've got a, a you know, a program that you run, which changes depending on the assumptions that you put in and the data that you put in. Um, what impact, if any, does it have? Because this is based on certain, or, or if you can just explain to me how the model that you've used has worked on this. The, course, in terms of time scale, sorry. Yeah, in terms of time scales, yeah. and whether if there is a difference in how long construction takes, what it, whether you've done sensitiv sensitivity testing around that, and whether that makes any difference at all. I get it will make a difference because the, the longer the development period, the more costly. Yes. Um, and a lot of it is in relation to how your sales overlap your construction in terms of efficiency of finance. Um, we've assumed an average of 200 units um, per phase with three outlets on site at once. Um, there's market evidence of, of that being achievable, deliverable and not causing oversaturation of market. Um, and ultimately, it'd potentially be three different products that are delivered. So it wouldn't be kind of three different outlets purely competing for the same market. Um, in the initial phase, um, we've allowed for 12 months pre-construction before main construction commences. Um, and that's on the basis of delivering 66 units per year. And then the sales rate is five per month across three outlets, which is, is pretty realistic in, in 1.6 per outlet, really. So um again been very cautious um but trying to take an average for the length of the development which is obviously over a pretty significant time period okay so again the uh the lead-in for the construction so you've got, you know, you're, you've got your groundworks going in, etc. You've given a certain yep. period for that. Um, you think that that's realistic? We're sort of yeah, we, 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 we're people. not. Sorry. No, sorry, go on. I was just going to say, we're not, I, it's not modelled in that we'll turn up day one with a digger and a house is ready to sell. 
there's a, a good amount of lead in time there um, and allowance for hazards to reach completion. Again, we're not trying to artificially kind of overlap anything. It's all realistic in terms of delivery and then sales rates. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anybody else got any comments or queries they want to raise? Ms. Hamilton, fine. Thank you, Mum. Uh, just a couple of observations, really. The on plot costs. Um, 124.95 uh, per square foot seems to be considerably lower than those used by Savills on the Wislow scheme. I think those were 140 from um, what I recall. And then secondly, the commercial land value at 500,000 per acre, that seems to be particularly high based on local experience. And then the profit margin of 15.69% of GDV it's only just what might be considered an acceptable range, I believe. Thank you, ma'am. Can I just ask you what you base your, you're saying that the commercial land value is particularly high. What are you basing that on? I think on local experience and client experience is probably a lot less, about half that, less abnormals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Farm, would you like Ms. Ashelby to respond on that or would you like to respond? Um, I'll let Ms. Ashelby come in, but um, I don't agree with Ms. Hamilton Foyne, especially in the current market, which is uh, fairly robust in Gloucestershire at the moment. I think <coughs> land values, I think Ms. Ashelby has actually been quite conservative on those values. Uh, I have seen some very steamy prices and I'm currently doing a deal. Uh, north of Gloucester, uh, north of this site in Gloucestershire, which is um, even higher than the half a million that Miss Eshelby is 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 saying. So I think I think what Miss Eshelby is, is giving you is a realistic price, ma'am. Uh, and and um, when by the time this is developed, that will be more than realistic. Uh, Hannah, I don't know if you've got anything add, to add to that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, a, a kind of at the higher end of of evidence, we see it can be up to one point two five million per acre. Um, so I, I feel like we've been particularly cautious at half a million. Um, obviously, it's totally dependent in terms of what comparables you look at and transactional evidence and location, access, the current condition of it. There's a, a, a really long list of elements you'd need to consider within that. So um, I'm comfortable that that is an appropriate adoption for a site on, in, of this nature in that location um, and what's been delivered here of like, consented plots effectively of commercial land. I suspect Robert Hitchens just has some very shrewd land buyers, Mark. <laughs> well, let's not get into that. That's uh, I was getting very specific. Um, the issue that Miss Hamilton Foyne raised about profit levels and profit margins, and that this is on the cusp. Or well, your point of view on that one, Miss Ashelby? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the the MPPF, um, Miss Hamilton is right in the the MPPF states between fifteen and twenty percent. Um, on GDV as, as a normal range of profit. Um, this is blending the open market and the affordable at appropriate market levels. Profits have been squeezed over the past two, three years for, for people to remain competitive in land. Um, I do viability for further down the process as well. And this is all it's always agreed at that kind of level. I've not seen any recently where where it's been different to 17 and a half and six. So I'm co I'm comfortable that they're all market facing and what, what is agreed through the planning application process. OK, thank you. Anything else from anybody? No. Thank you. That's it on viability. Everybody will be pleased to hear. We're not going to have a drawn out process on that one. So thank you. I'll hand back over to my other inspector. Thank you very much. Right, so 
we are now on to item five of the agenda which is uh, any other business um so the first point on that is uh the discussion uh, which uh, Ms Smith has been waiting patiently for, um, which is uh, to do with the Council's response to the seven vision maps, uh, which Ms Smith uh, submitted um, at a previous session, um, and a particular uh, query as to whether they've been taken into account in the HRA. Um, so, Mr Russell, I don't know if you want to respond to that, or if there is an expert on your side dealing with HRA that you would like to address the question to. Yeah, I, I, a generalist like myself is probably not qualified to uh, to respond in detail. But um, no, we have Derwin Lilly from Footprint Ecology, who's been responsible for producing our HRA and um, and more general um, ecology issues. So uh, if I can, and I, I uh, Derwin uh, uh, contributed to the response. That set out in the uh, in the note. So, um, we, uh, if Derwin would like to uh, respond, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mum. I'm Dr. Lily from Footprint Ecology, um, and the lead author of the of the HRA. Um, the the HRA we've considered sharpness in a lot of detail and spent a lot of iterations and, and previous, a, a large body of work going through the issues. Um, we haven't directly referred to the seven vision maps. The, um, the maps are quite dated. Uh, they're from 2017. The, the, GIS, the GIS components that comprise them have, have been updated since. Um, but it is a useful resource that brings data and maps together. They are they are sort of background and, and context to the HRA. There's nothing there that undermines uh, any of the conclusions. Um, uh, so there's no, there's nothing in that that vision document or the, the maps that Miss Smith has kindly shared that would undermine or change the HRA conclusions. Um, uh, certainly with a future iteration of the HRA, perhaps at main modifications, we could provide a link and, and cross-reference to the, the back to the vision. I think it, it perhaps does provide some useful background, but certainly things like the maps on carbon storage and, and some of the ecosystem services and things are not directly relevant at all to the HRA. And that's specifically on the, the seven vision, but I'm happy to answer any other questions or, or concerns around the HRA. Thank you. Uh, Ms Smith. Sorry, I nearly took the video off. Sort of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, the information on the site I got it from is updated. Um, it was dated March this year. And, you know, that's, as a member of the public, that's what I have access for. But it's, this is based on basic geography. So I don't see why things, those things would have changed since 2017. Um, and also, the fact that this was a priority habitat is actually um, been in the public domain for ages it's actually in the evidence because if you look at the bar the um in the evidence the um green infrastructure document for Barclay cluster is shown as um as um oh sorry it's and late in the day it's priority habitat but also um i've got a printout here i hope you don't mind me holding it up it's priority habitats this is updated december 2022 and this is on the natural england website it's really hard it's for me. just just be careful because we don't really want any more evidence. No, you don't need to. It's, 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 it's um, just that they're questioning I'd rather, that. But I'd rather we didn't because I don't want to keep no. going. Well, well can go to, you can go to the Natural England one and it's there. But you can also go into the evidence, okay, the document. Start Open Space and GI Barclay Custer document, EB41D, page 8. Tell me to say that again, I was a bit quick. Yeah, Sorry, it's, it's sort of been a long day, and um, it's 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 document EB forty one D, page eight. Thank you. But this the natural England one. I mean, it's it's updated twenty twenty two, and um, the reason I didn't use that one before was the graphics aren't so good. So basically, I don't even let me hold this up now. I've done an overlay map. I've overlaid the. Um, the, the map I had before, which showed them the priority habitat and then I've overlaid that with the Sharpness PS36 plan. So you can just see the extent of where the priority no, habitat um, is. No, 
Sorry, we, okay. as I say, we really okay. don't want any more evidence submitted no. at this stage. Okay, well, basically, um, nearly all the area that's the sand is is within the priority habitat, as well as the nature reserve area and the allotments and, you know, basically. So a lot of that's going over to human use. And as I said before, that should be um, stored, enhanced, whatever, anyway. So I've got a few more points I want to make about, about the nature reserve. I did speak about the seven quite a bit before, and I don't think Gordon was in that session. So I don't know if you want to see if anybody else wants to make any comments about the seven and then maybe come back to me because i think it's good to have other people's views on this as well um, um i think do you want me, do you want me to carry on it's probably going to be quite a focused sort of little discussion between yourselves and the council's um hra experts so i think probably if you could make points that you, you'd like to make um okay. We'll listen to them and we we'll the um, the council's HRA expert to to come back. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. is he here still? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, due to seven seven being a protected marine area or a European site, and more specifically a sack or spa with priority habitats, the habitat regulations mean that compensatory measures are out of the question for approving this development. Um, as like I said before, the imperative reasons of override interest must be for health, safety, or environmental benefit, or require special permission from the Secretary of State. And actually, the HRA guy is going to agree with me on that because um, if I could point you to um, at the footnote on page forty-one of the HRA, I don't know if you're able to get that up. Uh, not in front of me, but okay. I, I know it's quite slow getting around this these documents. Okay, um, I think the nature reserves um, basically because um, compensatory um, measures are not allowed. When, when we came on before, and Mr. Moore talked about projects saw war from the Forest of Dean. Now those very worthy projects. I'm not knocking them, but they they can but not be considered legally as mitigation or compensation for the benefit of allowing developments such as PS36 or PS34. Um, I, I read out that footnote from the HRA. It says, right, note that for the avoidance of doubt, the reserve would be mitigation rather than compensation, as the reserve is providing additional habitat outside the European site to address risks to relating to habitat that is also outside the European site rather than within it. This is not in contradiction to Brills. Brills is um, a case law. Um, so basically what he's saying is, is that the nature reserve can, oh, is, is to provide um, mitigation for the functionally linked land, not anything else. OK, so it, it's not providing any kind of mitigation or compensation for any impacts that are from the sort of, well, from these all on the salt mass, the mud flats, the estuary, et cetera. OK, so it's. So I think it's been made out to be more than it is. Um, now, I'm going to go further, and I'm going to argue that it's not actually mitigation, but because this, this is a priority habitat, it's enhancement. OK, so um, that um, you may remember I mentioned the document before. Um, it was, it was DEFRA's best practice guidance for developing compensatory measures in relation to marine protected areas. And that was the date of July 2021. And it was actually a consultation document. And they um, will also outline that. Well, um, in that, they actually have a hierarchy of compensation measures. And um, in that table, the first the highest level of compensation measure um, is, is basically addressing the same impact at same location. And it gives an example, conversion of on-site arable or grazing lands to create wetlands, salt marsh or marshes. So basically, that's what this creating this nature reserve fits that description and it's the same impact, same location. So it's within the compensation hierarchy, it's not mitigation. And that makes a big difference because compensation should be the very last resort. And if, if we don't just look at the um, HRA, but we look at the marine plan, which talks about, it doesn't talk about the boundaries of the sapper spot, it talks about impacts, adverse effects, impacts. And so that doesn't actually have compensation either in its hierarchy. So basically, um, 
and the reason being is, is the reason is not the conversations that we're trying it's just so difficult you cannot be sure you're going to work so um do you want me to clarify that because i feel like i gabbled a bit or shall i carry on um well if, if you if you've made the points that you'd like to make then i'll, I'll ask dr lily to, to respond i haven't finished yet but I, i'm happy for him to come and make some so make some points and then make my other points after uh dr lily Thank you, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> the, the priority habitats inventory is, is largely derived from um, various, it's, it's comprised from various sources, but I think if, I don't know if you've walked the site at all, or if you check from, you can easily check on aerial photographs, yeah. the fields that... Yeah, well, walked around it, obviously, because it's, uh, you can't access it, but yes, we have, we have looked at it. Those fields that are just in land of the seawall are, are agricultural land. Um, they're used very sporadically by, by birds from the European site. Um, the HRA documents, um, I think it's paragraph 5.7, there are only, so I've not got that reference right. In uh, section five of the HRA, there is reference to the bird, bird records from the area and, and they are very sporadic. So the area at the moment is agricultural, and is only very sporadically used by Annex 1 birds associated with the European site. The proposals and nothing in the plan involves loss of intertidal habitat or changes to the seawall. Um, and, and there is no impacts in terms of habitat loss or habitat change that relate to those areas within the European site. The creation of the nature reserve means that there is habitat secured for those birds, but also the, the nature reserve will protect that, any risk of functional linkage being disturbed by the presence of people from the, the development site. So the nature reserve is functioning to remove disturbance, which is also the role of the footpath diversion. Um, I, there was some concern in the early an early HRA work about the the risks of of, of the sea defence and and loss of uh, loss of priority habitat. We had extensive conversations with Natural England uh, and the council uh, also contacted the developers. Um, and I can cross reference you to paragraph five point seven in the HRA. That's EB eighty five. Um, which draws on the advice from Natural England that the, the local plan HRA for the Sharpness New Settlement is essentially shielded from the consideration of salt marsh and intertidal habitat loss by virtue of the shoreline management plan and the shoreline management plans HRA, because SMP2, the, the shoreline management plan, has hold the line for that, that area. And just to reiterate, there are no physical defences being built or maintained as part of the local plan. Compensation is a very specific term in terms of the HABS regs. And within the HRA, we rule out uh, adverse effects on integrity. And that's the reason for the, the, the various bullets and the mitigation measures that will need to be incorporated uh, down the line and have been incorporated to date in terms of the development. And with those measures incorporated, uh, adverse effects on integrity can be ruled out and we don't need to move to uh, alternative solutions in stage three of the habitat regulations process. Thank you. So in effect, you're saying the, incumbent, the nature reserve in combination with the diversion of the footpath are essentially acting as a buffer between the priority habitat and the rest of the development. Okay, thank you. Did you want to add anything else to that, Dr. Lilly? Okay, um, Mr. Wigglesworth. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, I thought I had unmuted. Um, <laughs> yes, just a couple of further points of clarification. Um, the priority habitat mapping, um, which Mr. Smith has indicated, is. is it is very much a theoretical um, mapping exercise. I think that 
is being shown as coastal floodplain grazing marsh, um, affecting um, open habitat uh, that's sort of in that kind of intertidal zone. However, um, DDP, as part of its work, has undertaken detailed habitat surveys on site to actually ground truth what's actually there. Um, and as Mr. Liley has already indicated, from you can see for yourself on the site that it's actually a series of improved grassland fields and some arable land rather than um, the priority habitat as those maps indicate they are. Um, secondly, I just wanted to make the point that the, an impact on a priority habitat is something that we picked up in the round as part of the EIA for the site. And it's not strictly relevant to HRA in any event because priority habitat is not a European site per se. There might be, there might be some overlap there, but it's not a specific remit of an HRA. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Smith? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to point to um, 5.11 in the HRA, and it does say about um, the field itself. I mean, this is just an example, but locals, we see flocks of geese all the time in those fields in that area. And of course, um, it's not just about how they are now, but potential. But then the example given in the HRA at 5.11 does say um, there are qualifying features the Spa Ramsar, for example, the field directly south of Oak Hunger Farm held flocks of 150 lapwing on two occasions, 10 dumbling on one occasion. Now, um, there are also lots of skylarks in the air, all those, all those fields. So the, the, the amount of space that's going to be available to, to for the birds and is going to be greatly reduced. And the reason they're there is because it's quiet. It's a quiet, lonely place. And actually, if you could Google about what geese eat, they eat quite a variety of things, but they eat grass, they like clover, they, they eat grains, um, fruit. And this idea, oh, well, it's not wet. There's not a wetland there. Well, salt marsh is actually, if you ever walked on it, it's dry most of the time. And so this idea of water birds, they actually feed, you know, on dry land. So sometimes farmland can be very nutritious for them. And geese like short grass because that's why you have this managed grazing. Some of the herbivore birds like longer grass, some like short grass, and of course others eat out on the mudflats. The dunlin, they eat on the mudflats and they're vertebrate eaters, but they roost on farmlands. They use all this land. But even, so you look at all the foot, we're talking about the huge, vast proportion that several hundred percent, I don't know, thousand percent more people would be walking around in that area. One of the issues I want to raise, I think this is really important, is that this is quite a long walk from anywhere at the moment. And the winter high tides, the highest high tides, when they occur, is like eight, half eight, nine in the morning, and then it, late in the evening after dark. So really, it's, you're, you're talking about a two mile walk to get here from Barclay. Um, more than a mile from the Shark Nest picnic site. So really at those critical times, there's nobody, hardly anybody ever there. Suddenly you've got a town on its doorstep with the sand, you put in their dog walking area, everything right by it. Now you can see you've been there, it's a priority habitat. It's a great coastal grazing marsh, whether they like it or not. You can see that's its geography. It's going to get very muddy. So how are you going to have people walking there? You're going to have raised platforms. They're going to be visible to the birds. The HRA says you need 400 metres, 500 metres. Um, you can see the way these footpaths cross, go part, right past the nature reserve, everything. Those birds, are, it, it, that is going to be dead, that area, as a functioning linked land. And the pill, the communities there will just collapse. And that's what local birders think will happen with this. So um, I've got... A, a couple more points. Um, but, um, just, just to see what I've got. So, I mean, you've got to look at the number. It's not just about how close people are. Noise is a very flat landscape. Noise really travels in this kind of landscape. You can hear across the estuary often things happening in Lydney. So it's, it, it, it the birds are going to get disturbed, and it really is a choice. You're going to have, you're going to have the wildlife, or you're going to have this new development. And um, when I, a few years ago, I went to the very first consultation in Sharpness Village Hall, and basically it was just an, it was meant to be a consultation. It was an exhibition of Mr. Fong's very glossy 
posters and materials. I didn't get to speak to him on the council. I did have the pleasure of meeting Mr Fong and speaking with him. And um, what he said to me was, all the birds are at Slingbridge. So we've got this huge estuary, seven estuary, that's a set spark, but he thinks all the birds are in this one place. So basically well, that let's, just demonstrates... Let, let's not make it personal. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying not to. Sorry. Yeah. I think he's been quite personal about people this morning, but, but I, anyway. I don't think it's helpful, so let, let's try and no, keep... I agree, personal. I agree, sorry. I'm just trying to say, basically, <laughs> it, I just use that as an to show how far this project has already got before any assessments were done. So basically, they've avoided, you're meant to use in the hierarchy, avoidance first. They've avoided the obvious way of avoiding it, which is not having this down here. They went so far down this route. They cannot turn the juggernaut around. And that's why we're here today. They should never have got this far if they had done the proper assessments earlier on. Um, I've got some, I just want to talk about um, Andrew, I, I got, there's a, a couple of birders. They knew I was coming on here. You know, these people don't want to come here, but they passed me a little bit of evidence. And I know it's the information they gave me, I'm very grateful for, but it's far too detailed to use here. But I just want to use one example as a counter example, because um, it only takes one example to just prove, to show that, that, you know, we're meant to follow the precautionary principle here. And you're, there's meant to be no scientific doubt about these adverse impacts. So I just need one example, okay? So um, basically, he's saying, um, it is perhaps worth noting that the Lapwin and Dunlin fly off to Slingbridge when disturbed, and it is almost certain that they regularly commute, commute to the mud below the sewage works every day from Slingbridge. They have a very good wetland site at Slingbridge, but choose to feed on the mud by the estuary. So I can't see that a new wetland site by Barkley Pill is what they're looking for. Similar comments probably apply for the widgeon and teal too. So those that mud below the sewage works, that is where the seven way is not going to be diverted. That's that's you know, you, you've been there, you've seen the warehouses, and then you get the sewage works. So I mean maybe they're gonna come back and say, oh, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a reed bed and screening. I just don't see how you can't well, you can't dig up there. That's a priority salt marsh. So so they can't go digging that salt marsh up. So I don't see how they're going to have the right of way um, continue along there. Lots more people. And as I said, people at those key times when the highest high tides are up. And, it, it, and saying you can say, oh, well, we screened everything from the seven. Because if you actually know this area well, like I do, you just know that none of this is standing up to scrutiny. So... Um, got one more point I want to make. Okay. So if you could make it sort of as, as, as um, I'm, I'm, possible, because I'm just conscious of to bring in other people, but um, please. Course, please. I, want, I want to hear other people too, yeah, but I mean, this is important. Um, so on the seven way diversion, it was introduced at a very late stage. In fact, it was introduced at the very last stage to try and push through this ill-conceived plan. And it's ironic that an earlier session, Mr. Fong actually encouraged the other inspector, or you or both of you, I can't remember which one, to actually go down, walk this section of the Seven Way to appreciate its beauty. So, um, you know, that's the area they want to remove. Um, so in the Southwest Marine Plans action, action, Access Policy, it states its aim. Um, it provides clarity on how public access should be protected and ensures that proposals do not have a significant adverse impact on existing public access. Where proposals cannot avoid, minimize, or mitigate significant adverse impacts to public access, they should not be supported. I mean, it, it, this is being, this diversion is being pushed through so that this development can just go ahead, you know, just to, for the sake of this development, which has so many other problems already attached to it, as we've already seen, but I'm sticking to the issues of the seven. Now, are they, is diverting this significant impact? I say it is, because this is a, a seven way, it's a national footpath. Um, if you go south, there's a long stretch of road. The shortcut for the docks has recently been closed by the canals and rivers trust. So there's a long road route that way. Some of this diversion is actually more road. So basically, you, I mean, and my worry is, is that they're actually in the end going to di even divert that last little bit right up to the picnic site. So you're going to have miles of road. Um, 
so and also the bit at the Barclay Pill, that is the only bit of the seven that's really walkable from Barclay Town because it's two miles. It's going to be a six mile, it's going to be much further. It's a lot further to go to the other side of the power station. It's a lot further um, to, to, it will be a lot further to get to part of the diversion. So basically, it's taking away that walk from Barclay. Um, so it, it is a significant impact and it will be very, very, this diversion will be very strongly fought locally. It won't go down well. And I probably had other points, but I let other people speak for a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Craig. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, just really picking up uh, on, on Ms. Smith's um, point here, I'm, I'm looking at it from a more of a financial um, uh, point of view, uh, which I know you'll be interested in. Um, the mitigation against the triple SI, uh, uh, which runs obviously round, down the seven, not just by the site, but for quite a long way uh, north of the site and for quite a long way south of the site, um, is uh, to, as you, we all know, is to um, remove the seven way uh, back an area, uh, move the footpath back and to create uh, uh, um, a nature reserve. Um, I met uh, Mr. Russell's uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Conrad Moore, uh, working down uh, on the river one day uh, recently. And uh, the, the, uh, I reminded him that uh, the mitigation could only ever apply to the, land, to the land owned by the developer. And residents would simply access the triple SI on either side of this controlled area. So we still have the huge amount of residents who will come to the, to the, to the, uh, to the new development still accessing the triple SI in spite of the mitigation. Um, and he agreed with me and he said, yes, but we've thought about that. What we're going to do, and you can tell me whether there's any substance in this, but this is what he said. Um, what we're going to do is we are going to hire wardens and uh, the wardens will um, uh, basically encourage people not to enter the site, either side of the mitigation area, either side of the land owned by the developers. Um, I, if they're really wonderful at that, then, then, then good luck to them. Um, uh, but I, I, I doubt how successful they'll be. Even if they are wonderful at it, has the cost of these two wardens been taken into account? Because if you look at the cost of two wardens uh, compounding their, um, uh, their salaries uh, in perpetuity, we are actually talking about many millions of pounds. Um, and I, ju I just wonder if, if the warden thing is in fact the truth, if it actually is going to happen, um, and, and if so, has the cost been taken into account? Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, what I want to do, because I'm conscious we've already spoken about environmental issues um, in the previous session. Um, so we don't need to sort of go over and repeat what we've already discussed. Um, the point of this agenda item was just to deal specifically with um, the maps that were submitted to sort of try and keep it uh, nice and tightly drawn around that issue. Um, so um, what I would like to do is uh, bring this particular discussion to a close on this particular point. Um, so I, I'm going to go back to Dr. Lilly, but I can see uh, Mr. Wigglesworth has put your hand up. So if you could make the point you'd like to make, but then also if you could pick up the point that Councillor Craig has just made about the, the wardens and um, if that's something that um, you intend to, to do or not. Thank you. So was I, was I to go first? <laughs> yes, please, sorry. <laughs> Put his hand up before me, I think, but I'll just make my points. Um, just want to confirm that um, our understanding of the use of the site and the surrounding area by wintering birds is based on um, what's now five wintering bird surveys, um, which is 
frankly, more than you'd normally produce for an outline planning application, let alone uh, a proposal of an allocation. So uh, we do have a very detailed understanding of, of where the birds are. Um, I was also just going to add that the diversion of the seven way is something that the council has as, has had aspirations to do for for some time. Just recognizing the sensitivity of the Barclay pill high tide roost. Um, so it's not it, uh, even without the development proposed. It was something that is on the sort of wish list uh, for management of access along the coast anyway. Um, uh, just a few words. I, I, um, I do believe that the uh, comments about wardening are true. It's part of the, I say, the updated seven estuary mitigation strategy that the council are drafting, um, which does take account of the fact that it won't be just uh, residents from Sharpness that might be tempted to go along the coast path. There will be other developments in the area which are, say, within the sort of zone of influence. Mr. Lyley can probably talk more about that. Uh, and therefore, there will be uh, a strategic mitigation strategy, which applies to all developments in that zone, which will essentially collect monies towards the warning and that they will be fully costed. Thank you. Yeah, um, when we visited, we noticed the picnic area was quite uh, busy with people coming and going, going for walks along the footpath. So, uh, yes, uh, fully appreciate that point. Um, OK. Um, I'll go back to Dr. Lilly, um, if you'd like to make um, any closing remarks um, on behalf of the council, although um, I will give Mr. Russell obviously the opportunity to, to say anything further. Um, Dr. Lilly. Thank you, ma'am. Um, the the hab habitat regulations assessment has to be very specific in terms of the qualifying features for the European sites, et cetera. And I, just to confirm, Skylark is not one of those qualifying features. The nature reserve, um, the birds and the use of the, the key draw for the birds in the area is the intertidal habitat, which has a vast amount of food for the, for the, the wading birds, the water birds. Um, the species such as Dunlin are using the fields very sporadically as occasional roost sites by creating the nature reserve with um, no access and putting that directly adjacent to the European site boundary. It's making sure that there is refuge areas available for the birds at all times. Uh, and those birds are likely and will prefer, there's numerous evidence in the literature to show that they'll fly as close and stay as close to the, the intertidal habitat as they can. Uh, you were right to pick up about the, the numbers of visitors walking south from the Sharpness picnic area, and, and certainly there is access from that, that northern side. Um, some of these issues we have been considering iteratively and working on since the early, early, early HRA work, and those early HRA documents are in the examination library. And the mitigation strategy, uh, that's that's the solution to dealing with the strategic impacts from people from Sharpness visiting further afield, people from further afield visiting the estuary shoreline. That's the standard approach to, to dealing with these, these issues. And I entirely anticipate that the updated strategy will be in line with those that are uh, very successful and have been long running on the Solent, the ex estuary, North Kent marshes, the Suffolk coast, uh, et cetera. Uh, and in those ranges are a, a key element, but also there's a, it's a package of measures. It's a package of measures that enables the impacts to be addressed at a strategic level. Um, yeah, that, that's all my points. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Russell, would you like to just say anything by way of closing remarks on this particular issue? No, I, I think I think uh, uh, Derwin's dealt with all those points um, in quite a lot of detail, and 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 Tom Wigglesworth. So yeah, I don't have any detailed points. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Wigglesworth. I don't think you responded on the point about site wardens, did you? Or did you? Did yes, I, I was saying when I said that it is a standard practice that it will be. We expect that to be part of the wider strategy. It's not a site, not site specific proposal. It's for the, for the council's wider strategy. Thank you. Apologies. <laughs> I shall make a note of that. Okay, um, Ms. Smith, I can see your hands gone up. Um, if you could just, because obviously I have to go back to the council um, just for any 
right. <laughs> If we could, if we could keep things um, brief, that would be greatly appreciated. Can I speak briefly? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, I just got in front of me an extract from the Marine Climate Change Impacts Partnership a report. Okay. Um, and I just re just want to read out a couple of sentences, and I'll leave it at that. Um, emerging issue is the increased realization that it is unrealistic to promote a hold the line policy for much of the coastline. The Committee on Climate Change, two thousand eighteen recently highlighted that 1,460 kilometres of coastline designated as whole the achieves a much lower benefit ratio than the flood and coastal erosion risk management interventions that are government funded today. On this basis, therefore, funding for these locations is unlikely. And realistic plans to adapt to the inevitability of this change are needed now. And I did say that in the shoreline management plan, actually go to it, it does say for this area, that the cost benefit ratio is low. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out because, okay. you know, hold the line is just the default setting, basically. It doesn't mean the line will be held. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lilly, is there anything you'd, you wish to say in, in response to that particular point? Thank you. Just to confirm that there is no proposal within the plan to change any of the, the sea defences and and the hold the line is there's there's no other proposal on the table besides hold the line. Thank you, uh, Mr. Russell. You want to add anything to that? No, I'm I'm happy to to conclude that there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So in that case, I think we have reached the end of our agenda for today. Um, Thank you for everybody who's stuck with it. It's been <laughs> a bit of a long day, but we got there in the end, so well done. Um, is there anything else that anyone would like to raise at this juncture? No. OK, right. Well, in that case, oh, Councillor Jones. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, sorry, I, I will be very quick. I just wanted to make sure we're going back to the very beginning, if that's so, just to make sure that you've got it recorded on your notes. I'm sure you but um, Ms Higgs um, and Mr Russell had a back and forth about deprivation of shark nests. And uh, I think we started the day by, by bemoaning the late receipt of documents, but accepting that it's best to work on up-to-date information. Ms Higgs had the latest information on this and it indicated that shark nest is not in a deprived area. Mr Russell, I think, is working on older figures um, that shows it is. So I, I just wanted to make sure that you have got that recorded because that, that could be quite important, I think. I don't know if, sorry for, I can see Ms Higgs at the bottom of the screen. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's what she was saying, but I, I wrote it down earlier uh, because it was just coming up to one of our tea breaks. And I just wanted to make sure it was recorded. Thank you. Um, Ms Hamilton Foy. Thank you, ma'am. I've listened to all the discussions that have taken place today. And just for the record, I want to say that nothing that we have heard changes our opinion on the site, that it is an, an unsustainable location and cannot be made sustainable. I don't think it's realistic or viable. And I would endorse the points made by Mr. Drover from the County Council and um, Nick Matthews and also Connor Flanagan that were made earlier today. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um... Okay, Mr. Bonk, can see your hands gone up. So yeah, very, very briefly. Um, you, you, you're going you, to counter that. I can, I can yeah. predict. No, no, no. I'm just going to say you have all the evidence. But what I really want to say is, um, on behalf of the Sharp Nest Development Team, thank you and uh, Inspector Wright for all your attention. Uh, uh, thank the council for a very well conceived plan, but mainly thank the residents for bearing up with us in a planning world, which I know is very alien to them. So thank you, Mum. Thank you very much, Mr. Fong. Um, right. Um, in that case, um, Mr. Russell, was there anything you wanted to say in in response to either of those points? No, I think we've had a, a very good hearing of all of the issues in relation to sharpness and, and indeed in, in the context of the plan as a whole and the spatial strategy. So I, I think I think we're quite happy that you that everybody has had a good opportunity to air their views on this site. And um uh, and obviously we, we rest on the basis of the evidence we provided. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Russell. Okay, well, in that case, I shall draw this session to a close. Thank you very much, everybody, for your participation today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.